Ay, Chirian. Hey, Ipa. Ay, 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 si Kiki is in. Hello, Imad. Vlad. Good to have you. Good to see you. Very good. Abuzad, Matias, Sanjeeva, and Andre. Ay, Chirian. Yeah. Hey, Chirian. Um, Kasadi, I like good to see you. Yeah, Kasadi also. I would like to also. introduce some of uh, our. Uh, this is Hari. He's a consultant here. Hi, Giacomo. Hi. 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 I don't see Kasadi. your face, but yes. Hi. Giacomo, <laughs> Tamerlan. Wonderful. Hi. Wonderful. Wonderful. How are you? Hello. And uh, Sajiv. Sajiv. Uh, Hello. These are. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Sajiv. We it's have a very uh, moody. So well, very academic and a small have, um, team. We have right. the regular suspects here. <laughs> <laughs> Moody. Yeah, suspects, as always. Hey, Moody. Hi, <laughs> hi everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. Kasadi. Hi. Good to see you. Hello, hello, everyone. Hi, Kasadi. Hi, Kasadi. How are you? Ramesh and Jiva. My goodness. Hi, thank you. Good, yeah. good to see you all. Pablo, I'm green with envy. <laughs> <laughs> Pablo, is uh, you planning to put a nice background because yeah, of the green screen? <laughs> Isn't it nice? Uh, yellow, <laughs> yellow. Nice, yeah. <laughs> By the way, Ramesh, do you mind if uh, you uh, co-host as usual, just fine. in case? Yeah, fine. Matthias? Me too. Yes, Pablo. No problem. Thank you. Andre, where do you get those windmills uh, like that? I mean, uh, we have a place which we have a lot of windmills. Oh, but, this is uh, not this is uh, this is a famous famous area. Oh um, yeah, it is called Kinderdijk, and they uh -huh. have a whole row of sixteen windmills. Well, that's a touristic attraction. I mean, that's mm. uh, yeah. you can get a small boat and and just follow the whole track uh, around, and that's uh, that's nice. This is like, this is more. Um, um, well, near Gouda, so um, more in the direction of Rotterdam. Uh, but I, I mean, still for us, uh, any place in my country is just one hour drive. So that's, uh, that doesn't matter at all. <laughs> one hour drive and uh, how many feet below sea level? Uh, well, 84% um, is officially below sea level. Wow. Not the region where I live. We have actually, um, where I live is close to Devil's Mountain. And that is really very high. It is 80 meters. <laughs> All right. And Andre, that's one of Andre, the best locations we have. Andre, the only place, uh, the only place I, like that in, East, uh, yes. in the East is Alapi. It is also, I mean, Ramesh will know, in my, in my state, we have a place which farms with a lot of farms. It is, of course, a small place, but it is continuously, <coughs> we are pumping out water. This is called the R block in uh, Alapi. So huh? maybe the Keralites will know about it. So we talk about Netherlands a lot when we hear. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they know a little bit about water management. You have to do so, because if they wouldn't have the dikes, um, even the airport skip hole, which is minus sixty meters, there would wow. be nothing visible of that airport anymore. No, it would be gone. What are you going to do about the rising of the level of oceans? Well, well, yeah, well, well, <laughs> it's not in my time anymore. No, but they, they are concerned. They to are shift actually to Dubai. Um, elevating and, 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 and so enlarging this whole project. At least it is planned for the next 30 years. And they, they hope that it will not come sooner. So you have to teach all grandees to swim early in their life. Well... I, I, I think the, the, the old people, they all know how to swim. Right. And actually, they say, it's a saying, that children in, in this country can already swim and ride a bicycle before they can walk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's a necessity. It is, actually, it is an, an obligation to have in, 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 in the school, in the grammar school, when they enter at the age of four, those who cannot swim are obligated to learn to swim. So the, in the sports lessons, it's swimming. Oh, and later on, it is then football and other sports. But in the beginning, they all went, the whole class goes to, um, to a hall and learn, learn to swim. But most of them, they, they know to, how to swim. That's, uh, that's, how do you manage with downhill skiing? Well, that's, um, you, you know, the, the, 
typically people like what they don't have in their own country. Exactly. And, um, well, we we then really um, get the nerves from uh, of, of in, in in the Germans because then all those 1.1 million cars drive to Austria and Switzerland and Northern Italy, and then they drive those people there crazy by um, trying to to downhill ski, which of course if you do that only five days a year, yeah. You know, it's 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 pure nonsense, of course. Yeah, this guy uh, myself, I have to say that I'm I'm I'm, I'm an, an, a sunny weather skier, so I I don't ski at any um, bad yeah. weather or snowstorm or anything. I don't do that. I I need sun and blue sky and beautiful uh, area right. uh, to to Quite ski. Also, people the see moguls. that they drive a car only road. five days a year. Well, they, they usually that's the the so-called February vacation is one week. And then they massively go, and they, you know, that the Dutch sign is NL from Netherlands, and in German they say nur links, so only left, because left. they only drive on the left side of the autobahn, right. and they are they 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 make those people mad. Mm -hmm. Vladimir, Vladimir, I think we have the time if you allow me and to it's... just. Of course, go ahead. I'm Come going on. to start early because this is the part of the program. Uh, am I okay to start a few words from Keki? Is Keki with us? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, and his makeup and all that, and all started. Of it has been oh. a long time oh. since we met, almost two months, and we will have another one next August. And we are all excited about the future on site activities with the focus on teaching young generation around the world, but we will make a good family trip together as well, as usual. Uh, I have received that message, nice message from uh, Professor Francesco Tomasello regarding the Professor Keki Turev, and I'd like him to hear it. The first two lines, I'm not going to say it because uh, apology why he could not come. But he said, Keki Turev deserved this recognition for his achievement his international reputation and his educational effort were very well received. He will continue to provide the international neurosurgical community with his brilliant ideas, his energy and his vision. We need this great gift, enjoying his friendship and wisdom. So this is for you, Keki, from Professor Thank you, Thank you very uh, much. Now, whoever is hosting, can I share one slide? Can I share the screen? Pablo or Ramesh? I think you should be able to share. Let me check, uh, Imad. It's um, done now. It's done, Imad. Yeah, it's done. Okay. You can just start sharing. You see a full slide? Yeah, you see it full size. Yeah. Yes, on the slide. So, Keki, he doesn't need oh. anything. But I have collected a few of the pictures he might cherish. Keki is known for us for three strengths. He has passion for the INI, where he did have his fellowship training in skull based surgery, Professor Sami. And I think he is a special person for him, like most of us. And that's why I put his picture. And they, on the right side of him, or left side of him, uh, there's a Dalai Lama. And I know that Keki is very spiritual and deep in the thinking and emotion, uh, or the emotional intelligence and caring. And I still remember that meeting he did and with the Goro was there and we enjoyed it very much. Keki has been on different spots as a president of his own country society, the Indian Society of Neurosurgery. He was president of the Asian, the Asian Oceanian Skull Base, the Asian Eurasia. Uh, he is an ambassador to different academies. I just selected a few pictures here. This is, uh, he, is a, he was a president ahead of me, I think two or three the person ahead of me for the Asian Ocean and Skull Base, I think you see is Vladimir, your picture there with all Skull Base surgeons. 
on this picture from 2006 in Dubai. And uh, the picture I put it small so I can adapt more pictures. The one next is in uh, India and New Delhi and this, uh, sorry, in Mumbai. This is the World Academy. He is sitting, oh, what did I do? Okay, let me go back. And I have selected several picture where he contributed to education everywhere. So he was with Professor Cato, with the Asian Congress on several trips, hands-on courses, and with the same family here uh, on, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, in Kenya. And these are the picture of all of you with him. And that picture, the list of the Asian Oceanian presidents of all uh, presidents they are together. I think that was taken in China and Beijing. But the most important invention of Keki, two things. The Hakuna Matata group, which you are all sitting with us. And I think this is an admirable invention. And the initiation of uh, recognition of complication and ways of discussing them and anticipating. Has conducted several webinars and sessions. And he is going to move further with this initiative uh, have it a real a beneficiary uh, educational system, webinars to the young generation and even to practicing neurosurgeons. So uh, that's all what I want to say about Keki. The other things I want to say, I will see it in private. All of you know <laughs> about it. But the other talent here, I forgot to say it on the picture, I see the two tigers. And this is his, what he, his main hobby is photography and uh, studying the behavior of uh, animals and creatures around the world. And he is a master in that regard and he has produced his own uh, artistic work. Well, thank you, Keki, for accepting this uh, invitation. You are an essential member of the IANA and you will continue. But our thought today will honor you to be one of the legendary neurosurgeon for your lifetime achievement. Thanks, Kiki. Thank you uh, very much, Ahmad. May I just say thanks to you and to your wonderful initiative. I think the World Federation should be proud when they initiated the anatomy committee, making you and Vladimir as their leaders. And you know how powerful the World Federation, and through that, the anatomy committee became the leading model of education. Uh, and now I know that uh, you have made this fantastic initiative of International Academy of, Neuro of Neurosurgery, of Neurological Anatomy. And this has attracted worldwide, young and old, all neurosurgeons. And you know that this is the most popular activity, educational activity in neurosurgery today. Uh, even though you have it on an odd weekday, you know that you have fantastic number of followers uh, with this uh, activity. And I'm really proud to be associated I'm really proud to be associated with you and with all these friends of ours who are continuously, you know, there at every meeting of yours and contributing so strongly with wonderful lectures. Those kind of lectures you will not be able to see on the internet. They have their own personal experience and insight and they are so well prepared with each of them. And it is not that one person keeps on talking on the same subject. I find them talking on many other subjects which just shows how, uh, how, uh, uh, were, were, I would say uh, uh, widespread activities the neurosurgeons in our group have. And I think that is why this uh, activity is so popular. And I thank you very much for this, uh, uh, for this great honor. Uh, I haven't received such a great honor even in my own country. So I'm even more impressed and I'm humbled. Honestly speaking, I wasn't expecting, but uh, so I don't know what have made you think about it, but whatever it is, you thought well, <laughs> you thought well for me and uh, yes our activity this you know when you get an honor you are pushed to performing even more so our activity on complications uh, which has now taken a few years to shape out will continue and we will both be symbiotic in our efforts at education you with the anatomy and me with the complications and we make a fantastic team and I'm at every meeting of ours also we have the same group we call them loyalists. They are all loyalists who are 
participating. So thank you very much for this honor. I very humbly accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, of course, that decision was made, the selection was made. Actually, I will want to give the credit to Vladimir. We discussed it together and we both agreed on that decision. I would like to move to the president of the IANA to have his word and in start the, the session as he feels. Vladimir. Well, hello everyone again. And, uh, we are going to start with the regular program of our meeting in, uh, let's say, in memory, not memory, in remembrance of Kiki. Kiki, hello again. And <laughs> I I really consider you to be a, one of my best friends. So uh, let's start with the lectures and uh, how do we go, Ima? Shall we start? Uh, or should I hand over to Sanjiva? Who is, who Sanjiva, is? yeah. If, so Sanjiva, you. please uh, start the program. Thank you. I will do the first two, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for this invitation. It's uh, it's a real honor. And, and I'm really happy to be here uh, and, and to honor Keki, who's... Uh, you know, not just as a friend, but I, I must say, Keki, every time I speak to you about a topic, I learn something. So I, I, I'm really, really happy to be here. And I'd like to say the same thing about uh, Professor Broughton here. Uh, I think that's also true. He's, he's a very experienced neurosurgeon, skull surgeon, my colleague in Europe. And, and I'll give him the same compliment I gave you, Keki. Every time I speak to him, I feel I really learn something. I really enjoy all, all of your talks from both of you. So we'll start off with Professor Broughton here, uh, who... As, a, as I said, a hugely experienced neurosurgeon, but today we'll be talking about the future neurosurgeon. Andreas, thank you for joining us. Uh, please start your talk. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen quickly, and I hope that I, when I move to slideshow that it will start. Can you see it? Can you see the screen? Yeah, we can. Yes. Oh. That's very good. Well, Imad and Vladimir, thank you so much for inviting me and for allowing me to participate in this, um, this webinar, honoring our good colleague and, and a mutual friend, Kiki Turrell. Um, the title was a little bit misplaced in, in the program because it is a bit longer title. Uh, it's about the future of neurosurgery. And the subtitle that I gave it was, uh, will it still be a privilege to be a neurosurgeon? Because personally, I think um, we, we are privileged that we can do this, this specialty. And um, I, do. <laughs> uh, I have um, certainly no financial disclosures uh, for this lecture, of course. Maybe only to say that um, I spent 42 years now in this specialty and um, uh, without any regrets, to, uh, to be honest, I would choose it again for sure. So it, it's always a little bit difficult because uh, when I talk to people of important. my age, you can use that. Um, then um, they often dwell in the past. I mean, the past is the largest part of our life and, um, and, and not so much more on future. Uh, but nevertheless, sometimes it is maybe good to try to get a glimpse of what is awaiting us. Uh, even when we are not um, around anymore. So quickly, what I will do is, in three parts is just to look back and say what has changed in the past four decades, and also briefly say what has not changed during that time, and then start to talk about what I think will be future changes in the specialty, but also in the future, I think some parts of this of neurosurgery will not change. So let's have a look. 40 years, I think many of you, and I don't, and don't want to be offensive to any of you, but most of you have been around in, uh, for this time in, in the specialty. So what we have seen is the operating microscope came end of the 70s and clinical practice. It's still indispensable tool. CT scan came in. So this is, an, and of course, the first scanners were only for the head, and now we have spiral and helical CTs and MRI scan. So during my training, there was no MRI scan. It came much later, end of the 80s and early 90s. Yes, and the endoscope indeed again um, uh, entered the neurosurgical field. 
And we all know that uh, endovascular techniques have completely changed the vascular neurosurgery. Um, the gamma knife or stereotactic radio surgery in general has really made a big impact on skull-based surgery. Deep brain stimulation is now a mainstay in functional neurosurgery. And certainly all these instrumentations in, um, that have been developed have really completely changed spinal neurosurgery. Neuronavigation, I mean, this is, it started mid and end of the 90s. Interoperative imaging, be it CT or MRI scan. And of course, interoperative neuromonitoring. These are all now standard procedures, but they were not there when I started in neurosurgery. So let's say in 40 years, but that has really changed a lot. But even more than that, those technologies, it, it was the molecular genetics that really completely changed classification of, um, uh, of brain tumors. And that for the first time made really tailored approaches, targeted therapies possible. And I think this will, will even become bigger in the very near future. Some other parts also, we talk about training that was also, that changed. I mean, for about a century, it was just an apprenticeship um, developed by William Holstadt. And you all know it was just spending most of your time over here inside the hospital doing a huge volume of surgical cases, seeing a big variety. That was the way training went. And that completely changed into a now what we call intentional learning system where not the number of cases are so important, but reaching a certain competency. And to achieve that, because the levels of, of num and the number of cases are lower, we also now need adjuncts like simulators, um, the cadaveric dissections, um, microsurgical lab, skill lab, et cetera, to ensure that the people still within the restricted time will reach um, the competency needed to be a neurosurgeon. A few things from those 40 years that has not changed is the fact that we still use a drill or a burr to open the skull. There is no magic things like a quick laser opening or something like that or anything else, either the hand burr or pneumatic or electric drill. And yes, we still remove the intervertebral discs, mainly with rongeurs. So also the young generation, when they learn this, they will get their blisters on the fingers when they have done several cases on a day. So this is still, this is still around. It hasn't changed. There is no magical um, technology that we just put on the disc and the disc is out. Yeah, we, we suture. We suture the dura. We don't have any welding system or anything else. And then the lower part, yeah, shunts are still around in neurosurgery. It's still there. I mean, endoscopy has changed something, but it's still an essential part of neurosurgery, having shunts and the procedure to insert the shunt. And some, a little bit to my surprise, the expectations about robots were very high in the, in the 90s when they were developed. Uh, the Da Vinci moved for the general surgical part, but in neurosurgery, it didn't meet the expectations. It wasn't into clinical practice as most of us initially expected it would be. But the developments are now going faster, but it has not been that way in the 40 years. So what will we see in the future? We will know much more on a, on a let's say, um, more microscopic level. We will be able in, in the near future already to, to not only know on the neuron level what is going on, but how to influence that and change the function, repair the function. And it will be done in a way with techniques um, it's still a technique, but not a technique that traditionally would be considered a neurosurgical manual technique to do. 
So yes, we have, we will see a lot of technology going around and needed to be able to understand what is happening inside brain and spinal cord. Already starting now, and there will be more in the future, are the microcellular repair strategies, and certainly more the brain computer interface and spinal cord computer interface. And that is developing very rapidly now. We have the, uh, the brain chip, and you can multiple, use two to four of these brain chips. And then um, that is a learning process, but this man can now, with his brain thoughts, move the exoskeleton. He was completely paralyzed. Or the stent road that is placed in the sagittal sinus in a certain area, but that is not a stent, a vascular stent, but it is a kind of electrode, allowing then a learning process for a paralyzed person to make movements just by thinking of them. And that is a very important development. It is, it's there, it's, it, it's starting. This is already reality and we will see this um, quickly uh, uh, increase in, in the upcoming years. But if we look how, how this future will be, I like this quote that says, the principal means of projecting the present into the future is by training those who will follow. follow. It was not a recent quote, it was actually in the presidential address of William German in 1953. So you see, this was of all times. We realize that the, new, the next generation is the future. They will do what we think should be possible. And if we look to that future generation of neurosurgeons, those are the young, youngsters now that is called the millennial generation. Millennials have grown up in this time of very rapid technological change, um, rapid globalization, but also economic disruption. They have now seen the pandemic, threats of war. And interestingly, if you look into their uh, mindset, they have a different set of priorities and expectations. And that mindset is different from the previous and also my generation. And they were the first generation, what were called digital natives. I mean, from the moment on they were in, in this life, they were surrounded by a 24 seven, always on digital world. So it, it was the normal environment for them. So there was a normal and natural affinity with technology. And they certainly will use it much more to shape how they will live and work than we do. And that was interesting to see in, 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 in a study about the millennials that the motives that drive them in life, if you look to the top three and the bottom three, you see what I mean in the different mindset and the set of priorities. The top three are family, purpose in life and love. And the bottom three are actually achieving power or authority, uh, achieving social status or being recognized. There you see that, but these, these, when they choose the specialty of neurosurgery, I'm sure they do that because they see it as a vocation, as many of us also did. But still, they need to be educated. So education is very important and um, um, we have to focus on that. And I think what we all do, you uh, as, as the, the academy now in neuroanatomy, but many others also, that's very important, but it never can really replace his personal mentorship. Because I think, and I strongly believe, what will not change is that there will always be a need for role models for the future generation. And we realize, and they, they, they know that, and we tell them that we don't train them because they will have then the possibility to earn a living. We train them to become these highly qualified specialists that are needed to further improve the care of neurosurgical patients and to deliver that with equity and high quality. 
So still, it will also not change in the future that we need the best and the brightest. And also, I think the, the, the general idea of what neurosurgery encompasses is, is something that will not change because it is simply the, the combination of the satisfaction of being able to either relieve pain or restore function. And yes, it is the challenge of a difficult surgical procedure and also the intellectual challenge of cervical, solving clinical problems. And also the variety of human issues we confront in daily practice. This all together will also in the future remain the essence of neurosurgery. So whatever um, the changes of an organization or economic structure and even developing technology will be in medicine and in neurosurgery. So I personally think the future is bright. Um, generally for medicine, but certainly for neurosurgery. And that is also because the best way to predict that future is to create it. And that is what we are now actually doing. So my final conclusion is that also in the future, it will remain a privilege to be a neurosurgeon. And I uh, thank you, Kiki for your lifelong contribution to the education of neurosurgeons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from our panel? Fantastic talk as always, Andres. It was a little bit offset, not, not anatomical. That will come now, all the technical <laughs> things. Come. Very important. Yeah, it was number one. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> Yeah. Any questions in the chat? I don't know. If any comments from anybody? Uh, Keki, do you have any comments? Let's see, I got a dog. I got raising his hand. Um, so who's got? A, sorry, Igor. 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 Please. Hello, Fadiva. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Nice see you. May, may, may I ask a short question? So, what's the future of anatomy in the next and next and next generations? Um, well, personally, I think that the anatomy is still the basis and will be the basis, but um, it will go to a more nano level also. We will, because we will be able to visualize um, to a much lower level of uh, structures than we see now. We think already MRI scan is an amazing thing, but we will be able to bring that down to the neuron level. So then also anatomy will adapt to that so that we will learn um, uh, how these neurons really, these networks really uh, work together. So this will be a much more functional anatomy, but anatomy will always be around for sure. Thank you, Andres. I think in, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on. Uh, but can, I ask, can I ask a question? Oh, of course, sorry, yes, of course. <coughs> sorry, Andre, uh, your and talk is fantastic. P perfect as usual. Um, Thank you, Kasari. Um, <laughs> there is there's just one question. <clears throat> uh, you didn't mention about prevention. Now imagine you know one of those bright students you are talking about, rather than uh, um, inventing a system to remove smallest tumor and so on, but he, he discovers small tablets you know, which will you know. Uh, completely remove, you know, meningiomas and all the gliomas and all those things, you know. So I dread that situation where we won't have anything to, to operate, <laughs> except, except, of course, trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what yeah, do yeah, you yeah. think about that? And that, is, that is not, uh, I don't know many people who really say that they specialize in, um, in, in trauma surgery, in trauma neurosurgery. But no, I, you're right. I mean, if that would come, still they will need to, I don't believe there will be a magic bullet and a magic pill uh, that make meningiomas disappear and gliomas disappear. But there will come times that they can find areas and say, there in the depth near the thalamus, there is a small area where we already find on the scan that it is starting to become dysfunctional. This could start as a tumor. 
Now we have this little file here with material to, to make sure that this will stop. And then they need a surgeon to get it there. So that is what I meant with, there will be techniques that but we the 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 manual the removal of the disc, but What's still the these techniques. So I think that What's functional the neurosurgical techniques will be very important. I tell my residents that if, if they look to me, what should I choose, oncology or vascular? And I say, if you really want a future uh, field, choose functional. Because it will, will go to restorative neurosurgery. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Mapo, you've got fine. a question and then we'll move on. Yes, Thank you very much, Andre, for that inspiring uh, talk. Uh, oh. Having had the privilege of working in the Western setting, coming back and working in Kenya, in a LMIC country, and in Nairobi, where we have a diversity of standards of care from high-class institutions to when I do missions, uh, what I'd like to say is this, where we are at the moment, where I am practicing, we are seeing the past and the present around the same time, Yes. And then when we visit the centers in, in the States or Europe or Japan or Switzerland, we see the future from our perspective. So what I'd like to see is that we as a collegial set of neurosurgeons begin to collaborate in such a way that the presence in LMIC countries does not get delinked from the future of neurosurgery. And by that, I mean, there is an intense need now with the economic situations dwindling the capacity of our young neurosurgeons to travel abroad uh, to centers of excellence, to develop a system, a very structured system of dedicated fellowships for those in LMIC countries to visit, spend time, so that as we move on over the next 20 years, we don't in the LMIC countries see a generation that becomes delinked from the future. Mm -hmm. We've had the privilege of working with the future and the present and are working with the past. We use hand, you know, we use huts and braces and jiggly saws um, and really uh, sublaminar wiring sometimes when we go to do missions. So we see the past as we practice, but we don't want that to become such a dichotomy that the LMIC countries, which is about 80% of the world or 70% of the world, of doesn't get delinked from the high class centers of the world. So we have a responsibility to develop those fellowships, training fellowships, positions, uh, almost as a responsibility for the future. That's what I would say. No, no, that's, I uh, think that's a really thank you for the comment. Point. Yes, that's, uh, that's absolutely fully true. If you don't mind, we're just going to move on now, just in the interest of time, if that's okay. But obviously, a talk that's generated a lot of interest. Thank you very much again, Andres. Great talk. Thank you. And we're going to move on now uh, to Victor Hugo Perez, uh, our colleague who's, uh, you've, you've seen these fantastic talks before, this time talking to on a topic that's hugely of importance to all of us, particularly skull based surgeons, the anatomy of the ethmoidal artery and its role in entry for some meningitis. Victor, thank you for joining us. Please start your talk. Sorry, Victor, I think you're still muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjiva. This is a very important invitation for me to speak about this topic. And of course, for giving me the opportunity in this special webinar that is honoring to our friend Keki Turel. Let me share the whole screen. And then I think, is, is, it, uh, is it the whole screen? No, not yet, no. Yet. Not yet? Not yet? No. Okay. Now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to talk about the surgical anatomy of ethmoidal arteries and the role in meningiomas of the anterior 
cranial fossa. Uh, anterior cranial fossa meningiomas account for approximately 12 to 22 percent of all intracranial meninges. They are classified according to their site of origin, of origin into olfactory group, planum sphenoidal, tuberculum cellae, diaphragm cella, and orbital roof, and clinoid, clinoidal meningiomas. Uh, Harvey Cushing's illustrations showing the large size attained by certain olfactory group meningiomas and the relation to the anterior cerebral artery and anterior communicating artery. As you know, as everybody know, uh, Harvey Cushing was a pioneer, uh, the pioneer doing this kind of surgery. This is a picture, a really nice picture in which uh, Harvey Cushing uh, showed the relation with this uh, giant uh, meningiomas with the anterior cerebral artery and also the anterior communicating artery, as you can see in this uh, uh, picture. So uh, then after Foster Kennedy defined at the National Hospital in Queens Square in London, the syndrome in 1911. One syndrome when present is diagnostically decisive, a speedy reduction in ipsilateral, ipsilateral acuity of vision due to ipsilateral compression neuritis of the optic nerve lying below the frontal lobe, coincident with papilledema and normal vision of the opposite eye. From compression of the olfactory tract, there is usually under these circumstances anosmia on the same side on which retrobulbar neuritis and the primary optic atrophy have occurred. Of these, olfactory group and tuberculum cellae are the most common sites of origin. Given the benign nature of these tumors, the ideal management is gross total reception with excision of the surrounding dura and bone. A complete surgical excision of these tumors is a challenging endeavor due to the close proximity to critical neurovascular structures, such as internal carotid artery, anterior cerebral artery, anterior communicating artery with perforators, visual apparatus, and pituitary gland. So I want to show you this short uh, video about the anterior cerebral arteries and some uh, anatomical variations that you can see in here. So here we have the absence of a true anterior communicating artery. Instead, they are, they, they are very close, as you can see in here. So in the resection of uh, these uh, meningiomas, we should be very careful uh, in order to respect the arteries coming from the anterior communicating artery and also the anterior cerebral artery, A1 and A2, A, A co, anterior cerebral artery. This is a dissection in my lab, dissection lab, in which I am doing a resection of uh, cortical uh, substance, and then to follow the frontal orbital arteries that are the first branches in the second segment of the anterior cerebral artery. You can get some skills, some abilities doing this kind of exercise in a lab dissection. So this is another picture in which we can see some anatomical variation of the anterior communicating artery. This is an artery, uh, uh, this is a, a thermic artery, uh, also known as artery of Penfield. So 
In this, we, we can see these uh, giant meningiomas and the displacement of uh, the lobe, frontal lobes and also the arteries. And in here, another picture looking at this uh, incredible vascular anatomy of uh, the brain, the complexity of uh, these uh, arteries is very important to know. In, in this picture, I remove the hypothalamus in order to see the perforators that are coming from the posterior communicating artery and A1. So uh, uh, also the some arteries that are coming from the anterior communicating artery uh, that are going to supply the anterior nuclei of the hypothalamus. We should to be very careful to respect these arteries, these very small arteries, because if we damage this artery, we could have a uh, hypothalamic uh, syndrome. So this is another picture. And according to the site of attachment, the most common meningiomas of the anterior cranial fossa are classified into olfactory group, planum sphenoidal, and tuberculum celli meningiomas. Uh, this is an open uh, craniotomy in which uh, we can see the uh, giant meningioma and after resection, a complete resection of uh, this tumor. Uh, in here, we can see the optic nerves and the, uh, so, uh, the carotid arteries, supraclinal carotid arteries. The etmoidal branches, uh, the anterior and posterior etmoidal branches of the ophthalmic artery, of which the anterior is the larger, arise beneath the superior oblique muscle and pass through the anterior and posterior etmoidal canal to reach the dura beside the cribriform plate. Here we have the Cristagalli and a picture about the anatomy of the anterior fossa floor. Here the cribriform area. And then after I'm going to resect the bone in order to see these uh, beautiful arteries. The anterior etmoidal artery passes across the floor of the anterior cranial fossa near the cribriform plate. It gives rise to the anterior fox artery, which runs between and supplies the anterior portion of the fox and walls of the superior sagittal sinus. The anterior and posterior etmoidal arteries then pass through the cribriform plate area to supply the etmoidal sinuses, the infundibulum of the frontal sinus, the anterior nasal cavity, and the skin over the cartilaginous part of the nose. Here we have a picture doing this kind of uh, dissection in order to see the orbit and the cribriform plate of uh, the etmoid. And then uh, in this, uh, in this uh, surgery, uh, open surgery, uh, I made a, a very wide uh, flap uh, of perostium in order to put uh, at the end of the surgery to avoid uh, some uh, fistulas. So this is very important to make uh, this, uh, this uh, division of the periosteum. Then after uh, we work uh, to avoid damage to the supraorbital uh, nerves, that is a branch of the trigeminal nerve. I am preparing in this uh, video the, the osteotomy. we make a channel to respect the supraorbital nerve.
then uh, once uh, uh, in this uh, video i want to show you the osteotomy of the frontoethmoid orbital osteotomy this is made with syncells And then after we are going to have a very good plane to make the reception. The anterior ethmoidal artery crosses near the anterior edge of the cribriform plate. The posterior ethmoidal artery crosses near the posterior edge of the cribriform plate a few millimeters anterior to the orbital end of the optic canal. Here we have the anterior ethmoidal artery and posterior ethmoidal artery coming from the ophthalmic artery. Arteries that supply the margins of the superior orbital fissure and may be recruited to supply tumors in the region include the anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery, the recurrent meningeal branches of the ophthalmic and lacrimal arteries, the meningeal branches of the internal carotid artery, the tentorial branch of the meningo hypophyseal trunk, the anterior branch of the inferolateral trunk, and the terminal branches of the internal maxillary artery. Uh, here we have uh, uh, the patient that was operated uh, with the, this uh, open uh, craniotomy and in here we, uh, we can see the, the developing of uh, this surgery. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this uh, surgery, we can make a, a, a big uh, resection of the tumor uh, with these scissors. And uh, when we, we, we are going to the middle or end of uh, uh, the procedure, we, we have to be very, very careful in order to avoid damage of uh, the arteries. As, uh, I put... Uh, this uh, cotonoid in order to avoid damage of uh, the brain. I know that uh, nowadays we have another uh, very good options. For example, the uh, endoscopic assisted surgery for this kind of surgeries, but uh, uh, it depends the, uh, of uh, your uh, uh, economic resource in your hospital. Not all the hospitals uh, have uh, the, the most uh, modern technology to do this kind of surgery. But uh, I think uh, for that reason, one of the most important thing is to know anatomy, to work with uh, uh, in lava dissections in order to know much better the anatomy in these uh, cases. So this is another giant uh, uh, tumor. And uh, as you can see, it, it we have in here in this patient, uh, uh, big edema and uh, this is a coronal uh, aspect uh, sagittal uh, in this uh, in this patient the tumor uh, was displacing also the hypothalamus and is almost over the the cellar region so in this patient who when uh, in the uh, some days after the surgery uh, the uh, prefrontal lobe syndrome uh, occurs in association with tumors, trauma or degenerative disease in the prefrontal and orbitofrontal cortices is characterized by a conglomerate of signs and symptoms that include impairments in decision making, ability to plan, social judgment, conduct modulation of affect, and emotional response and creativity. So look uh, in here, the, the, the complete resection, but this, this patient developed this uh, prefrontal lobe syndrome. Such, such patients lose spontaneity in motor as well as mental activities. 
and do not appear to realize that they are neglecting themselves and the responsibilities at home and work. They manifest love of innovation in social behavior and are usually euphoric and unconcerned. So uh, here we have uh, uh, another uh, aspect of uh, brain dissections. Uh, I think that uh, uh, with, with only one brain, we can do so many things. For example, in here, uh, I was doing a, a, a dissection of uh, the white substance. And uh, in this case, uh, we have the hippocampus and the hippocampal artery coming from uh, P2. This is P1, P2. And also we can see the posterior communicating artery and the middle cerebral artery giving rise to the lenticular straight, artery, straight arteries. So I think this is one uh, of the best uh, uh, exercise that we can do. Um, here we have uh, the, the gross total resection of this tumor. This is the, uh, the team in my country, in my hospital. And another uh, uh, pictures uh, to show this uh, anterior that are, uh, maybe they can be involved in these uh, uh, giant meningiomas. Uh, in here, we have the optic nerves, the supracranial carotid arteries, lenticular striates arteries, the anterior choroid artery, and then if we displace these uh, uh, optic nerves, uh, we can see these uh, branches that are coming from the anterior communicating artery. This artery that uh, you are uh, watching here, in here, uh, is an anterior hypothalamic artery. Take care of these small arteries because uh, you can cause and hypothalamic syndrome. Thank you, thank you. This is the, the last uh, picture. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Victor. An excellent uh, anatomical talk as always. Are there any comments on the panel? Otherwise, I'm gonna hand over to Vladimir for our next uh, speaker. Okay, we can save any maybe some a discussion at the end. Uh, thank you very much again, Victor. Very good talk. Okay. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you very much. And we are going to go ahead because as I see we have a panel discussion at the very end. So only the pressing questions probably should be asked during the uh, lectures. Uh, so let's ask uh, our very good friend, uh, Igor Lima Maldonado to give a an overview or a lecture on superior orbital fissure. Igor, are you ready? Yes. Very uh, good. Nice to see you, Vladimir. Nice to see you all. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Everything's all right. OK. The sound is good. <laughs> OK, so good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here for this uh, IANA webinar for our friend Keki. Thanks, all the attendees, for connecting. So we'll see the main concepts related to the anatomy of this important and complex region. In many ways, uh, the structures are structures we are used to, but in a location that we don't go every day. Every day. Uh, the superior orbital fissure communicates at the middle fossa, the cavernous sinus with the orbit. So uh, elements that cross uh, the fissure travel in the middle skull base, under the anterior skull base, and penetrates the orbit. When we look to the superior orbital fissure from above, such as in this picture, the elements take together the form of a, of a sand clock shape. The anterior part is large and corresponds to the orbit. The middle part is narrow inside the fissure and close to the optic canal. And the posterior part is uh, large again and goes to the uh, inside the middle fossa. So this arrangement creates a a congested area that is susceptible to pathology. Uh, the narrow part of the uh, sand clock is bordered by bones covered by dura and uh, fibrous elements. So I will first describe this rigid limits 
and then we move to the contents of the region. My goal uh, today is to provide uh, landmarks in this uh, complex area. Uh, this phenoid bond is the main bond involved in the limits of the superior orbital fissure. So these are nice um, schemas from this atlas. Uh, this uh, and also from my uh, friend Professor Destrio. Uh, so I think this is a schematic anatomy that made very simple, very useful. Uh, so uh, this uh, main bone, which is the the central part of this phenoid can be considered as a modified cube in which we see here an anterolateral view. So we identify this cella as a coronal groove, anterior to it, we have the jugum, posterior the dorsum, and the posterior climax. We can add the two pterygoid processes attached to the inferior aspect of the body, and the two uh, lesser wings attached to the superolateral aspect of the body. And with the lesser wings, we also attach the anterior clinoid processes and part of the anterior skull base. And finally, the two greater wings, we can uh, schematize the greater wings of um, being made up of three planes. One is the horizontal plane, which is infratemporal. One is the vertical temporal plane that participates to the lateral aspect of the skull. And the last one is the orbital plane that separates the middle fossa from uh, the orbit. So the superior orbital fissure is actually a cleft that is formed by the proximities of the borders of the three of those elements. The lateral aspect of the body, the inferior aspect of the uh, lesser wing, and the medial aspect of the orbital plane of the greater wing. So this is uh, exactly what we see when we um, take a look on this endocranial perspective. We have here the lesser sphenoid wing above, the sphenoid body with the sphenoid sinus medial, and the greater uh, sphenoid wing lateral. So uh, this is a general summary of the shape and contents of the fissure. So from medial to lateral, the fissure uh, inclines uh, superiorly. It does not lie in a strict coronal plane. The lateral margin is also positioned is slightly anterior in relation to the medial margin. And superlateral, the fissure is narrow. We see uh, here the lesser sphenoid wing, which has a suture for the frontal bone. In the middle part, the fissure uh, is also uh, narrowed by a triangular, more or less triangular shaped uh, bony prominence. Uh, in both the side of the lesser sphenoid wing and the greater sphenoid wing. So you, you have this uh, narrowing with uh, triangular shaped bony structures. Inferior medial to these prominences, the fissure is dilated and immediately superlateral to it, uh, the fissure is also slightly enlarged. So these two enlargements, they mark for us the presence of veins. We see here the inferior of thumb vein and the superior of top vein. So every, uh, when you see enlargements, the dura veins uh, close the treat. Um, the basis of the, uh, of the anterior crinoid process projects uh, just above the central layering of the fissure. And the lateral border, uh, the triangular prominence is uh, where the lateral edge of the uh, ring of zinc is attached. So this is the common insertion of the four uh, rectal uh, muscles. Here we can see uh, the, um, the um, superopter fissure from the uh, orbital perspective. We see the fissure has the shape of an obtuse triangle. We see two angles. Laterally, the superior one is more sharp, the inferior one is more open. And you see uh, at the lateral side the bony prominence that divides the lateral border in two parts. We can then deduce the attachment of the uh, tendinous ring of zin that would be in the living person at this situation, surrounding part of the contents of the fissure and the optic tract and the optic canal. Uh, two uh, foramens can be described uh, around the optic fissure. That's the case of the uh, optic canal for the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery, and the foramen rotundum for uh, the maxillary nerve. 
uh, the optic canal is formed by um, a space between the two attachments of the lesser sphenoid wing. Actually, the lesser sphenoid wing is attached to the sphenoid body by two roots. The anterior root is also superior and continues with the jugum, while the posterior root or the optic strut is the pillar supporting the anterior clinoid process and the rest of the lesser sphenoid wing. So what about the dura and fibrous elements? As you know, the dura is made of uh, two layers. The outer layer is the, uh, the outer layer is the periosteal one, as you see here in green. The inner layer is the cerebral layer of dura propria in contact with the arachnoid membrane. You note that the outer periosteal layer continues with the orbit and the inner cerebral layer continues with the sheet of the optic nerve. So the periorbit is an extension of, um, of the periosteal layer. Inside the skull, inside the skull, uh, when we have spaces between these two layers, it corresponds often to a venous space or fat. That's the case of uh, epidural, venous, plexus, uh, carbonyl sinus. And when movements are requested, as uh, the case of, uh, of the orbit, uh, this space contains fat. So this is uh, uh, one way of uh, conceiving this, uh, this space in the orbit is uh, to uh, perceive the orbital fat as occupying an extension of the, intra, of the entire dural space or uh, an extension of the, uh, uh, any space of the extension of the interdural space. So these are uh, schemes and dissections of uh, my colleagues. Uh, in the lab, the trio and Francois, uh, an illustration of intradural space. So both layers of dura um, cover the roof of the orbit and are adherent at this location, but they can be separated. And the inner layer uh, removed uh, on the roof of the orbit makes visible the outer layer lining the bone. So the outer layer can also be, sorry, the outer layer can also be uh, opened and then the roof of the optic canal is removed. And when the sheet is opened, it's clearly continues with the inner layer of the dura. So the annular tendon is located just anterior to the optic canal and, uh, and superior of the fissure, and is adherent to the nerve sheet and to the periorbita. This is the common insertion, as I mentioned, of the four rectus muscles, because the levator inserts directly to the lesser uh, sphenoid wing itself. The annular tendon so divides the uh, orbital ap apex in four uh, compartments. One uh, does not belong to the superior outer fissure, which is the optic canal. But then inside the ring, inside the tendon, uh, which contains the optic nerve and the optic uh, ophthalmic artery, we have three compartments, which are parts, different parts of the superior outer fissure, which is the lateral, the central, inside the tendon, and the medial compartments. So uh, the intraconic elements of the orbit may or may, uh, the intraorbital elements may or may not run inside the, the tendon. So inside it, we have the superior and inferior branches of the oculomotor nerve that will bifurcate at the level of the fissure. We also will find here the abdosens nerve and the mesociliary branch, which is a branch of, the, uh, of V1 of the nerve. In the lateral component, uh, compartment, we will have two other branches of the of, of, of tongue nerve, the frontal and the lacrimal, uh, the trochal nerve, and as I mentioned, the superior orbital vein. And finally, in this large portion, the larger portion below, we'll find the inferior orbital vein and a variable quantity of, uh, of fat. So uh, this is a beautiful dissection of uh, Professor Rotten's group, who we see uh, neural elements that going uh, from the lateral wall with the carbonyl sinus and are running to the superior orbital fissure. So we see uh, the third, the fourth, and the first division of the of the fifth. This is a beautiful dissection. There's another one, and this one uh, uh, anterior is uh, to the left. So we see how the nerve passes uh, through the fissure. We note the bifurcation of the oculomotor nerve in the superior and inferior divisions and how it gets 
together with uh, uh, other elements with the mesociliary and abducens nerve to passes inside the annular tendon. Uh, this is an uh, orbital anterior perspective. We see how uh, these elements of the apex were organized. Those that are inside the muscular cone and the annulus, and those is the, uh, those that are outside, such as the inferior orbital vein, the superior orbital vein, and the frontal and mesociliary branches. So, uh, in this view, we have the three compartments: the central, the lateral, and the medial, with uh, the simplest to one. So a uh, clinical application of a venous anatomy, uh, just only a curiosity. We see here venous infarction in a young patient, simultaneously uh, several images of, um, of venous ectasias were, were found, which is very typical of carotidal cavernous uh, fistula. We see retro retrograde filling of the superior and the inferior of tongue veins, which are dilated. So the superior of tongue vein is a classical pathway for endovascular treatment, um, mainly when the arterial approach is not uh, successful. So this is uh, the final result. And to conclude, I would, buy, I would like to briefly show a cadaveric dissection with uh, another uh, application, specific application of this knowledge. So this uh, dissection also shows um, three classical approaches for the optical nerve, which will be hidden here in the orbit, uh, just anterior to the ring of Z, which are the lateral, the central, and the medial approaches. So there are uh, many others, but we saw main ones when they come from above. From the lateral approach, the optical nerve is exposed between the lateral rectus muscle, which is retracted laterally, and the superior rectus and the levator. Uh, which are retracted immediately. So this approach provides the wider work and space uh, for the proximal, um, proximal optical nerve, more space than the medial or central approach. The central approach, uh, uh, in the central approach, the superior rectus is uh, retracted laterally and the levator papillary uh, is retracted immediately. This approach logically is the uh, the shortest way to the to the nerve, but as you see, we have less space and and is not the most used one. And finally, the medial approach is directed when the, the levator uh, and the superior rectus are both retracted laterally. So uh, this is, it gives you a very oblique approach, but it's still possible for the optical nerve. So it's here uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation. And I cannot finish it without a word to Professor Turell. And my uh, admiration for Professor Turell is simply uh, difficult to describe. It's a mixture of recognition, deep respect, and a sincere friendship. So I thank Keki for all his initiatives. There are many for his energy, which uh, is huge for all his contributions to neurosurgery in the world. Uh, in summary, I thank him for being him. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Igor. Uh, excellent as always. Uh, very, one really gets afraid to do surgery in the future when you give all, all, all the structures which there are. Uh, any question? From the floor. Okay, so let's keep it for the discussion later. And uh, we now shall go ahead to Ramesh Schneier, who's going to be a little more clinical. It's okay. about anterior skull base meningiomas, anatomy, and choice of approach. Ramesh, please. Thanks, uh, Vladimir. Um, I am very um, grateful for this invitation to talk here. Um, I am also really honored uh, to um, be a part of this program honoring our dear Keki um, because um, you know I am also fortunate to call him as a, a very close friend for many years. We've had so many adventures uh, together. Uh, always I find him as someone who tried to enjoy life to the fullest. Um, and enjoy the nature, enjoy teaching, enjoy neurosurgery. In, in fact, everything this life has to offer. 
I, I think that is what I find in KK. Um, so that uh, he's so charismatic that uh, everybody flocks towards him. You know, it's neurosurgeons and students. And as you can see in this one, it is it's even the birds are flocking <laughs> towards him. <laughs> so he's giving, they, they are giving him a head massage. So Iger is standing there. It's a head massage and everything. So they are so fond of it. So I have to say, um, I wish KK carry on like this um, as long as, as he can. And uh, thank you for your friendship, KK. And um, I start with the- Ramesh, go to the presentation mode. Okay. Sorry, uh, you've seen this. Okay, fine. Um, so thank you, KK, for it. But I start with this, this talk with a, a message. Um, I would probably say to my younger self, um, which I would like for my younger colleagues and trainees, um, um, if you, they would want to take some of it. I take everything as a learning opportunity, the time you spend. Um, there are incredible valuable lessons each you can absorb if you are, if you are keen, if you, are, if you look into it, because you find opportunity when you're looking for it. That is how it is. And, and neurosurgic learning is the same thing. And all you have to remember, whatever you uh, um, see and, 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 and teach or do, everything will add up. Eventually it will add up and nothing is lost. So that is what you have to remember and take particular in, interest in complications. And because you don't want um, your patients to have complications, that's why it's so important to look at complications from others. And, 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 and KK has done a great initiative of setting up this uh, a, a topic everywhere in the world and we are all part of it. So take interest in complications, find out what happened and how can you, how you can avoid it. Because when you, when you become old, you would want your doctor to not to make a mistake. How can that happen? Because if they, they have to learn from others' mistake, you cannot learn from your own mistake. It is too much of a value it costs to do that. And the other important point is that we operate, especially uh, cranial surgeons and, and, and peripheral nerve surgeons, we have to decide the side. Don't make a mistake because in, in, in many, especially younger people, when they start their career, younger neurosurgeon, if that sort of complication happens, um, it can be a change uh, for their life, for their career. In many places around the world, that can be an end to their uh, career. So make sure that that becomes, should whenever you start an operation, that should be the final check in your mind always. Don't remember. And, and the other thing is train hard. Train hard whenever, whenever, when you are in training. It is actually easy to train hard when you are a young person. So easy to train hard is like an oxymoron, but it is the truth. Because when you are in training, when you, when you are a younger person, you can train really hard. But when you are established, when you have a senior consultant, when your family has all set up and you can't move around, then it's going to be more tough. But train hard when you have the opportunity. And the way to learn things is to observe, assist, and perform. So you have to observe thousands before you assist hundreds, before you perform one. It should be like a pyramid. So it's not the other way around. You should have a very strong base. Once you have that kind of base, once you have seen NF and NF, once you have assisted NF, when you perform, your hands will not shake. You have a confidence to do whatever procedure you need to do. And uh, many times you see some interesting cases going on. Make it be a part of it. Be getting more because you may not see even the experienced neurosurgeon will not see such cases in their lifetime. And the, the final point is have a rapport with your patient because you're on the patient side. It's not that you versus patient, the doctor versus patient, because you are with them and you have to fight for your patient. If you do that, you will your life will be pleasant. With that, I will start this topic and I just uh, change the, 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 the topic a little bit um, to widen the, the topic to all the meningiomas and the strategy for um, the choice, choosing the approach. For many tumors, and uh, you've seen Victor uh, showing big uh, olfactory meningiomas, many tumors, the choice of approach is fairly um, straightforward. You don't have to think twice. You don't have to contemplate in your brain what approach you take. But what I learned is that the more you think about how to do it, the more you strategies you have in your mind, the better the outcome will be. I remember reading uh, Professor Ramamurthy's book a long time ago. He mentioned in that book that think more, operate less. So you have to really think before you actually operate. 
You have to think how you can make the best outcome from an operation. That is about devising the best approach and best access, how to utilize the gravity and all that thing. And this is apart from learning the, uh, the patient case and, and learning the, the, the scans and looking at all the final details. Cases like this, one can decide whether to do a biofrontal or unifrontal and those sort of approaches and where to go for. Because meningiomas are one of the most commonest operations you do as a trainee. So for example, let's see one of these cases uh, in the last few months. Um, so this is a big tumor in a, a middle-aged lady with a tumor going into the brain and a slightly um, a different sort of uh, extension of the tumor. Tumor extending, ex uh, extending from the surface, going through the brain, and then you can see all the middle cerebral vessels are displaced laterally. So what happened here? So in order to... Um, decipher this um, uh, the, the complex case, you need to really go back in time. Think about how it was in the beginning. If it was a convective tumor, you know that it would have pushed the cisterns, and pushed the brain, or, 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 and you can imagine how it grew. So that is the way to do it. Um, so once you uh, once you uh, uh, analyze the growth of the tumor when it was smaller, you know that it, it may have grown through the brain rather than through the cilium fissure. If this was a tumor that would have that grown through the sylvian fissure, the, all the MCA vessels and the sylvian fissure vessels would be stretched around it. But in this case, the tumor would have grown through the brain, gone into the brain, and then gone deeper towards the, you can see that it is even going to the pituitary base. So that, but the growth came from the convexity. So to think back in time will help you to strategize this sort of operation. Here also you can see, that um, the MR angiogram shows the vessels are stretched outside it. If you look at the, uh, the picture here, the tumor would have started as a small tumor somewhere here, then grew through the brain and into the vein. So, which means all the sylvian fissure is displaced laterally. It makes it complex, but if you know this principle, you're not going to make a mistake of uh, damaging the uh, important vessels in the sylvian fissure. All you need to do is to um, find the attachment and detach it. So we will talk about the, the principles of meningioma all the time. Now, four or five days, as Imad would call it, you detach it first, thereby you are devascularizing it. Once you devascularize it, you make, you keep, you're making it dead. So you don't have any further complication. Then all you need to do is reduce it in bulk, slowly demolish it, slowly make it smaller and smaller. In the end, it will be a very uh, simple, straightforward operation. So tumor size shouldn't really be an issue if you know where it started. So this is um, so important. So this is um, um, the, the um, scan with a simple craniotomy and uh, following the tumor. We'll go to the next one. These are all some of the examples where I think strategizing the approach will help you to get a good outcome. For example, this is a, a lady in her 50s, came with a spastic right leg. She, you can see that uh, the tumor is quite big, but it is attached to the deeper fox and the uh, tendoral area and um, in the deep uh, part of the brain. And the, there is a big cortical mandle. How do you approach this case? Uh, what is the best approach? They have to really think uh, a lot of time whether you want to go into hemispheric or whether you want to go contralateral, what is the position, supine position, lateral position. These are the things you need, really need to think about. So what are the factors you will be thinking about? You can see that the tumor is attached to the fox. So you know the attachment. And one of the main principles for meningiomas in most of the situation is to get to the base of it. So once you detach it, then you are doing two things. One is you are, you are making it mobile. Second thing, you are devascularizing it. Once these two factors have happened, then surgery becomes much easier. Then the question is about which side to take. So if you put this left side down, that means you will, this part of the brain, this part of the tumor will be hidden in, in your blind side. But then does it mean that you go from the other side um, contralaterally? So then um, you have to then decide what decides the approach in this case. Thereby, that's when you decide about the attachment and also the venous circulation. Here you can, you know that it is attached to the deeper forks and the inferior thatchel sinus and um, partly towards the tendorium. And it's a big tumor. This is where you have to decide which side to approach. If you go through the ipsilateral approach, if there is a, a, a no interhemispheric veins, a bridging vein, then you can go through it. Then you can do a lateral approach and then keeping the left side down. But then once you commit to the uh, a lateral position, then you know that 
if you find big veins traversing the endodermis fissure, you cannot change the position. So that is the thing which you have to really look for. Look at the MRV, look at the MR angiogram, look for the veins, which is the best side to go for. Uh, if you, on the other hand, if you place, place the patient on the right-hand side, tumor of course will be coming towards you and you will be working uh, up and that you, you can pull it down. But then you also have the risk of damaging the normal side. You might, risk, you might damage the cerebral cortex from the tumor excision. If you damage this side, essentially that's going to be a bilateral deficit, which is not. So in this case, the lateral position, left side down, big flap, sagittal sinus in the middle, and you can see the head is elevated. And, and uh, then the critical thing is to allow, this is a left side brain down, and you are generally dissecting the interhemisphere fissure. The, one of the most important thing in this sort of tumors is that you should not disturb the venous circulation. When you're planning to do some retraction and along with the venous resection, there is a high risk of having intracerebral hematoma because you know, the brain has to drain somewhere. If you are just damaging the veins, there will be a congestion, there will be a postoperative hemorrhage, especially near the tumor. So this is the approach where um, the, the tumor, the fox near the midline is generally dissected, taking care to avoid any damage to the vessel. Once you get to the base, you generally debulkate whatever with the whatever space you have. You don't need any retraction. All this retraction is on the midline. So you have some retraction of the fox. So, but the important thing is that you're not retracting the normal uh, brain. And then once you debulkate, um, then it, it, it comes out without much difficulty. So all the, 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 the important point is about which side to approach and how to avoid uh, venous uh, resection. So when um, we'll go on to the next one. So this, this is a post-operative scan and she did really well and spasticity would resolve in six months time. And um, she had a, a very po good post-operative outcome. So let's see the next one. So this is someone with um, a fox and meningioma. So do you need a bifrontal craniotomy or a unifrontal craniotomy? I think it all depends on if it is a fox meningioma, once you know that you go around the attachment, it becomes on So you don't really have to go to the other side to excise it, you can get a, a complete resection by choosing the side where the tumor is prominent maximally. So these are the ways you need to, rather than doing a straightforward standard bifrontal craniotomy just because of the midline tumor, um, it, it is probably an a, a over um, excessive pro, um, approach for that kind of cases. So this is the craniotomy you can see here, um, and that is enough to resect this tumor. And in not, to, to understand how complex the tumor is and where should you approach the tumor. For example, this case, this is a, a tumor near the petrous apex, but it's mostly attached to the tent. So this is where you have to go between the tent and the petrous bone in the supralateral corner to get to the base of the tumor. And once you get to the base and detach it, then, then surgery is straightforward. So you don't have to have, have do a, a standard retrosigmoid approach for this or a petrosectomy approach for this. It's a very simple operation, even you know where the tumor started. So you have to think about where the tumor started, how it displays the cistern. Is, is this a complex tumor or a simple tumor? That depends on where the tumor started. Again, you have to think back in time, the tumor would have started in the superior, over the superior uh, part of the meatus in this supramiatic tubercle. You can see the attachment on the MRI scan. Even though this looks big, with all the nerves around it, it is a simple operation to do. It's only the time you have to take to generally dissect off the tumor from everywhere. But in terms of strategy and the complexity, it is a simpler tumor. This is a man in his um, uh, 60s, uh, I believe, um, otherwise healthy, having uh, long track signs. And this was 10 years ago. Um, and um, almost near total excision, this was 10 years later. He's now in his uh, 70s. And um, there was a small remnant left behind, you can see there, which I didn't have to give any additional or adjunctive treatment. So if you do the correct approach, if you, if you analyze the, the tumor well, you will have a good outcome. And, and um, tumors like this in the anterior skull base, there can, we can debate whether it's the, what's the best approach to do, whether this is going to be an endoscopic route, whether it's going to be a supra orbital approach or a modified atelial approach or a subfrontal approach, these are the possible options. But what is important is that before deciding for approaches which you're not familiar with, for example, if you're deciding about 
endoscopic approach, which is a debatable option for some of these meningiomas these days, but there are still some tumors which are amenable to such uh, endoscopic approaches. And uh, you need that depends on your experience, your institutional experience with this uh, new technology and, and the new, new approaches. In this case, this, all it took was a, a modified genome approach. But I tend not to go through the super approach when you have a, a, a fairly pneumatized frontal layer sinus. Um, so that, that all factors you have to think about. Larger tumors, something for, is this something for endoscopic approach? Because there are some factors like hyperostosis and she's got a pituitary tumor as well this lady. So there are a few factors, but it's not an endoscopic case at all. The few things, you know, the, the tumor coronal section in the coronal plane, you can see this extending beyond the epicnea bilaterally. Um, and there's significant brain swelling. And when you operate on such tumors endoscopically, it's going to be a nightmare. Because often you find that there is brain invasion. Sometimes the vessels are attached to it, even though in this case it wasn't. So all you need is a, a standard unifrontal approach um, or a, or a um, uh, bifrontal if needed. In this case, it's just a unifrontal approach. The other thing is many of these tumors with brain swelling, when you do a frontal approach, all you have to remember is that you may have to take the orbital bar, which um, Victor was uh, showing very nicely. But you don't have to have a bilateral eyebrow, um, uh, the bony bar, resection, you can modify it according to the side you're approaching. So this, guy, this patient went for a unifrontal approach um, without much uh, difficulty. This case, is, even though this is a, a medium-sized tumor, you have to be really worry, uh, worry about it because the tumor is causing a lot of swelling. When you operate, the brain will be swollen. So worry about medium-sized tumors, not the small tumors, not the bigger sized tumors, because the brain is already swollen. And if you're not really gentle with the tumor, you can cause further swelling, and there's not much space for the brain to occupy that uh, uh, tumor's cavity. That's why you have to avoid any sort of a, 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 a retraction to the normal brain. So for that, it's often helpful to take the bony bar off. This is a unifrontal approach on the uh, right side, left right side. You can see the orbital rim is taken off, which gives you a very low approach. And then once you finish the operation, you can put it back very nicely and fix it. And you can see how the brain is swollen because if you try to do a, um, a, a standard approach, you're going to retract the brain too much. That's going to cause a lot of brain swelling. So these are some of the things which you need to think about even before attempting. So I, I'm going to conclude here. So essentially keep all these principles of meningioma in mind, the detachment and dissection in majority of meningiomas, uh, detachment, devascularization and debulking and dissection. Always try to preserve the vein because they are so important to drain the congestive brain. And always try to use your gravity for advantage so that you can you retract a fixed retraction or a manual retraction. Um, and always think back in time, see whether the, where the tumor started and how it would have displaced the cisterns and vessels and structures around it. A tumor around the CP angle cistern, if it is behind the uh, seventh and eighth nerve complex, it would have displace the seventh and eighth co nerve complex much more forward. So that's operation much more simple. If it is in front of it, it would have pushed it backwards. So that makes it more complex. But if it's above the IAM, that means that everything is pushed down or front. So that means surgery is much more simple. So approach makes all the difference. Um, so that is why I wanted to uh, talk here in terms of strategizing this operation and think more before you actually operate. Thanks very much. Yeah, Igor, I think you're muted. Ramesh, yeah. thank you very much. It was thank a great, great educational uh, and uh, in a way uh, lecture which uh, gives the important point about uh, planning and about uh, the approaches. And anyone would like to ask something? Igor, I think is... is uh... Igor, Igor? Yes, uh, thank you, Ramesh. Your lecture was uh, you know, amazing. I think it's extremely informative, extremely useful. My, my question is uh, uh, on uh, medial sphenoidal meningiomas, when they are large and you have perforators that may be inside or maybe just around, and, and also the uh, anterior choroidal artery, which is very fragile. Sometimes you preserve it, you see everything is okay, but the fact of you know, dissecting it sometimes isn't enough to have some ischemia. So I would like you to comment on that, if you don't mind, what are your strategies? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Igor. I think it's a very good question. This is one of the, uh, especially for a beginner, medial spinal men meningiomas are a concern because it, you have a very, uh, uh, you know, it's a, the stakes are very high because of the location. But you have to, we have to specify the medial spinal wing meningiomas are different to the clinal wing meningioma, which are slightly more different. Medial spinal wing meningiomas always carry an arachnoid uh, sheath, and it used to tend to displace all these vascular structures medially. But when you have a clinal meningioma of a particular type, then it tends to um, have no arachnoid covering where there is direct involvement of the carotid artery and the anterior caudal artery and some of the perforators. And those are the meningiomas which come from the medial and lateral, um, the medial and inferior aspect, where they get involved the, uh, uh, um, the carotid artery before the arachnoid ensheathment. So these are quite tricky tumors. And personal um, view will, in such cases, to not to go and, and disrupt that area without uh, dissecting off the carotid artery and the anterior caudal artery and any of the perforators. So I wouldn't mind leaving a remnant in that location and then either observing it or, or gamma knifing it. But majority of the other clinoid meningiomas, including medial phenol meningiomas, are, as you, as you, if you follow the principle where they started, once you get to the base and devascularize it, then it's all a matter of making it smaller and smaller with time, dissection and debulking and dissection debulking. So then it becomes a much simpler operation. Uh, Ramesh, uh... I have a feeling that the, the very beginning of intradural part of the carotid artery is not covered by the arachnoid. There are like two or three millimeters, which is bare. And as soon as the meningioma is outside, it becomes more aggressive. So in my mind, this is the most dangerous place where you can injure Absolutely. the carotid. I totally agree. I think this all depends on the variation in the arachnoid dipping down in the carotid cave. There are some cases where there is a good arachnoid cave uh, and tumors arising in the clinoid will always have arachnoid. But when you have uh, uh, arachnoid, uh, uh, when you have a carotid cave is shallow without any 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 uh, arachnoid going into it, meningiomas coming from the clinoid will get definitely get uh, encased in the advantage of the carotid. Right. What, what, what is the difference in your mind between the medial clin uh, sphenoid ridge and anterior clinoid meningiomas? I think right? I think the, when you, when you generally classify sphenoid meningiomas. Um, and you can classify in the, the outer and middle and the, um, the, the medial third. But often the clinoid meningiomas can be a separate category to all this. Even though you, in, in principle, you can categorize the clinoid wing meningiomas into the medial sphenoid wing meningiomas, but the clinoid wing meningiomas are a different category where you can decide the, the type of clinoid wing. There are few classification from, from LMFT and Ladigam Shagaran, which describe where, at which point the tumor originated. And, and for meningioma operation, it makes all the difference when you know where it started from. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So let, let's, let's go forward and- uh, I think, I think uh, Giovanni, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether Vladimir, Giovanni was uh, trying to say something. Uh, thank uh, you for this. For oh, your, hello, Giovanni. Uh, thank you for your very, very short. You, you, you say that the, the most important first step or second step during the surgery of meningioma is the venous drainage. Uh, indeed, you did mention uh, ICG analysis. Of course, that is not available for everybody, but they want that they have. What is your opinion? So ICG uh, for meningioma surgery, to be honest, I don't use it for a meningioma surgery, but I can see- For the vein. For the vein. For the? For the vein, to see the yeah, drainage yeah. of the vein. Yeah, I totally agree. I can see the value in do using ICG, but so far I haven't used ICG um, to, to determine the venous drainage uh, in the beginning of a meningioma surgery. But I use it all the time for AVMs and uh, aneurysms. But I, I am it to use ICG for meningioma surgery. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, oh, let's go forward. Sorry, Giovanni, I didn't see you on a, on a screen that, that, that you want to say something. So, so excuse me, please. Uh, so let's go forward to Matthias Bandoncine, who's going to talk on orbitomeningeal band anatomy and especially surgical applications. Matthias, ready? You probably are muted. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, everything's all right. You can go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much, Imad Vladimir, for 
for your invitation. It's a huge pleasure to me to be part of this amazing community of uh, International Academy of Neurosurgical Anatomy. And uh, it's a huge honor to me to be present in this webinar, honoring uh, to Professor Keki Turel. The topic that I selected for this um, for for this lecture is uh, the orbitomeringeal band, the anatomy and surgical applications. And um, I decided to select this topic because it's a known well uh, known structure of, of, of the skull base, uh, at least for, for the young uh, neurosurgeons. And we are focused to try to, um, to give uh, some new knowledge uh, to, to the new generations. There are uh, many, many beautiful um, uh, publications about uh, the orbital meningeal band. Um, and the, the first or one of, of the first publication that I have read about uh, the orbital meningeal band is um, the publication that uh, Ip Eckhart uh, and some colleagues uh, publicated some years ago. And uh, aimed, aimed with this uh, publication, we publish uh, two, two papers, one in, in operative neurosurgery, it's a 3D surgical video that you can access uh, free in, in this journal. And uh, this is another publication that we um, publicated two, two, years, uh, two years ago with our research group uh, um, in Journal of Clinical Neuroscience. And, What's, why is it important to, to know where is located the orbital meningeal band? The orbital meningeal band is useful to dissect, especially if we need to do an extradural anterior clinoidectomy, if we need to access to, the, to dissect the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, for example, in trigeminal uh, schwannomas, and if we need to perform an anterior petrosectomy. In these three procedures, it's really important to know where is located the orbital meningeal band. Um, as uh, Igor told us, the, the, su the superior orbital fissure um, is located behind of the anterior clinoid clean process. And uh, 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 this is the, 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 the left lateral view of the cavernous sinus, of course. This is the anterior clinoid process, the optic nerve and the carotid artery. Uh, if we need to access to the anterior clinoid process extradurally, if we need to dissect the, um, the external dural layer of the cavernous sinus or to perform an anterior petrosectomy, it's important to cut the orbital meningeal band to coagulate the, the, um, the, the, the two layers of the orbital meningeal bind and to cut the orbital meningeal bind in order to gain access medially to the anterior process, to the cavernous sinus, or to perform an, uh, an anterior petrosectomy. It's important to remember that the, the neurovascular elements located in the, um, um, uh, on the superior orbital fissure, as uh, Igor told us in in his beautiful lecture, are located medially to the orbit of meningeal band. And this is very important to remember, especially because if we are dissecting medially, um, when we perform our frontotemporal craniotomies, for example, minitarional, terional, cranio orbital zygomatic, or transzygomatic approach, or pretemporal approach, uh, frequently we stop the, uh, the dissection tradurally in that point, and, and we Try, we tend to not continue dissecting medially. But it's important to remember that in this superior orbital fissure, we have two, uh, two lateral borders, the superior lateral border, the inferior lateral border. And this is the place where the dura mater of the, uh, of the anterior cranial base and the medial cranial base are attached with the periosteum. And this is the place where we will find the orbital meningeal band. And um, medially, in, in green and in red represented, we have the medial superior border and the um, uh, medial inferior border. And this is, this is the place that we need to take care and sometimes when we are dissecting can appear a, a small bleeding of the venous that uh, enters to the, uh, to the orbital cavity from the cavernous sinus. And this is the place where we will start to dissect 
the external dural layer of the cavernous sinus if we need to, to gain access to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. But if we cross a line between these uh, uh, lateral and medial uh, structures, we need to remember that the orbitomeningeal band we will find in this place. And frequently, we will find an artery that emerges from the orbit to the, um, um, to the dura mater uh, of the medial um, cranial base that the name is the orbitomeningeal artery. In, uh, and if we need to cut the orbitomeningeal band, it's important to coagulate this, uh, this artery. This is a beautiful drawing from the Ip Therian uh, paper, and it's really interesting. This is a, um, a coronal section and, the, and, and a beautiful draw of the superior orbital fissure. And it's here it's represented the, the cranial nerves that enters from the cavernous sinus to the uh, to the to the orbit, and it's important to remember that the medial segment of the um, of the um, superior orbital fissure it's a neurovascular um, compartment, but the lateral segment have not element or at least not important element. Only we will find the uh, orbitomeningeal artery, and this is the part that we can gain access in order to perform a, an excellent anterior clinodectomy or to dissect the external dural layer of the cavernous sinus. And um, as uh, with uh, IMAD um, and, and Vladimir and all our, our team try to, uh, to go first from the laboratory and then to our patient. This is a classical inc skin incision for, to perform a terional approach. And um, after to perform the, the terrenal approach, it's important to uh, remove the bone of the, of the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And after that, we will find this dural stop. This is, this is the dura that is attached to the periosteum. And there we will find the orbitomeningeal band. If we need to gain access to the anterior cranial process or to dissect the cavernous sinus or to perform an anterior petrosectomy, it's important to coagulate this dura to localize the orbitomeningeal um, artery and to cut it in order to go more medially uh, to our dissection. Here we can observe the artery that is important to coagulate and uh, to gain access medially. There, after, here we can observe after to coagulate this, this artery and to cut the orbital meningeal band. And this is the medial part of the orbital fissure that is intact uh, with, without any uh, uh, neural transgression. And this is the uh, lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. This is the dura propria of the cavernous sinus and the external dura layer, the anterior clinal process totally exposed in our dissection. This is a, a sagittal section of a beautiful skull base uh, the, when, where we can observe the lateral uh, portion of the uh, orbital fissure where we will find the orbital meningeal band. And this is the medial portion where we will find the, uh, the neural elements that we, we need to avoid, of course. Here is a beautiful, uh, not, uh, not high quality video, but uh, it's interesting to, to demonstrate. This is a left, a right, sorry, a right trional approach. This is the orbital meningeal band that we can observe that the orbital meningeal band, it's um, like a dural stop uh, that it's difficult to access to dissect the whole uh, lateral wall of the carbon sinus if we not coagulate and cut this structure and to access to the anterior clinoid uh, process. Here is the, the medial part of the orbital fissure, and this is the anterior clinoid process, uh, to, totally dissected, but it's important to coagulate this artery and to cut the artery here, we can observe the orbitomeningeal artery. It's important to coagulate this artery because uh, if we do not this, uh, this step, the artery can bleed and can cause an intraorbital bleeding that is really a, 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 an important complication. This is the anterior clinal process totally exposed after to cut the meningo orbital band and the orbit, the medial orbital fissure is located medially without any uh, anatomical transgression. This is our, uh, this is some of the um, 
photos of our uh, of our paper with a step by step for exposing the arteriolinal process and for expose the lateral wall of the uh, of the cavernous uh, sinus and uh, this is a, a photo of a terio right terional approach after uh, uh, sorry, uh, prior to cut the orbitomeningeal band and after to cut the orbitomeningeal band, exposed the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus and totally exposed the anterior clinoid uh, process. This is a simple, some simple uh, examples. I will show you an anterior clinoid meningioma. We prefer to, um, to perform uh, the anterior clinoidectomy extradurally only for tumors, especially for uh, meningiomas. And for vascular surgery, we prefer to do um, the anterior uh, clinoidectomy intradurally. And in these cases, it's not so important to coagulate and cut the orbital meningeal band if we perform the anterior clinoidectomy intradurally. Um, one of the major um, advantage to uh, perform the anterior clinoidectomy extradurally in clinoidal meningiomas is the possibility to gain access to the anterior clinoid process, to remove the anterior clinoid process, and to coagulate the basis of the uh, tumor uh, in order to devascularize the tumor prior to gain access intradurally. This is some of the, uh, of the pictures. This is a left terional approach. This is the orbitomeningeal band. We coagulate the orbitomeningeal band. After that, we cut the orbitomeningeal band. This is the anterior clinal process, totally exposed. And there we are performing the standard <coughs> intradural, extradural, sorry, anterior clinoidectomy. <clears throat> this is another case. Uh, this is an uh, uh, extradural anterior cl clinoidectomy for a um, bilateral clinoidal meningiomas. This is a um, surgical, interesting surgical case that had been publicated in 3D in operative neurosurgery that the, where you can observe the whole video. And uh, as you can watch, here is coagulated the orbitomeningeal band, and this is the uh, an important surgical step to gain access to the more medial part of the dura and to expose the anterior uh, clinoid process. This is another interesting case. This is a dumbbell shaped trigeminal schwannoma. This is the pre and post operative uh, MRI scans. And uh, this is an interesting case to highlight the importance of the. Um, uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, knowledge of the mening orbital band. This is a, a left terional standard uh, craniotomy. After to expose the dura, this is the mening orbital band that is coagulated, and then with an eleven scalpel, the mening orbital band is cut. It, we can observe some bleeding, and we are in the medial part of the orbital fissure and we try to uh, preserve the uh, external the, the internal dural uh, layer of the cavernous sinus or lamina propria of the cavernous sinus in order to um, expose the uh, the trigemin this trigeminal genoma but this maneuver can't be um, uh, perform uh, in in a, in, a, in a proper way if we not cut and coagulate and cut the mening orbital band in order to gain access more medially in these complex uh, cases. And then finally, why anatomy? As I told you in several cases, because what the mind does know, the eyes doesn't see. Thank you very much for your for your attention. Talk, uh, Matthias. Very good talk. Uh, you have uh, very clearly shown the orbital meningeal band anatomy and the uh, importance of it in anterolateral skull base approaches. So, probably can cut my talk into half. I can focus on something else. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you. Thank you very, very much, Ip. Uh, we, uh, your paper was our, um, our inspiration to study this region. The first time that I 
read uh, about the orbital meridian band as I asked for myself when I was a res young resident, what, what is the orbital meridian band? What is located? What structures uh, have the orbital meridian band inside of this space? And um, your paper clarified uh, a lot our vision and our, um, our, our papers uh, publicated about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is the IPES topic. Uh, I thank you for introducing all of us to, uh, to the band because I, I believe that this is the basics of all the approaches to the cell region, both for ophthalmic aneurysms, anterior glenoid meningiomas. You always start with cutting the band and uh, resecting the anterior glenoid. So this really is the most excellent material. This is really basic, basic neurosurgery and the most useful step in all these surgeries. So is there any, any other question from the floor? Uh, well, one thing I just wanted to comment here is the your technique, Matthias, the, you know, going down to the, the base, uh, towards the temporal uh, uh, base, and then coming back up, which I think is a nice way of, uh, get, before you actually divide the meningeal band, then clear up the area and then get to the, uh, expose the anterior clinal process. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Matthias, I always find the, uh, easier to dissect the wall of the cavernous sinus, little more lateral to the band, not directly at the band region, if I cut it, but a little more on the temporal side. Yeah. The, 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 the... No, no, Vladimir. sometimes it's, it's uh, quite difficult to separate the external durer layer and the lamina propria of the cavernous sinus. It depends of the, uh, of the two more uh, located in uh, in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. In this example, I selected this, this case because it was not so complex and was clear in order to explain the case. But uh, sometimes not so easy. The, um, I, but I think that with um, uh, with the dissector, uh, it's important to go uh, slowly and slowly. And in those cases, uh, we prefer to use an external lumbar drainage uh, in order to, um, with a good anesthetic, of course, but an external lumbar drainage in order to uh, empty the cisterns prior uh, to open the, the dura mater. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Excellent point, there, Vlad. Uh, one of the things that can really help is to drill the lateral margin of the superior orbital fissure. So once you drill the lateral margin of the superior orbital fissure from top to bottom, you can see a beautiful differentiation and then you can start following that plane and then you can pull the temporal lobe away from the cavernous sinus very right. easily. Right. If you don't do that, then you have to go to V2 and then maybe do a sharp dissection and come back to the back, as you said. But uh, yeah. if you can drill the lateral border of the superior orbital fissure, this becomes uh, rather easy. Yeah. And the lumbar drain, as Matthias said, that's, as I always said, it is the best invention in neurosurgery. Igor? Igor, you want uh, Just a short comment, and maybe Matthias can comment also after, after this. Uh, uh, we we're just discussing with Ramesh about the big meningiomas, uh, sphenoidal and major ones, so lumbar, the lumbar drain also may be a... Uh, an answer for that because when you're getting to the clinoid and then you have the tumor is push pushing and you cannot push the dura as easily as we saw in your dissection because I have a lot of tumor there. So lumbar drain may be a, may be a pathway of trying to solve this or would you have any other tricks? For example, going for intradura and then coming back for extradura again. What are your thoughts? Ramesh? We uh, yeah. Or or sure. yeah, yeah. Well, personally, I have to be a bit controversial as opposed to Vladimir and others supporting the lumbar drain. I try not to use lumbar drain as much if I can, because I think the CSF um, is there for a reason to protect the brain, especially for subtemporal approach or for phenotypic meningiomas when you want to retire the temporal lobe. Um, I feel that CSF is like a bubble wrap for the brain, so I, I try not to use. So maybe you know, it's totally just me and, and not for somebody else. But uh, I, I, um, I agree with uh, Igor that when you have a large tumor filling the temporal fossa, if you really want to um, uh, retract it, it's going to be really difficult without uh, getting some, uh, some relaxation. So it is a very selective use in my practice. 
Yeah. Yes. In, uh, you don't have to often do a lumbar drain. If you are taking the anterior clinoid, you are right into the system. So you just open above the optic, you will get so much CSF out. So uh, it is not even in a tight brain. If you if you have removed the clinoid process, you cut at the post. I mean, you just extend your position. I mean, extend your orbitomeningeal band cut and just open a little bit of dura and you will get a lot of CSF. So you can get the brain uh, quite lax so even without uh, the lumbar drain uh, in these kind of cases where you are going to this uh, step. Yeah. In the uh, inner third of a sphenoid wing, if you get to the orbitomeningeal band and to the base of the clinoid, you actually are on the, at the origin of the tumor. So what I do here, I open the dura and I decompress the tumor with excusa or whatever means, and then uh, you are home free. Okay. All right. Anyone else? So Ramesh, yeah. the moderation is yours. Thanks, thanks, uh, Vladimir. Thank you very much. And actually, the next speaker, I have to say, somebody um, he's at least like my brother of a different mother. I have to say. He, he, I met him, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we trained in the same place in Kerala and uh, we speak the same language. But um, he, even though I called him as a brother, he's a slightly uh, different level. I cannot stop talking about him to my friends or some from others because he has this magnetic personality, very daring in, in neurosurgery and outside neurosurgery. He craves adrenaline in neurosurgery and outside neurosurgery. And uh, I, I sometimes, and I remember that uh, in Mombasa, we were uh, in that uh, speedboat and uh, you were uh, uh, driving that thing in, like a madman and uh, I was clutching onto my dear life. Anyway, so I, um, it's, it's my great pleasure, even though we've been into many meetings all these years, I never had the, the honor to introduce you, Ip here. So I would like to ask Ip to start this uh, lecture now. Thanks, Ip. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Ramesh. Uh, I mean, the admiration is definitely mutual. So let me share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, fine. I think you can make it uh, like a full yeah. screen. Oh. Uh, yes, can you see? I'm I very see. glad to yep. see all of my good friends. Uh, I was uh, remembering when I see each of you, I was remembering the times that I had spent. This COVID uh, definitely has put a, a little bit of a stop to it. But uh, in July, again, I'm in Europe and I hope to visit uh, many of you. I hope uh, at least uh, I, I will catch up with Vlad for some table tennis and of course some uh, adrenaline as uh, uh, Ramesh was telling. So the anterolateral skull base anatomy, I'm sure you would have been thoroughly bored because I have spoken uh, about these uh, approaches and uh, about this many, many times, but uh, I will just start this off uh, and then we will go to a case with, and that's why I put endoscopy as well. So for me, the anterolateral skull base approaches are centered around the carotid. So the extradural carotid is the basis of every anterolateral skull base approach. That is the center and from there we construct. And again, it's very simple for me because there is only three vertical lines and three horizontal lines. The three vertical lines are named odd numbers, named in odd numbers. So you have C3, you have C5, you have C7, then you have C6, then you have C4 and C2. Now the C3, the odd numbers, the vertical carotids are paraclinoid or paracellar that you can see it here. And then you have the paraclival and then you have the parapharyngeal. So C7 and C6, they are interconnected by the petrocell, C6. And then you have C4 intracavernous and then of course C2 intradural. So you can see the same thing here. You can see how the C5 paraclival, then you have the C4 uh, and then the C3 paracellar and C2 intradural, of course. This is the clinoid segment. This is the clinoid triangle. 
so then if you add some bones to it, you have the anterior clinoid process here. We're talking about meningiomas of the anterior clinoid and all that. This is anterior clinoid process here. Once we split the meningeo-orbital band, of course, you can take out this and then you must remember that the strut is always anterior to the C3, C2 junction. The strut is always, this is something that is very, very important. The strut is anterior. So that is ACP and the strut is anterior to the C2, C3. And then you have the clivus and then you have the PCP. You can see the PCP here. And uh, below that, you have the C4, C5 junction, and then you have a small vessel, which is the meningohypophyseal trunk, dividing into the inferior hypophyseal and the artery of uh, Cassinari and Bernasconi. Then you can put multiple, uh, multiple things around it. You have the petrolingual ligament here. Then now you have the cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve V1 going into the superior orbital fissure. You have the V2, you have V3, you have the GSPN parallel to the, uh, the C6 petrous segment. And while the petrous segment turns at the lacerial part, the petrous segment turns to paraclival, the VDN nerve doesn't turn. So it's a good marker of the, in endoscopic approaches, it's a very good marker for the lacerial segment. So you can see how the GSPN goes and uh, comes anteriorly. So, uh, so you, you are putting all those things. Now you have the distal dural ring here, the proximal dural ring, which is actually the roof of the cavernous sinus. And then you have the cochlea. Uh, the parapharyngeal carotid is actually, you know, it is, it is actually anterior to the cochlea. Then you have the eustachian tube here. So you put all these together you have the entire skull base in a schematic manner first. And after that, you can get, uh, you know, you can get very easily like Chris diagrams that uh, uh, Igor was showing us. So it is first you get the idea in a schematic or a cartoon. And then, you know, after that, you get to know how actually these, uh, these things are. So uh, here I want to show uh, lateral picture. So this is the C6 carotid. This is the C5 carotid. This is the C4 carotid, C3 carotid, C2. So you can see the C2. These are even numbers. They are horizontal. So everything starts from that concept. Okay. So around that, we can build all this. Now, if you go back to the endoscopic view, so you have, that is obviously the C5, that is a paraclival carotid. Now you have C4 there, okay? C4, so the meningohypophyseal trunk is there, okay? And then you have C3. C3 and C2 is like a boxer's glove. It is like a guy who's standing like that. Okay, you remember this, it's like a boxer's glove. So, you always, should, this is very important in endoscopy because you think that this artery is going straight up here. No, it's not. It's like a boxer's glove. It's up turn, out turn, block boxer's glove, like that, okay? This is how this, this is all, always, I remember in endoscopic approaches like that. So um, you have the sixth nerve here. You have the sixth nerve here. You have the basilar like that. You have the vertebrals here. You have the perforators, all these perforators there. I put this picture up because we did a very crazy tumor uh, and I'm going to show this uh, in this uh, video, the show, show us, show, show you the videos. We had, a, we had a tumor which was inside the pons, which was inside literally the pons. So um, we had to go in between and all the vessels were anterior. And so we took off a little bit of the gulf art segment of the cavernous sinus. This is the posterior part of the cavernous sinus where uh, the inferior petrosal sinus, superior petrosal sinus and the posterior cavernous sinus joints. So we had to open a little bit there and then we took off the tumor between these perforators, between the pontine perforators and the sixth nerve. So we are going to show you that. Now the brain unlocking uh, in anterolateral skull base, uh, Matthias showed this beautifully and how the temporal lobe is taken off from the cavernous sinus. So these are the steps, the orbitomeningeal band, 
It has been shown. Uh, I don't think I should dwell on it. It has been uh, shown how you go all the way to the Petrus apex. You can go to the, all the way to the Petrus apex. These are our old dissections. And uh, for uh, uh, this is a very fast uh, uh, recap of what Matthias has shown. So that is the orbit, that is the orbitomeningeal band, that is the temporal lobe, that is the frontal lobe, and I am dissecting the temporal lobe away from just like uh, he has shown. I'm just showing how we dissect it off the uh, we dissect it off the uh, cavernous sinus. That is superior orbital fissure, lateral margin. So I was, as I was telling, if you drill off this superior orbital fissure, this much part of the superior orbital fissure, it makes it very easy to, for you to get this plane. It's very easy, okay? So this is one tip uh, I can uh, say that to make it make things easier for you to dissect this orbitomeningeal band and go pericavernous rather than transcavernous. Now, after that, the clinoid process, you see how beautifully it is defined. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, all this Matthias showed us. Uh, so I'm drilling the optic strut now. That is the extradural optic now. This is the frontal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. Okay, the temp I mean, and now I'm drilling the optic strut. You must remember the optic strut is always anterior to the carotid. So, uh, that is that is one thing you have to remember. In in cases of transitional aneurysms, it's very important to remove the optic strut, uh, and uh, only then you can put uh, the clips on these. After you open the distal and the proximal dural ring, you can put a clip on these transitional aneurysms. Now you are getting back, so you can see now the V1 and the and the fourth nerve there. That is a clinoidal triangle. That is the second nerve. That is a clinoidal uh, segment. That is a gazerian ganglion. So that is a Parkinson's triangle. I have opened the Parkinson's triangle. So that is the part that is V1. That is a fourth nerve. That is a V1. And that is a vertical paraclival segment of the carotid. And that is a sixth nerve. You can see the sixth nerve. Uh, of course, you can hook out the sixth nerve from medial to the, uh, to the V1. And that is the fourth nerve there. So that's a Parkinson's triangle. So many times in tumors, we, um, we go ahead sometimes in uh, dural AV fistulas involving the meningohypophysal trunk. We open this Parkinson's triangle. Um, so now we are going back behind the V3 and then going into the, the Petrus apex. Drilling the Petrus apex with all the extension, anterior extension of the Petrus apex episectomy is below the third V3, below the V3. So you can drill the V3 all the way into the foramen ovale and just move this up front and you can anterior extension, posterior extension is towards the IAM, medial extension, inferior extension is uh, beyond the in inferior petrosal sinus. You can close off the inferior petrosal sinus and you can go all the way to the jugular prominence. Lateral extension is to the carotid. So you can see that I have exposed the carotid already here and you can displace, uh, you can drill off the entire, uh, you can lay bare the carotid canal. And this way you can have a large extended uh, cavasse, which is very useful in uh, many petroclival tumors. I mean, that is all you need actually. A subtemporal approach with the extended covers uh, is all you need. So once you complete, then you will see cranial nerves from uh, all the way from second nerve, uh, third nerve, fifth nerve to the seventh eighth complex. So you will see now that is the seventh nerve. So that is the ICA. This is the fifth nerve, all the way to second to seventh is what you will see. So this is a uh, the anterolateral approach. This is what after orbitomeningeal band opening and transcavernous dissection. This is what you can achieve if you want to. I mean, of course, you don't want to expose all this data. This is the panoramic view get, you get. Um, just recap again. So that is a C3 again. This is a C5 and that's a cella. That's a clivus. So we are going to show you a tumor now. Ah, sorry. So 
This patient presented with uh, this patient uh, presented with uh, quadriparesis, multiple cranial nerve paresis, and she was uh, slowly going down. And then you see there is no change in the bone at all, and this tumor is completely uh, intradural. Ah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I should not play the video from. Yeah, so you can see now. You can see now, uh, you can see the dura, you can see the vessels here, the vessels are anterior. That's, uh, that is a basilar which is displaced completely to the, uh, to the left side, uh, to the right side. And you can see the tumor going in like that. So we decided to go, somebody had already gone in retrosigmoid and they couldn't even get a biopsy. So uh, we didn't want to follow the same route. We went in, so you can see the center here. Uh, you can see the clivus, nice, uh, that's a cella, the clivus, and uh, the vessels are anterior, right underneath the dura. And this is the tumor. So we... That is the tract, you can see, uh, good God. Yeah, so that's the tract. You can see the tracts are like this. So the brainstem is like a small bowl. So if you go in through retrosigmoid or any other approach, these tracts which are concentrated around this tumor can get hurt. So you don't want to do anything of that sort. You want to come into this bowl from this root. You don't want to come into this bowl from any other root, okay? So if you come here also, you will, you will come from retrosic, supracerebral or anything. You, this part is difficult. So you just see the tracks here, okay? So this uh, virtually rules out any other approaches. Uh, we, we thought about it. It is not pleasant to go 13.5 centimeter and then get into the brain stems through a small transclival opening. But uh, we, there was no other approach uh, as... Uh, I discussed with many people and now, so we are seeing now and uh, we are drilling off the transclival uh, region. That is the clival, clivus being exposed, the MOCRs, the carotids. Yeah, so now you can see the clivus, uh, the cella, the carotid prominences, the optic prominences. The sad part of it is we lost the recording here and somebody, some one of our fellows who was with us, he fortunately recorded the entire thing on his phone and that, that is the only recording we had. So we had to make this entire thing out of that. Uh, we were mad with the company guys who were there and we thought you, they are recording, but I'm sad, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, uh, you know, the only te this technical problem happened, but uh, we, I would have definitely loved to have this video, but uh, um, unfortunately or fortunately, this is what happened. So this is the, this is the window we got exactly like this. That is a verte vertebrals, that is a basilar's, that is a sixth now, and these perforators are here, and the tumor is here. This is the window we got. I will show you exactly uh, how we got it. So, yes. Yeah, so I am raising the dura here under very high zoom because uh, unless I raise the dura, the vertebrals are just underneath. You will see that is a vertebral and the basilar is here and the perforators are in this side. So this is the uh, dura of the clivus. So of course, as all of you who would have gone transclival would understand that uh, the basilar dura the, the clival dura is extremely vascular. It's uh, very, very vascular because there is the plexus there. 
So you cannot just cut it, it's uh, cra crazy. And plus we have already exposed the Gulf R segment here. So, and plus uh, to bipolar, you cannot put the bipolar uh, underneath the, uh, underneath and just cut it just like usual because we found that the sixth nerve and uh, the two vertebrals and the basilar were pushed uh, towards us. So it was not a very pleasant feeling. So we, we went ahead, raised the dura, and uh, we are bipolaring the dura after raising the dura. And you can see the two, uh, we have gone down, and then we can see the basilar onto, the, uh, onto this side, right side completely uh, displaced to the right side. So, yeah, you can see now the sixth nerve there, the two vertebrals uh, and the basilar is here and this is the tumor. And there are perforators here, one perforator, another perforator. You will see it in high magnification very soon. So that is a sixth nerve. That is the window through which I have to go. So we are taking out that, that is one perforator. That is one perforator. This is the basilar to my side. This is the sixth nerve there. So I am taking it between the sixth nerve basilar and the perforator. So I have cleared the top of the perforator. And then now I am going uh, between the two perforators. I'm going with my scope and uh, uh, taking out this tumor. This was possible because uh, we had some, uh, it is a, Yeah, so I should take my hand off and uh, <laughs> yeah, so you can see the six now there, the vertebrals there. Anybody who has done transclival will understand uh, how crazy and uh, uh, how narrow and sometimes how difficult is this corridor. And so we are taking out the tumor that is a perforator, that is a basilar perforator, brainstem perforator. This is the basilar here. So that is a sixth now. And another perforator is here. The vertebral is here. So we are we going ahead and taking out tumor till we can see normal tissue all around. So we went underneath the basilar also. That is a perforator. That's a basilar. That is a vertebral. It's a tumor. Uh, and all this, we tried and we tried to get as much clearance as uh, possible. Now you can see the post-op, you can see pre-op and post-op. Uh, uh, yes. You can see how much far we went. And you can see, uh, you can see now how much this tumor is almost uh, completely taken. We put the fat graft and uh, this is how we've taken. This is the, this, this was the basilar. So all this tumor, everything we cleared out. Uh, we, when we saw the normal brainstem, we stopped uh, at, we took some time, but we cleared out, cleared it out nicely. And uh, you might be interested in how the patient did. <laughs> so this is uh, the patient after the surgery, I mean, we did one not minute, uh, have it. Huh? One minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, um, also, we wanted to show you one of the things that really helped us during the surgery is this uh, endoscopic holding robot. And uh, it, it has, unlike the pneumatic holder, this has torquing motors, I mean, anti gravity motors that uh, allow you, once you press this, then you can hold the endoscope. And you see how we are holding the endoscope and uh, gives you completely, um, you know, without any uh, complete hands-free movement. Only thing is you cannot focus and zoom with this. Uh, otherwise it's a very easy, it's like a microscope. So uh, this is our ENT, uh, my ENT partner, Dr. Sajiv here, Dr. the ENT partner, uh, Dr. Vinod Felix. And, uh, uh, this is how we went ahead. Thank you very much. So I would uh, finish in time. 
This, of course, I'm sure everybody of you remembers. Uh, most of the guys in WFNS Hakuna Matata has visited this place. Now we also miss this place uh, because it's in Nepal. We just went one month back. We spent some beautiful, beautiful time there. So I hope we start traveling again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ait. Wonderful presentation. And uh, the deconstruction of the ICA was very clear and easy to remember for everyone. And the case was fantastic, I remember. But you didn't mention the, was it a pilocytic, did you say? Uh, see, uh, we thought it was a pilocytic. And then uh, we, uh, they said it's something of ganglioneuronal origin. Now, after Daniel, Daniel and Schroeder told, thought, thought it was probably an intradural cordoma, which is something very, very, very rare. So now we've asked for uh, all the markers of Kodama. They are saying the markers for Kodama are positive. So oh. mm. we don't know <laughs> because yeah. there is no change in the bone at all. The dura was completely yeah. intact. We have done quite a, uh, quite a few Kodamas and it is not like that at all. Completely different from a Kodama. Mm. It is completely inside the pons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Henry, Henry is here. Henry can talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello to everybody. Yeah, I was great surgery. As I told you, it doesn't matter what it is. But from the image, it looks more like in Cordoma. And I also had a case, a child, where you hardly see that the tumor came from the dura. It was a very small attachment. But the consistency in what you have shown now, the color, this speaks very much for Cordoma. That is what, what I would expect. But doesn't matter. It's great surgery. Well done. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, yeah, Kiki. Yeah, I think a very important point which I should mention is how we have evaluated the vascular structures prior to surgery. Very important to know where the basal artery, where the vertebral arteries are. And that will prepare you for prevention of damage to the vertebrobasilar complex because you are going right in the midline. So it's important to know from the preoperative MR angiography or any other angiography as to what the vascular was the vasculature like. And then Having understood that, what strategy would you have in case there is an injury? Do you have an endovascular guy to come and help you, supposing there is a there is a puncture or there is a damage to the basilar? So I think these points are also important. I mean that you have done a great job, undoubtedly. But we need to see how uh, you have taken steps to see that you can come out of a complication in case there should be one. Yeah, excellent point, uh, KK. We have an endovascular guy for sure. We have an uh, endovascular suite as well. Um, but then the thing is, you are a tightrope walker. You walk, your next step is uh, the next uh, part on the rope. You don't think about the abyss below, you know. So you just think about your next step, of course. But you must be ready, as you said. But uh, in my mind, uh, of course, I was not even thinking about any injury or, uh, or anything at all. Because if you think about the abyss, that is where you will land. And for me, for my, for me, I just uh, think about the next step, uh, which is the next uh, part on the rope. Ne I, my um, next step on the rope. Yeah, I, I, I found that the point. I have a different view. I, um, my feeling is that if you have a complication in mind, you think about it all the time that uh, um, you don't make it. Because I, for endoscopic operation, transclave operation, I think about IC injury all the time. So yes. I make sure that doesn't happen. So it's slightly yes. different. Yes. Yes, this is the central point is there. And I think you should also have shown how the basilar looks before, before you started the operation. Did you study the angiogram and did you follow the, follow the vessel? Because this basilar was pushed to one side. Yes, yes, but, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. But only thing I knew was when I, I am opening the dura, the basilar is right underneath. This, uh, the, all the vessels, perforators, everything is right underneath. This I knew for sure. Did you use a Doppler to know where it is? So that you're no, no, no. The... no, no. I, as soon as I opened, I saw the vertebral and then I followed the vertebral to the basilar and then I saw all the perforators. Once, uh, once I was clear and I was set, after all the hemostasis was achieved, then I started removing the tumor. Thank you. I think um, for the sake of time, we'll move on. I'll, uh, it's, very, uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kasadi uh, Kalanku, who's my great friend for many years now, uh, from Zimbabwe and also from Belgium. So, uh, Kasadi, all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a privilege, <clears throat> sorry, to have been invited to this uh, uh, IANA third webinar, honoring my good friend, best friend, Keki Turel. And uh, Keki, I was really, and I am privileged to have met you. And uh, I think it was an instant connection. And uh, uh, it was, it was, it is for me an honor to have you as a colleague, uh, as a friend, and uh, as a brother. And uh, I'm glad we created our group called Akuna Matata here in Harare, uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, I think uh, we still have to meet. There was this little COVID which uh, uh, slowed us, not to stop us. So I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll meet again and, uh, and discuss. I admire a lot of things from you, your generosity on all aspects. You are so fun, chronically young, intelligent, and uh, you have this spirituality and curious for everything. And there is no uh, area where you will say, ah, I don't want that. No, no, you, you are curious. You want just to learn a lot of things. So for that, you are really a role model for all of us and particularly for young people. So I'm uh, happy to talk about this parasitic meningioma and how to avoid complications. I know that uh, this is a very good topic and you love it. We, we all love that uh, uh, topic because you introduced that as a course and it was very good I mean, for young yeah, neurosurgeons and uh, for also grown up neurosurgeons. Um, for those who don't know what you are talking about, you know, uh, I'm here in Zimbabwe, uh, just close to, to South Africa. Um, so um, this is our medical school and the world and so on. Uh, we know this definition that it's a lesion with, uh, which fills the parasagittal angle and uh, without any brain tissue in between. And uh, between the tumor and the superior sagittal sinus, we know that, okay? Those pictures illustrate very well where the tumor is and why we call it that way. Um, it's constituted about 17 to 20% of intercranial meningiomas, and mostly they are found in the middle part of um, uh, the sinus. And it is a challenge, challenging lesion to remove. We'll talk about this challenge because that's where complication starts. And uh, more challenging when particularly the sagittal sinus is invaded. So uh, it's, it's very important to, to know that and uh, to prevent those uh, complications. I know uh, Keki likes, you know, aviation industry. And uh, you saw the pilots, they managed to fly us in all weathers because they know how to avoid complications. So <clears throat> there are a number of classifications. Uh, I like to talk about the classifications of Bonal and Brochi because they were my teachers. But I have also a very good friend of mine, Sendu, who also made the classification. The only difference, he added the type six uh, tumor on the classification. Very important when you're talking about complications to know the arterial supply of this tumor. The supply is coming mostly from the middle meningia artery, anterior cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery. It's very important to know that. And uh, it implies that it's very good to do anterior uh, <clears throat> arteriograms so that you see exactly where those arteries are. And equally important is the venous drainage. We know those tumors, they're drained for meningeal veins, cortica veins, middle cerebral vein, lateral sinus, and scalp veins. Very important to know that. That's before even you start the operation. Very important to know where is the enemy and where is the friend if you want to win the war. In, so in the pre-operative evaluation, the CT scan is important, the MRI is important because it gives you the location and the size of the lesion, which is very important. <clears throat> and geography, as I said, MRA, MRV, 
will show you the supply and the venous drainage of the sinus and also the permeability of the longitudinal sinus. You know, the tumor blush, that's a typical sign of the tumor, uh, but in low uh, sign. And uh, the experience I'm talking about, about these uh, patients doesn't been uh, uh, put to date because we have more patients who, whom we are going to, to, to add and then publish. Uh, so uh, as you can see, the number of patients we saw and uh, the, the usual details we, we, we like to see. And uh, most of the time they came because they had seizures or headache. Uh, those are the clinical signs, you know, we, we saw. Uh, then motor deficit, sensory, confusion, head swelling, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the reason why they came actually to see us is because they had a motor deficit, because they were confused, they had headaches, seizures, and swelling uh, of, the, of the head. I mean by swelling, a deformity on the head. Like in this patient, you can see on the head, he has this swelling and uh, you wanted to sort it out. And on the pre-operative investigations, all our patients, they had computer tomography, CT and geography, or MRI, MRV, and MRA. Cerebral angiography is very important, EEG a bit less, but those uh, investigations are very important and they prevent complications. We use the WHO uh, criteria, which uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, knows. And uh, most of our, our patients on the grade one, which is very good, but we had also grade two, three, four, and five. Okay. On the operative technique, it's very important to avoid complications. It's craniotomy over the tumor. It's good to cross the midline, at least that's what I do, so that you can manipulate better the tumor. I use the jiggly saw when I'm crossing the midline. I don't trust the uh, craniotome just to avoid to injure the longitudinal sinus. And I got the tumor from the center and then progressively I remove the tumor. So basically it's a removal of the tumor from the brain and not the brain from the tumor. This is very important because you avoid uh, edema of the brain and swelling of the brain after the operation, which can cause actually a uh, neurological deficit. Magnifying devices are really required. Can have a microscope, but I've done those operations also with just magnifying glasses. It's very important to calculate this, the calculation of the vessels close to the tumor, which is very important and to minimize also the blood loss. And I use the technique described by uh, Professor de Souza, the late uh, Professor de Souza, uh, by using hydrogen peroxide. It's very, very useful. It reduces really the bleeding. The four Ds, uh, we've already uh, spoke about it, is de-dress or detachment, uh, debulk, devascularize, and then dissect. And picture-wise, this is basically what's happening. You coagulate and progressively you go and remove the tumor by gutting it and then removing it from the brain, not the brain from the tumor, okay? Those are classical way of doing the craniotomy, but it's very important to do the craniotomy exactly where the tumor is because the craniotomy is not just on top of the tumor. That's also the beginning of complications. So, when the tube is anterior, middle, or posterior part of the sinus. This picture is very important. It shows that when we are opening the dura, sorry, when we are opening the dura, it's very important to make sure that you spare the veins. It's very important, it's key. This made a big change in the surgery of these uh, tumors. And uh, as you can see here, you have to spare the veins at only cost, okay? Even if you have to leave a bit of tumor, it's important to spare the veins. Because after all, there are good papers I'm sure I'm going to show at the end that they show that even when you remove completely the tumor, 
there is no guarantee that after 15 or 20 years, the tumor is going to reoccur. So it's better to leave a little tumor, but not to sacrifice the vein. You see here, the dissection of the vein has to be very, very accurate. Now, what about when the vein uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, when the vein is severed, okay? You can actually repair it, but these can work only with big veins. Don't try to repair small veins because then they coagulate, you know, they, 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 they get thrombosed and it's very difficult really to, to do that. But if they are big vein, one can try really to repair them. If you can do that, that's fantastic. You'll you avoid quite a number of uh, uh, complications. But the best thing, don't sever them, don't damage them. That's what I just said, you know, total tumor removal or venous integrity, always venous integrity. It's like French is, you know, are saying, you know, uh, ladies first, you know, uh, so that you look like a very gallant person. You see here, the tumor is exposed, removed, but the most important thing is that the veins are preserved. As you can see, the vein is preserved here and after the operation, it's very important. So uh, I'm not going to, into details about uh, the, the management when the, the sinus is in, invaded, but I'll talk a bit about that, okay? So anterior part, you can actually do the resection of the sinus without any problem. But when you go to the posterior, if there is a total occlusion, remember that it's like type five, we need to remember that if patient managed to come to, you, to your hospital alive, it means nature has created collaterals. That's why the patient is actually uh, still alive. If partial occlusion, if you have the capacity and you have the means, you can still remove the tumor and then repair the, the, the sinus. If you can't, leave the little tumor alone. Okay. It's always better to leave a bit of tumor than to sacrifice the vein. Those are uh, various stages on the, on the tumors, uh, the way to, to remove them. Those are classical, everybody uh, knows, uh, knows that. Um, before we used to do long operations where we would actually uh, go and repair the sinus. If it is like in this case, that's easy to do you remove the tumor, which is inside this, the sinus, the sinus, the sinus, you remove that, and then you close without any problem. That's very easy. Sometimes it can, it can get complex, like in, here in type, type three, then you have to go and repair, you know, the, the, the sinus. That is doable, okay? But uh, when you get to type four, type five, just check if patient has got good collateral veins. I think it's better just to leave it like that or to just remove that part of the, 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 the sinus with the tumor since they are good collaterals. I'll show you a nice picture. Type five, uh, we used to do that before and there were a lot of problems of thrombosis and things like that. But anyway, type five, we need to know that if patients manage to come to the hospital, he's got collaterals. Look this patient, for example, the sinus is, co is completely obstructed here, but you see the big collaterals. If you keep them, you are safe. You can remove the whole tumor and part of the, uh, and part of the, the sinus. So <clears throat> people have spoken about endovascular embolization to feeding cell vessels. So we don't do that. Uh, I think it's a bit complicated and uh, it can cause, I don't know if somebody has got uh, experience on that. We don't do it because we saw a lot of complications. Good to cauterize very well the feeding vessels. As I told you, we use hydrogen peroxide to uh, stop the bleeding. And this has been published and it's very good, I mean, to read this paper. And uh, if the hemorrhage is out of control, it's better to remove the tumor in two stages. It's better to stop and remove the rest of the tumor in another stage. We have a small rule. The surgeon should, should actually control together with the anesthetist because the counting of swabs is not very reliable. So we rely on the pulse. If the pulse at one stage 
uh, goes beyond 20% of the initial rate, it's better to do the mustaches, wait until uh, an anesthetist has given enough fluid so that the pulse comes back to the initial. Uh, by doing that, we avoid the complications due to bleeding. It's very important. Uh, don't wait until there is drop of pressure and things like that. You are already in trouble. It's better to stop and do it next time. Those are the complications we had. Mortality, one due to hemorrhage. Um, so young colleague who was operating, but I take the blame. I'm, I'm the one who is responsible of, uh, uh, so that, uh, and the, another one is because of the brain swelling, brain swelling because of the edema you see already before you start the operation. It's very important not to manipulate too much the brain because you are going to make it worse. And another patient died because of seizure. So that's also something which needs to be prevented because when they get the seizures, they might go into, um, into um, state epilepticus. Then you have small mobilities that subgaya fluid and uh, the brain swelling, you need to treat it very, very aggressively. Steroid, manitol, and duroplasty so that there is room. And if you don't, if you see that the brain is not going down, don't put the bone, just keep the bone out, save it, and then put it later. So the complications of summary is, first of all, craniotomy must, do, must be done on the right side. You need to spare the cortical veins at any cost. It's very important to control the bleeding. It's very important to control the post-operative edema, to prevent seizures. That's very important as well because that can kill patients. And of course, to prevent deep vein thrombosis. We, didn't, we never had a problem on that side, but it's very good to remember because in the literature, I found that that also was a very important note. Okay. And uh, usually the lesson we learned that worsening of neuro neurological uh, is transient if, if brain is removed from the tumor. It means we manipulate too much the brain. Then you get these worsening of neurological, initial neurological uh, findings. And of course, all malignant meningiomas recurred within 16 months. And uh, we know a total removal of Simpson 1 is total cure for, for, for a certain number of years. You cannot guarantee that after 15 or 20 years, we won't have a mean recurrence. I repeat again, venous drainage must be respected at any cost, blood loss, brain swelling, and that is important. And to avoid the recurrence, of course, is always good to go for a Simpson grade one. And also it's very important to prevent seizures. It's very important because, okay. Those are papers which, was, which were written. They are old, but very important paper to remember that uh, when people look at the long-term 25 years, they saw quite a number of actually people who had recurrences. It's very important uh, to know that. That's why if you leave a bit of a, a tumor, just relax because even if you remove all the tumor, the important thing is to save all important veins and so on. This is another paper, which is also talking about vein preservation. It was a, a big breakthrough by knowing that because it has made really this, op this operation much more uh, easier and much more safer. So in conclusion, as I told you, having good investigations, MRI, CT scan, MRI uh, to see the vessels and then MRV, it's very, very important. It helps to plan the operation, okay? Um, when the wall of the sinus is involved, okay, you, you have to weigh the, how can I put it, the benefit of going to remove the whole tumor. Um, if you can do it, that's fine. Otherwise, just leave that little bit of tumor and then you save the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, because uh, that is a great talk. Uh, very valuable lessons for parasagittal meningioma, such a common uh, tumor. Um, but um, thank you for that uh, um, great talk. 
many um I remember walking with the lions in Swange uh, it was amazing <laughs> all of us remember you remember that was a complication eh? <laughs> okay um any so I, I think it's one of the more difficult operations in meningioma surgery parasitic meningiomas it should never be underestimated because recurrence rate is very high however uh, even mark sindhu who has championed the idea of repairing the sinus has found that uh, the morbidity of sinus repair is quite considerable yes. uh, and uh, and therefore today i think the philosophy uh, i have written a lot on this subject and the philosophy is to leave us sliver of tumor with the sinus if it, if it is dangerous to remove it and and then subject it to radiation or gamma knife the second point i want to make is do not underestimate <clears throat> of course as you go posterior in the sinus uh, your complications tend to increase because more and more veins are draining into the posterior part of the sinus but at the same time anterior third of the sinus which is considered to be benign and can be sacrificed should not be underestimated it is sometimes you have had tragedy even when you have uh, uh, sacrificed the anterior part of the sinus anterior third of the sinus so as far as possible do not sacrifice any venous outflow whether it's a cortical vein or it's the anterior third of the sinus and uh, it's better sometimes uh, to leave tumor behind than to do these heroic repairs uh, in as much as we may want to do it it's not the results are not the same uniformly the same they look very good on pictures yeah i yeah. agree uh, kk i think uh, that that some sit up um, even when you know that it may be completely occluded you may find that there may be still some venous channels which may be still persisting and which you don't recognize on the mrv the other thing is you might make a decision to take out the sinus depending on various factors including patient's age and and your own age as well sometimes because you don't want to <laughs> come back in your uh, but i think the the thing is with the a uh, completely occluded sinus you may find that you may still leave tumor behind because towards the uh, end right. either edges of those uh, occluded segment you will find that there will be collateral circulation so the more you try to be more aggressive will be damaging the collaterals so yes. that's why i think even though you may try to do a complete resection it may not be complete because you will still have tumor anyway th- uh, with that i will stop this um, uh, third session uh, first session and uh, hand over uh, the um, moderation to prof imad khan um, uh, ima yes thanks uh, ramesh it was a wonderful session a lot of nice talks uh, presentations uh, updated presentations oh, wonderful i might have two points on this uh, first sessions as an educational values for young trainees Number one, I think uh, Ramesh, you summarized it all for meningioma, frontal basal meningioma, uh, following the principle of. Uh, yeah, I'm also going. Yeah. Following the respect of the arachnoid, and now by frontal approach for meningioma, I abandoned this long time ago, and I've seen that images at the beginning. Uh, there was no microscope introduced. People think. in the past a huge tumor you don't need the microscope they always say we don't need the microscope we'll take it out uh, the like i call it the digital surgery with our finger and dissect it this is not any more in practice and you see damaging of both frontal lobe is uh, carrying a more morbidity than the tumor itself and uh, having a bifrontal approach for a benign lesion you are damaging two frontal lobe you open sinus you are ligating the uh, Uh, venous sinuses, you add to the morbidity of these patients. And I think a unilateral approach in general, if you follow the principle as uh, Ramesh mentioned, it's a fantastic outcome and uh, with a fast recovery. Now, the other things, the value of having like a frontoorbit or lateral approach, you will see the vital structure you are concerned about, which is the optic chaos, optic nerves, and the vascular tree early in your procedure because you are there when you go along the spinal wing and you resected the wing so you have this vital structure protected rather than you work on the dome of the tumor you didn't vascularize it from the base to start losing blood unnecessarily where the principal de vascularize and decompress and this is where the microscope is important 
once you decompress with a segmental from below up or centrally, then the arachnoid layer can be dissected. As long as you have a big mass compressing the arachnoid two layers together, you won't be able to release this uh, arachnoidly or with the Professor Sammy's technique to uh, forceps or whatever technique you would like. But as long as you have a big mass, it won't dissect nicely from the brain and you will damage the arachnoid and this is where uh, morbidity occurs. So it's always nice to decompress after devascularize, it gives you ample of space to dissect the arachnoid nicely. I think uh, I finished with these two comments. I want to be just share it with the young uh, neurosurgeons around the world. So they won't think that meningioma does not need microscope. So whenever you have the facilities, use it. I might not use it from the beginning, but I always, uh, like Professor Yasevji said, put the scope in because you get your eyes acquainted with micro dissection. And surgery without micro surgical dissection carries morbidity. And we know it for many years in the conventional neurosurgery. Now, uh, Professor uh, Subeh got stuck. He's doing the CP angle tumor. He requested if he can be toward the end of the schedule and we'll see how it, the time goes. But I think we'll proceed with the second session. Uh, Professor Abuzer from Turkey, he is going to talk about, I don't know whether the, uh, the title is correct, the pseudo semi-sitting positions for posterior posture. Professor Abuzer. Yes. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. It is an honor uh, to be here uh, with you. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, today I will talk uh, about the supercellular approach in our position, uh, pseudo sitting position. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, the presentation include a photograph from Roton collection and our articles and uh, my videos, uh, surgical videos. Uh, when you say a uh, super cerebellar approach, uh, we mean uh, its valuation and uh, for, for example, medium, paramedium lateral and ex extreme lateral and also trans uh, transtural option. Uh, you know, to the uh, pineal gland, it is a long way, even it is a uh, supratentorial or uh, infratentorial. With supracerebellar approach, you can reach pineal gland, superocollical, inferocollical, troclinear, and midbrain. And also, uh, under the superocollical, it is better uh, to use a lateral uh, trajectory. Also, you can reach uh, thalamus and the uh, vascular structures like uh, uh, branch of posterior uh, cerebellar artery and galenic venous systems. And opening the uh, tensorium, you can reach the uh, P2 brains and the mesial temporal area and the hippocampal gyrus. And what we see uh, through the, this approach. Uh, firstly, you can see the uh, breaching veins in my uh, operation. I always uh, preserve these breaching veins because you couldn't know what will happen. And also you can see uh, more uh, the breaching veins in deep area. And we are looking for the superior you can see bridge veins and the uh, venous lakes. And after opening, you can reach the quadriguminal system and the, uh, this galenic venous system, and you can see pineal glands and uh, magnify. And when you look from lateral, you can uh, have a better view of pineal glands. And after opening the uh, tantorum, you can reach the hippocampal uh, gyrus. And also you can use, you can, it can help the endoscopic view. And as you know, positioning in neurosurgery is crucial uh, step in neurosurgical pr procedures. 
and uh, the, it includes patient safe, safety, surgeon's com uh, comfort, and uh, it provides optimal trajectory. And I always uh, prefer to use gravity with avoiding retraction, and uh, it helps to drainage hematome and CSF. Uh, in supercerebral approach, I want to use semi sting or sting position, uh, but uh, because of the uh, my anesthesiology team, I couldn't uh, use this approach because because of this I described a, a different approach, pseudo sitting approach, which I uh, present in this presentation because I didn't have the trans or when as intercardiac echo or precardial doppler in my institution. Because of this, uh, I described this approach, what, what uh, advantage of uh, pseudo-sting position has. It has advantages of the uh, sting position with lesser risk of venous embolism due to changeable position during surgery, because uh, before the dual opening, you can use the lateral decubit and after uh, uh, opening pleura, you can use the lateral sitting position. And I will present this approach uh, by a video. This is the supper uh, drawing from the William. Uh, and this is the case, a brainstem carinoma. I used the contralateral approach, a uh, head tilt uh, approach with lateral decubit position. And also, when you uh, with the ankle, it's similar to, you can have a, a similar angle with the sitting position. And if there's a problem about when embolism, you can uh, decrease the angle and continue to do operation. This is the post-operative and post-operative view of this approach. Also, I, I will present a different case with using this approach. Uh, for two years old female uh, with brainstem carinoma, In these patients, uh, after tractography and MOS, I uh, selected the uh, lateral mesencephalic sulcus approach uh, with our position. I always use paramedian or uh, lateral uh, supercerebral approach. I always opening sternum magna before uh, opening the dura. After coming to me, uh, I am doing a, a parallel and, and dual incision parallel to transverse sinus. And if you uh, need more release, you can uh, put the drainage to the cystina magna. I always preserve uh, bridge veins. And as you see, without uh, needing uh, wet direction, you can see all structures. You can see the square polycool. And later, uh, I will describe lateral mesencephalic sulcus with our anatomy language and the navigation. And with a small incision, I could find the uh, carinoma, and this is in, in a standard carinoma surgery after this time, but you, you must be more gentle in these brainstem cases. and control all the uh, borders of the operation. This is the post-operative view. 
and post operative MR showing the uh, total removal of the cavernoma. You can see the antennas. And tractography. And also for final tumors, you can I, I always use this approach. And you need the same position. It's <laughs> similar like the let's say a bit of connection, but an upward field to be hot. And this is the pro-operative and post-operative view. This is a surgical video, another uh, final mess. The same steps I always follow, a anatomy and uh, releasing CSF from the Stena Magna. opening to a parallel to the transfer stimulus and the uh, opening attachments and the second all bridging veins. And directly uh, reach the final mess. and endoscopic control of the operative row. This is the post-operative view and post-operative MRI showing the uh, total removal of the lesion. And also I use, uh, for example, this kind of epidermoid tumors, uh, I use the combined approach with super cerebral lateral super cerebral approach and the sigmoid approach I used because uh, some tumors reach the ambient system uh, to reach the ambient stand I use the super cerebral approach because of this I use this approach in this case you can see the uh, operative and the post operative view of this uh, patient Also, you can use this approach, uh, this position in what the sigmoid approach depends on your profession. And also brainstem lesions, you can use, this is the uh, super follicle mass. And also, uh, there's some lesion in the uh, temporal surface. You can use super cellular approach and uh, this position. You can see the preoperative and postoperative view. And lastly, to do a P2 uh, aneurysm, you can use this approach. This is the preoperative view of the Anism. And this is the all same steps about our approach. But differently, you can uh, open the tantorum and reach mesial temporal ambience system. And you can see the aneurysm and the temporary clipping of the P2. And clipping the aneurysm. 
and this is the postoperative waves and postoperative angiography of this patient. As you see, uh, this approach can be used also, super cerebellar approach can be used. All of these uh, lesions like midbrain cavernomas and, and brain stem gliomas, so, uh, cerebellar lesions, and also CPA and ambient stem lesions, and also pineal mass and the T2 and T3 aneurysms. And also, uh, I have I want to show a small video about our laboratory in Medical uh, University. You are welcome whenever you want to visit our laboratory. I want to talk. To, I want to thank the uh, Professor Uwe and uh, Washagil. I am working with them now, and also uh, I am a former fellow of the Professor Uwe. Uh, I want to thank him. Thank you very much for listening. This is my last uh, slide of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Abizur, for this nice presentation. Actually, I use something like this as a modified semi-sitting for <laughs> the lateral aspects to avoid, for people doing a purely semi-sitting position in the standard way, uh, they might not like it, but I think they have to try it if, and I think Dr. Ramish and myself will do this. And you have shown nice video how you tackle these uh, lesions. Uh, any questions? Well, I, I, I would like to. Uh, I'm using pure pure sitting position, and we have all the monitoring, and uh, we really have had one uh, uh, embolism in 150 cases. Uh, thus, I believe that uh, if done properly, the sitting position is not really that dangerous. Uh, the another thing is that uh, I always use the lumbar drain again. I'm sorry for that, because uh, the craniotomy does not need to be that low. The craniotomy can be small. It's unilateral over the past 10 years, uh, not a single uh, midline approach. And I believe that the, this approach is something like a pterion of the posterior fossa, because it's so versatile that you can uh, really approach any lesion uh, in the region. I'm using it for all the petroclival meningiomas, for all pineal region tumors, for, for, for uh, everything you, you can imagine, which is above the meatus. So I commend you for, for the lecture because it really highlights the use of, of, of this approach. And uh, I, I don't really think that it really that much matters what kind of uh, position do you use as long as you use the gravity. It means something like sitting or semi-sitting. Thank you. I, I have to conclude with you about the lumbar drain. As you said, uh, you always say this is the best invention. And no doubt, people think you put the lumbar drain and you keep the drain uh, flowing. No, I oh. usually, I put the drain and I open it when I need it. So exactly. when we're talking about the, um, the uh, middle fossa tumors and that you, you will reach the cistern fast, but sometimes in this big tumor, by the time you have to mobilize the tumor and the frontal, uh, the temporal lobe from the sphenoid wing, like they were talking about this case, the brain is swelling and you are putting impact of a retractor to mobilize that brain, where if yeah. you let the drain drain uh, five, 10 cc's, you are in no time at the system, then you can drain the system. But right. sometimes it's very difficult to drain the system with the swollen brain. Yeah, and what, you, what you, I do you, that uh, I yeah. insert the drain and we release something like 20 cc 
And it means that uh, in a supra infra, you do not reach the major uh, system, uh, system at the beginning. So you do not drain that much. Yeah. So 20 cc is enough. You open the dura and the corridor is already open. You immediately right. see the pineal region and you do not need to do anything else. 20 cc and close the drain. It's not open permanently, of course, only for, for 25 cc, no more is necessary. And the corridor is immediately opened and you see everything in the pioneer region or petroclibra region. All right. Any other comment or questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, well, uh, you? <laughs> yes, thank you. Compliment for uh, for the uh, Dr. Gunder for this presentation. Every presentation that is uh, about sitting, semi-sitting, lateral sitting position is has to be uh, has to be encouraged because this is uh, I agree with you is a wonderful uh, position uh, that uh, require of course a, a, a training for the anesthesiologist or a team of the anesthesiologist <clears throat> about the. Number drainage, I never use it, so I don't want to get in, in, in polemics. But when you do, when the patient is in place or before putting the, the patient in a sitting position or semi sitting position? Before, I just put the lumbar drain before I position the patient and I keep it closed. And when I finish with the craniotomy, I'll check the dura. If the dura is tense, I will drain. If it, I'm talking about an, anterior fossa, about this uh, supercellular meningioma, I think uh, Vladimir was talking about the posterior. The posterior, I'll do what uh, Dr. Uh, Abuzer is doing. I'll do, this is, I learned it from Popsa Yazavjil. You open the cisterna magna and the small incision and you drain from there. Yeah, that's but for, Yeah, but for the anterior fossa and middle fossa, I will drain once I feel this tense dura and before I open the dura. And a swollen brain, if you open the dura, the brain comes to you. So you start getting a brain strangulation before you start even your case. So you imagine you want to follow the skull base, you add additional negative impact of retraction. Did I answer your questions? Oh, you were talking about posterior force. No, uh, yes, you answered partially. I, I never use, I when, when before starting, I think that the intravenous logic, that is a diuresis, the much more powerful that, that the, the monitor, it can help you. Uh, I think that's it. But that is a question of, uh, of the uh, team I uh, of with the anesthesiologist. I think yeah, I I don't, uh, uh, let's, let's not go into the, into the polemics. Yeah. Okay. So may okay. I, may I uh, introduce my very good... First of all, I would like to, to make a, uh, best wishes to uh, Keke Turan. That is, uh, the, uh, he was uh, for, for many years our uh, sour against uh, our problems. And uh, it, it taught us a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, reason to be careful and to be attentive of what we are doing. Uh, Giovanni, if I Giovanni, the... Giovanni, before you yes. start, I just to draw the attention, they will be wondering what's happened. We changed the sequence of moderation because yes. Giovanni has to go to a meeting. So he will introduce the next two speakers or one speaker or whatever, and then we'll take off. Okay. Go ahead. No, that you need. Giovanni. Yes. So it's my pleasure to, to introduce my friend uh, Mario Amirati, uh, that he will uh, talk about giant vestibular. Uh, Shanomas, as uh, we already see in the, in, in the screen. Please, Mario. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, thank you, Imad and Vladimir, for, uh, for having... For open, having open, open the, wind, open the, 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 the video. We don't see you. Oh, are you sure you want to see me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, you can see me now. So anyway, thank you, Vladimir and Imad, for, uh, for having created this very, 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 very nice, very, very nice group. 
I have enjoyed all the all the seminars, all the webinars, and I'm sure also the young younger neurosurgeons they have enjoyed them as well. So really, thank you so much. Keki certainly deserved this recognition, and I just want to say a few words. You know, Keki is an artist. You can see that in his pictures that are just uh, very very nice, very artistic, and you can see it in his surgery as well. So having said that, I just want to go ahead and uh, uh, you know, start talking in my, about my topic, that is surgery of giant vestibular schwannoma. Uh, you see here, it's not working. Oh, yeah. Um, so the in, so I, will, I, I just made this talk very, very practical so that younger people, hopefully, they can uh, take something home from this talk. So it's not really about me, it's more about you know, the younger neurosurgeons. So the incidence of vestibular schwannoma, it's, uh, it's, it's relatively low, it's about two per 100,000 per year, so that's low. What are the management options? Management options are three, either surgery, either radiosurgery, and a word about radiosurgery. Radiosurgery is not only gamma knife or single fraction radiosurgery, but depending on the size, more often than not, is fractionated stereotactic radiosurgery that is a total different animal than single fraction radiosurgery. So surgery, radiosurgery, as well as observation. Uh, how we evaluate the result, I mean, by just looking at the usual thing, the tumor removal, the mortality, the morbidity, and uh, regarding the morbidity, two, two items are very important, the hearing function and the facial nerve function. Hearing evaluation scales, there are several, uh, several scales. Uh, there is the, uh, the, the Gardner uh, Robertson that uh, really the first, two, the, first two, the first two lines is what is called serviceable hearing, meaning that if you, if you put a prosthesis or a hearing aid, this patient they may, 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 uh, may hear, essentially. That's what serviceable hearing means. The same thing is, is, uh, is true with the, the, the other scale. And uh, essentially, A and B means that you have serviceable hearing, when you're going to C or D, you know, you really don't have serviceable hearing. So, so really any attempt to try to preserve hearing in somebody who before surgery as a C or D uh, level is really, in my opinion, is futile. Uh, facial nerve is very important and we all, know, uh, we all know the classification. You go from normal to total paralysis. And of course, the goal is that of achieving after surgery and one or two. It's very uncommon before surgery to have any significant degree of facial nerve uh, malfunction. Uh, regarding observation, what is the natural history of vestibular schwannoma? I mean, every year you, you have a number of papers that try to address this topic. And people talk about that at meeting all the time. I, I really think that uh, the, more, the most robust paper that addressed the natural history of vestibular schwannoma was one that was done in uh, Denmark by, by Stangerup and, uh, and, um, and colleagues. Uh, Denmark is a, relatively, is a relatively small country as a centralized health system. So really all the vestibular schwannoma, they are treated in uh, one or two central locations. So what does that mean? That means that follow-up, uh, it's, uh, it's very robust. You don't have people that are lost at, at follow-up. People don't move too much. So really, you can get a lot of information on the natural history of any disease in this type of country. And that's not uh, a case that also we got a lot of information from the natural history of venuries by in the 60s and 70s by studies that were conducted in Finland, you know, the study by Pakarin that comes to mind. Of course, doing an observational study in the United States, it's impossible because of the fragmentation of the healthcare delivery places and because of the fact that patients move 
from one state to the other. So, so really, all these conditions make a study done in this country a very robust study, more than any other study. Uh, they look at the percentage of patients with vestibular schwannomas smaller than 20 millimeter, and they were allocated annually to observation by repetitive MRI from 75 to 2004, and you can see the number of patients uh, that is certainly significant. When we say smaller than 20 millimeter, of course, we are referring to the extra miatal uh, dimension uh, of uh, the tumor. So they accrued uh, about 552 patients with up to 20 millimeter extramiatal tumor. Of these 230 pure intramiatal tumor, 322, they had up to 20 millimeter extramiatal uh, tumor. And uh, you can see that when these patients were followed longitudinally over many, many years, the percentage of tumor that grew and the percentage of tumor that uh, stayed the same. And I think the interesting thing is that after five years, after five years, you don't have any more growth of all the patients that were followed up. Um, the growth of the intramiatal versus the extramiatal, uh, of course, it's a, a little bit different. This one here is the intramiatal and this one is the extramiatal. So you can see that about 20% of intramiatal tumor, they grew, and we'll talk about later what growth means, while about 35% of the extramiatal tumor, uh, they grew. So they had they developed then based on the on their result, this uh, sort of algorithm. If a patient is seen with a tumor that is more than 15 millimeter, of extramiatal, extramiatal growth, then the patient gets operated. Of course, you know, depending on the patient preference and on the country, the patient needs treatment, but may also be treated with, uh, with uh, radiosurgery. Uh, patient who have a tumor that is less than 15 millimeter in extramiatal diameter, they are observed, observed and uh, with yearly MRI. If there is growth, that means more than two millimeter growth, then they again are evaluated for uh, treatment either with surgery or with uh, uh, some sort of radiosurgery. When there is no growth, the MRI is repeated uh, at yearly interval. And as we saw before, once you have no growth at five years, then chances that the tumor grow become very small. So, so clearly, uh, you know, we today, with all, these, uh, with all these treatment modality available, I think that uh, there is general agreement that probably large and giant tumor, they are the one that at least in the United States, they are, there is a univocal indication for surgery. And even then there are some people, who, even with giant tumor, they would consider doing a uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. Uh, Now, what are the what are the the the, uh, the pearls of doing surgery for for uh, for uh, this patient uh, with uh, with large um, vestibular schwannoma? First of all, is number one position. I mean, I really think that all this debate about sitting, not sitting, lateral sitting, everybody needs to operate in the position, using the position that they feel more comfortable with. I think that if somebody looks at the literature, uh, the incidence of, of hemodynamically significant air emboli when you use any type of sitting position, it's very small, it's very small. But having said that, of course, if your anesthesiologist is not comfortable or if the surgeon is not comfortable, then they should use another position. But going from that, Going from there to say that sitting position is dangerous, I think is a is a is an inaccurate statement. So positioning is very important because uh, I use the semi-sitting position. I like it very much because uh, it allows me to do faster surgery because I don't stop to coagulate for any for any uh, minimal bleeding because the blood gets drained uh, downstream. 
So I, I like it. I like it. I think anatomically it's very sound for me, but hey, whatever makes you comfortable and you are comfortable with, that's the best position. Then uh, you need to minimize coagulation. Uh, that has to do with the fact that uh, vestibular schwannoma surgery, as well as any skull-based surgery, benign skull-based surgery, rests on separation of the arachnoidal layer because important vascular structures, they are inside the subarachnoid space. So if you separate the tumor from the arachnoidal layer that, uh, uh, that, uh, that walls the important structure, then you set yourself up for a good outcome. How you do that? If you coagulate a lot, then you tend to coalesce the plane between the arachnoid and the tumor. So it is impossible to do non-traumatic arachnoidal dissection. If on the other end, the plane is left pristine, then using, you know, uh, using forceps or any other cotonoid or any other technique that you like, then you can uh, accomplish a good separation between the tumor and uh, the subarachnoid system. Then I personally, don't think that retraction is, is a swear word. I don't think it's a, bad, it's a bad word. I think retraction, if you know how to use it and if you use it appropriately, it's certainly uh, something that uh, is very helpful in, uh, in micro neurosurgery. But uh, of course, as we said before, you, know, you need to minimize the cerebellar retraction by by getting CSF out from the cistern. And uh, as I use a paramedian approach, uh, in order for me to do that, I need to, first of all, remove the horizontal portion of the occipital squama. And then I am able to access the inferior cerebellopontine cistern and uh, open it before I even open the dura in uh, uh, media to the sigmoid transverse junction. So that's the first step that I do each time that I deal with a, with a large tumor in the posterior fossa. Of course, I mean, I, I don't use lumbar drain in posterior fossa, but of course, if somebody is not comfortable or doesn't wanna do uh, the opening of the cistern, then I, I guess the same result is accomplished by using a lumbar drain. Uh, then the other important, uh, important pearl is that you need to alternate intracapsular debolting with extracapsular dissection. In this way, you are able to transform a large tumor into a small tumor, but you need to be patient. You cannot rush. You need to do the uh, meticulous intracapsular debulking and then extracapsular dissection. And each time that you develop a plane uh, between the tumor and the surrounding arachnoidal structure, then you need to be able to maintain it. Usually I do that by placing, by placing cotonoid there. Then of course you need to have neurophysiological monitoring and the facial nerve monitoring the stimulation. It's very, it's very useful. Then you need to have a clear surgical plane, but you must be prepared to change it. What does that mean? That means that, uh, you know, if you see that during surgery, uh, there is a, a very tight adhesion between the tumor and the brainstem, then it's probably better to leave some tumor on the brainstem more than just press for a complete tumor removal. And then you need to be aware of other modalities to control tumors, such as radio surgery. Now, uh, this is the semi-sitting position that, uh, that we use. And uh, this one is... Uh, is uh, just, I just wanted to show a small, small video where uh, I implement many of the things. I hope to say all the things that I uh, just discussed. This one is a patient, a young patient presented with brainstem compression and uh, with, uh, by all means, a giant uh, vestibular schwannoma. Of course, the healing was completely gone on that side. And, it is almost always the case with giant vestibular schwannoma. So here we are opening and releasing cerebrospinal fluid, and you can see the CSF coming out. You can see that this is the horizontal opening of the dura, 
over the, the, the occipital squamor. Now we are uh, opening you know, the dura. We, we have a retractor on the cerebellum. I, I just like the retractor. Many times I you know, used to retract, but often at times I use it to support uh, to support uh, the brain so that it doesn't come into way. And so here we are doing the intracapsular uh, debulking. I think here you will see that we are going to go to the lower cranial nerves here. So we develop the lower cranial nerves. We know where they are. And as I said before, then we place a cotonoid and then we go back to the, to the intracapsular debulking. By doing intracapsular debulking, you are able to to mobilize the tumor, but you must be careful uh, not to feel uh, too confident once you are able to mobilize big chunks of tumor and trying to rush the surgery because obviously there are arteries, you know, the, 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 the ICA and uh, the superior cerebellar artery that are in front of the tumor and you won't be able to, you could damage them if you, if you rush. So whenever you see something that mobilizes, stay, stay calm and uh, keep doing the same thing. Very slow intracapsular debulking, and then you develop the arachnoidal plane. We develop it here superiorly, and, uh, and uh, just uh, stay the course. Uh, obviously, once you have opened at the beginning the, the, uh, the uh, inferior cerebellopontine system, you can always go back there and drain more CSF, although the CSF keeps draining from there once you have opened it. So there is really nothing that to do there. Now drilling the internal auditory canal in order to remove the intracranial portion, you can do it anytime during surgery, which feel comfortable. Probably it's better to do it at the beginning because you are less tired and you can pay more attention to that. In this case, of course, I did it. We did it. I don't know if I did it on my license. I did it later in the course of the operation. And uh, just by, by, you know, continuing to doing the same thing, preserving the arachnoidal plane, maintaining the separation between the arachnoid and, you know, that's the facial nerve. And uh, we, we were able to accomplish a very good removal of this tumor. I would say this was a complete removal, as you can see on this post-operative MRI scan. Of course, post-operative MRI scan, you like to do it at least a couple of weeks after after surgery, you do an immediate CT to make sure there is no hematoma. And that's the patient after surgery. You can see that she seems to be working, uh, to be walking quite well. And more important than that, she has a beautiful smile. So we were very happy that we were able to remove completely this tumor. And she was by and large able to walk normally. That was a few months after surgery. I'm confident she would get better and better, and more important, we were able to maintain a, a, a beautiful smile. So um, oh, this one here, let me go back there. So essentially, essentially, again, I'm just going to re-emphasize the point that I said before, positioning is very important. I don't care if you use the sitting position, semi-sitting, lateral sitting, prone position, whatever you want to use. Every surgeon should use the position that he and his team are more comfortable with. I personally very comfortable with the sitting position. Uh, but anybody else can use any other position. And I'm not going to criticize any other position. Neither I expect people to criticize, uh, you know, the sitting position. I am given the advantage in my, in my hands of the sitting position. You, that's very important. No matter what you do, what position you use, you need to minimize coagulation. I've seen a lot of uh, operation done also by a respectable surgeon where you, you have all this char, charred black arachnoid. I mean, that makes no sense. It means that you have no concept of what small bed surgery is all about. Uh, you need to minimize cerebellar retraction by immediate access to CSF space. As I said before, retraction is not a swear word. I know that right now it's not popular to talk about retraction and using a retractor. I like to use them 
I, I feel that I know how to use them and I think people should be taught how to use retractors. I think that many times when people use instrument, when people don't use retraction, often in times they use instrument retraction, meaning they retract with, uh, with an instrument, usually with suction. And I think from a theoretical point of view that exposed the, the, the brain to, to trauma as well. There's no way that you can do surgery for any big skull-based tumor without uh, having to deal with uh, the brain that surrounds the tumor by and large. Uh, then uh, you need to alternate intracapsular debulking with extracapsular dissection, maintain the extracapsular plane using cotonoids so you can go back there and know where you are, stay, be very careful when you mobilize big chunk of tumor, that's good, because that means you have done a good job, but don't get rushed by that because that's when you get in trouble. Uh, use neuromonitoring and fa facial nerve stimulation. I think it's extremely important. And uh, you must have a clear surgical plane, but you must be flexible and prepared to change. And you must, of course, be aware of other modalities to control tumors, such as radio surgery. So, so essentially, those are fundamentals that apply to all skull based surgery. Respect arachnoidal plane, limit coagulation, approach tumors from different angles have a clear surgical plane, be prepared to modify, and be aware of other modality to, con to control tumors, you know, such as radiosurgery. And uh, I think if microneurosurgical fundamental are properly used, uh, then the majority of joint vestibular sarcoma will be safely, safely operated using a simple retrosigmoid approach. And I think that's what, uh, that's what I had to say. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mario, for this uh, beautiful presentation and uh, very useful, I think, for the young people that are starting uh, this uh, approach for, for tumors. Uh, I don't see uh, any, uh, any question. There is no hands. I have one comment yes. about yes. Uh, retraction. I understand what the... Uh, Mario is saying, but we'd like to use the word dynamic retraction. So we'll put the retractor, we don't keep it the whole procedure in one position. So you adjust it accordingly. So the pressure won't be on one spot the whole procedure. And this has, that expression was used by actually first time, I think uh, Professor Spetzler I used this word. And I like always to use this dynamic if I'm going to use at all the retraction. Yeah, I think that's uh, that is part of uh, of knowing how to use retractors. I think that people need to learn how to use retractor. I think right now retractors and uh, you know they they have a very bad uh, reputation. And I think I have seen many of my younger colleagues operating without uh, using quote unquote retraction, using bipolar or using suction to retract. And uh, I can tell you that it's not a nice, it's not a nice spectacle. Okay, uh, okay. thank you, Mario. Uh, thank you again. And uh, we move to Keki. I have a question, if possible. Yes, yes, yes Leonardo. And a consideration. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mario, for this uh, elegant and very complete uh, presentation that you taken from a. Uh, for a large series of tumors you operated on. Uh, I have uh, just to, to add uh, in a short comment that you uh, correctly cited the, in the bulking intratumoral, uh, the bulking uh, of the mass and the subarachnoid dissection. But uh, um, it seems to me very useful also to, to follow when if possible, especially in large tumor, the subperineural dissection. I mean, the, uh, mm, uh, uh, very close to the perineurium of the nerves in order to reach more easily the facial nerve starting from the vestibular nerve. So the, the bulking is fundamental arachnoid plane just to understand the relationships with other vessels and the trigeminal nerve. But uh, for me, in my uh, experience, searching the facial nerve is much easier when I follow from inside the, uh, the perineurial of the, of the vestibular nerves. This is only my, of course, my experience. And this is uh, 
taken from an article of Kono that you know very well. Uh, you have yeah. just a question. What do you do? Uh, what is your experience in hypervascular large vestibular schwannoma? You know that it's quite a different subtype of a vesti large vestibular schwannoma. Do you have some suggestions of this hypervascular that is not readily to found? Yeah, I, my suggestion is that of uh, my suggestion is that of uh, of taking your time, and uh, if you have uh, significant intra intratumoral bleeding, of course, to coagulate it. But uh, I think that uh, um, I think that uh, that working on an area of tumor that is hypervascular, and then uh, you work uh, you work there for a while, then you can pack it with the hemostatic agent and work on a different area, and then you will find often in times that when you go back to the area that was very hypervascular, then it becomes much more manageable. So that's why I think that. Uh, one of the tenets of uh, skull-based surgery that is that you have different angle of approach to tumor, it's also important. So for example, in a giant vestibular schwannoma, you, can, you have different axes. You can go on the upper pole, you can go the lower pole where the lower crown nerves are, upper pole where the fifth nerve is, you can go toward the brainstem or uh, you can go away from the brainstem. So, so really, when you find that there is too much vascularity and that uh, impedes the progress of surgery, then I usually, uh, you know, try, of course I try to coagulate first. If that, uh, you know, solves the problem, so be it. If that doesn't solve the problem, I usually put some hemostatic agent there, like some uh, flow seal, uh, avatin, whatever. And then I go, I go back to a, to a different area. I have also used, as people mentioned before, the hydrogen peroxide, and I have used the hydrogen peroxide by putting it into the CUSA, into the CUSA, into the CUSA solution. And uh, I have never used it in vestibular schwannoma because uh, I did not find it necessary, but I've used it in, uh, in vascular meningioma. So I think that could be another, another option. But I usually, going from working on one area, stopping and then going to another area and then going back to the previous area, I think often at times that helps. Mario, Mario, there is one thing that I think for all people trained by Professor Sami, I'm sure Keki, you will conquer with this. The name of the name is irrigation. Yeah. Copious irrigation. And many times the frequent irrigation reduce the amount of ooze in this tomb intracapsular lesion. Yes, that's true. Thank you for reminding for reminding me of that. I just do it automatically, so I really don't think that's uh, don't think of it too much. But absolutely, I mean, you know, the, the corpus irrigation is very important because it gets the blood away together with the sitting position, so that de decreases the the need for coagulation. Yes. Thank you, Iman. Okay, thank you, Mario. I had something uh, you quoted the neuro, uh, you know, monitoring. I think that the one of the things is very important in, in any position that you get, that you start the neuro monitoring from the beginning of surgery before craniotomy, because that's is, a, <clears throat> is, a, is important to have a baseline on which you will work later on. Do you agree? Absolutely. Okay, so thank you to you again. And uh, we now move uh, before I lead my chairmanship to Luciano, to Keki. Keki, are you there? I think yes. Keki? I am just going to share my screen now. Okay, yeah. so welcome. And you have, you have the floor, one, one will say once. Now you have the screen. Can you see this? Giovanni. Yes. You... I like the painting on your wall. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen now? Not yet. No, we see you. No. Okay. All right. Okay. Screen broadcast. Now can you see it? Not yet. Not yet? 
Oh. Share screen. Ciao Luciano. Ciao, come stai? Bene, tu? Eh, non c'è più. Sì. Vedi, it looks like that you have a complication. <laughs> Electronic complication. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a... Yes, but we will overcome it. This was not anticipated. <laughs> You can see it now? Okay, now yes. yes Namaste. So, I, at the beginning, must say one thing, as I said at the, uh, at the beginning of the, today's uh, webinar, that I'm deeply honored and humbled at receiving this great honor from my own uh, colleagues. Uh, this is a great thing because when you have peer recognition, it is a highest kind of honor. So I must say thank you very much. Uh, without wasting much time, I say namaste to you. Uh, namaste is now a very fashionable way of greeting because of COVID, we don't touch each other. So this is uh, an Indian way of, and a very old fashioned way, uh, which must be based on some kind of hygienic principles uh, to greet each other in a very uh, uh, honest and a very honorable way. <clears throat> so that's what it means, namaste. My, my title today is uh, Total versus Subtotal Excision. This subtotal may be planned or unplanned of vestibular schwannomas of all sizes. So we all know, I've, Mario has actually summarized the whole subject in a very beautiful way. I appreciate it. And this would not have been, both of us were contemporaries at some time uh, with Majid Sami. So we can see that light shining through us. Uh, through Mario also. Complete removal of a large vestibular schwannoma with total preservation of seventh nerve and hearing, if it is still preserved, is one of the most difficult and of course satisfying undertakings by a neurosurgeon. The goal, of course, is uh, the most important goal is uh, total removal, but occasionally uh, with, uh, with preservation of seventh and eighth, but occasionally is liable to result in facial palsy of varying grades. And these are all my patients, and you can see some of them are adorably normal, but some of them have got really awry, and some of them have got a debilitating and psychologically uh, devastating facial palsy. Let's face this. Face is your identity. In defense of saving the face, both of the patient and of the surgeon, varying amounts of tumor may willfully, may willfully be left behind. What is described as a sliver of tumor left attached to the facial nerve is sometimes a much larger amount whose true dimensions may only be ratified on doing a post-contrast MRI. So varying amounts of tumor may be left behind for a variety of reasons in this surgery, sometimes deliberately, sometimes inadvertently. I'll start showing you with some of my early patients. 1989, this young lady had a vestibular schwannoma and uh, in, this is the intraoperative picture where you see, where's my marker not moving? No, it won't be visible. And um, so the, uh, the, the middle picture shows a, the tumor and the right hand picture shows a complete removal, a complete removal uh, uh, with preservation of the facial nerve. And, and uh, so this was pre-operative and immediate post-operative, there was practically no tumor, but there was some, some, some kind of a shadow this time, we did not have the MRI scans uh, in this year. Uh, and immediate post-operative, she had a very mild facial palsy, which recovered within a month completely. Uh, she had full recovery of facial and taste. However, she suffered hearing loss and tinnitus and lack of tears in the right eye. And uh, this went on from 1991 to 1993. We saw tumor growth, uh, which was mostly intracranicular, but there was no further growth until she was scanned in 2007. So this was 2007, post-operative, 18 years, and steady intracranicular uh, size of tumor. Similarly, some surgeons may plan preoperatively to not remove the tumor completely in order not to inflict damage. While some other instances, it is a safe decision deliberately taken during surgery to back out for this very reason. 
So this is a patient whom I have done more recently. So this is a lady with a large acoustic tumor on the right side. And you can see uh, that there is a sliver of tumor attached to the facial nerve and a very thin amount. And she's, this was done quite recently. So she's still under observation with no further growth of tumor. And that's a clinical. Why is it not moving? Okay. All right. So this is our post-operative. We have not got a uh, video, but she's a, any, animating very nicely. What are the difficulties of total excision of tumors? We just saw um, Mario is talking about the giant size tumors. Of course, size of tumor does matter, but it's not an indication for subtotal excision. Giant size can be a challenge, but per se should not be a factor for preoperative decision or plan to leave tumor behind. So we have this pre-op and we have this post-op in the same gentleman with a good facial function. Mario Osana many years ago said that the risk of facial nerve dysfunction in patients with vestibular schwannomas large and three centimeters is six-fold greater than in patients with smaller tumors. Uh, and uh, he's also talked about how this structure can be splayed to the extent that it cannot be differentiated uh, or differentiated with very great uh, difficulty. And therefore, intraoperative neuromonitoring is extremely important. Although we may discuss with the patient or family that we may be obliged to leave a tumor, a bit of tumor behind for preserving the facial nerve, the target is always complete removal of tumor. In our mind, we should go with this idea that we shall remove the tumor totally. Now, this is a young lady who was a dancer, uh, uh, Indian dancer, so she's very highly balanced. But look at the kind of tumor that she harbored without losing her balance until she finally lost her balance. And it's a huge tumor, giant tumor. And uh, preoperatively, she's still reasonably good with facial function. And I operated on her, removed the tumor almost completely. A very tiny sliver of tumor may appear to be left behind. So we are going to observe her. And she comes post-operatively. You can see post-operatively, uh, there is a mild facial palsy. There is a background grade three, but she has a still a hearing function with a mild facial weakness, and she has no imbalance, and she is back to her dancing methods. So the second problem is arachnoid. If there is no arachnoid plane, there is brainstem edema. You can see this wetness, this hypodensity. This should be an alarm for us to make sure to, uh, to, 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 to be a little more careful. So here we have done, this operation was done. In the initial years, I used to do a semi-sitting semi position. Uh, now I'm doing, uh, once again, be shifted to, uh, uh, to a lateral and then come back to sitting in some selected cases. So this is the tumor being separated and with two hand technique and a third hand irrigating exactly the way Professor Sami has taught us. Then I opened the canal and identified a tumor, removed the tumor from within the canal. Again, go back outwards towards the brainstem and separate the tumor with two hands, what? irrigation, third hand. And this tumor is now totally excised with the facial nerve intact and the brainstem nicely pulsating. Uh, the patient had already lost his hearing preoperatively. And you can see the facial nerve, but there was brainstem edema in this patient. So we need to see what happens. So large acoustic tumors can produce brain semidemy, obstructing venous drainage, and disruption of brain arachnoid, brain, uh, blood brain barrier by severe arachnoid lesions. So here you have another tumor, such tumor. You can see the brain stem almost blue black, almost red blue in color because there is no arachnoid plane. And the tumor has been now finally delivered, completely removed. But you can see preoperatively, the, uh, the patient had edema, but postoperatively, you can see a small area, a large area rather, of pontine infarct. However, the patient was remaining well preserved, but you can see the edema, it can be quite shocking. The third difficulty is extremely fibrous or extremely vascular tumor. We just heard some discussion on that. And it gets worse when it is both fibrous as well as vascular. So you have to, as you, as Mario correctly said, you keep changing the angles and you keep irrigating. And then finally, that vascular tumor becomes avascular. Then the lesion to facial nerve is another difficulty. This lesion can be just five millimeters outside porous acousticus. As I can show you over here, the canal has been opened. The tumor is being 
peeled off the acoustic tumor. And you can see the most adherent portion is here, is uh, at this point, at the just five millimeters outside porous acousticus. So that's the nerve from the, the tumor from the canal, dissected out, but over here, you encounter adhesion. So you stop here, then come from the medial side until you come back to this point of maximum adhesion. And that's where you can minimize your traction and finally come to the point of maximum adhesion. If it is easy to dissect, you can do that. If it is not, you leave behind uh, a sliver of tumor at that point. So at the medial end, the adhesion may be between the brainstem, down at the brainstem. So here we can see Sorry, it went off. A small part of tumor attached to the... It's not moving, the video is not moving. What's wrong? A small part of the tumor attached to the seventh nerve. Sorry, the video is not moving. The other difficulty is cystic tumors. People think cystic tumors are very easy because they can be immediately collapsed and they can be separated. But I must warn you, cystic tumors, they just appear easy on the scan, but they demand careful dissection as they are closely adherent to the surrounding structures. These are giant size, most of them are giant size cystic tumors which are hypervascular, severe brainstem adhesions. Most of these patients are young and there is hydrocephalus. Frequently, good hearing is present in spite of their giant size. So surgical outcome in cystic vestibular schwannomas discussed by one of our colleagues, uh, Suresh Nair. I wonder if he is in the audience. Uh, they vary in their surgical outcome and carry a very difficult or different risk of post-operative complications because of peritumoral lesions of the capsule to the nerve and worse facial nerve outcome. And therefore, subtitle excision may be justified. So I'm going to show you one case of... Uh, vestibular, cystic vestibular schwannoma. I'm emptying the cyst, removing a coagulated, removing like coagulum-like tumor. And always working in search of the 7th and the 8th now. Tumor removal, as I said, is a byproduct. Try to focus on looking for facial nerve and 8th now and trying to preserve that. Tumor removal, will happen on the way. So now, by following this principle, we have complete excision of the tumor and good facial nerve function. This is immediately after surgery, whilst the patient is still in the hospital. And uh, seventh and eighth, both the nerves are fortunately preserved. Not always possible in cystic tumors. The routine use of seventh nerve tractography combined with NIM may help us to locate the facial nerve technically with less difficulty and allow more radical safe resection. But I must say that even with current technology, facial nerve identification can be difficult in some cases. So then what would be a indication for subtotal resection? There's one indication which I find uh, useful when you pre-plan subtotal excision, patient already presenting with facial paresis, in which case the surgeon might fear aggravation, the weakness by excessive physical manipulation of the nerve. As in this case, she already has a preoperative grade palsy. She has a great uh, giant tumor. And so you must be extra careful, brainstem compression. Um, you have to be particularly careful. Sometimes you may have to leave tumor behind in order to preserve this face. This face is bound to become one grade poorer postoperatively, but may recover if you've been careful. Now, this is a lady whom I operated in 2003. I got a complete removal of the tumor and Total excision, normal facial function, but she was so happy. She just didn't come. No follow-up at all. She did come with a couple of follow-up MRIs during the following year, which were quite normal. But thereafter, she was overconfident. And then in 2021, last year, she reported to me, 18 years after the first operation, her, patient, her symptom was not uh, acoustic tumor symptoms. It was hemifacial spasm. So this time we had to no alternative but to go in again and operate on her, remove the tumor once again completely. And after a second operation, she had reasonably good facial function. But we need to warn our patients 
that they must regularly come for the scan, even when they are completely normal. They should not be complacent. There's a long-term risk of recurrence and regrowth after gross total and subtotal resection of sporadic vestibular schwannoma. Uh, long-term surveillance is therefore required following this resection, even after gross total resection. As I have just shown you, after 18 years, the patient has come back and not with acoustic symptoms, but with a facial nerve, uh, with facial hemifacial spasm. Similarly, we had a patient in 2015. We removed a tumor uh, with a sliver of tumor left behind, post-operative 2016. He has a very good facial function. One year afterwards, four years afterwards, he has just that same small sliver of tumor remaining behind. And I've asked him to come regularly, but due to COVID, he could not come in the following year. So he came in 2021. And you can see what was a very small tumor in 2019 has grown substantially six years post-operative. So I did the operation again. Again into 2021, he has an excellent facial nerve function. And so subtotal or near total removal treatment of vestibular schwannoma, the risk of recurrence increases and is proportionate to the volume of residual tumor. So what has changed now? Paradigm shift in treatment of vestibular schwannomas over the last two decades towards functional preservation, not just, uh, not just uh, anatomical preservation. Ideal management strategy, therefore, for large and giant vestibular schwannomas still remains debatable. A combination of microsurgical excision and adjuvant stereotactic radio surgery with good functional outcome and tumor control. There are two issues. Periodic post-operative follow-up mandatory for successful tumor removal and SRS stereotactic radio surgery for all residual tumors uh, gives very good results. Now, radio surgery has become easily available. As a result, the neurosurgeons find it very convenient to leave varying amounts of tumor behind, citing or quoting that the harm suffered by the patient following complete excision. So now, gamma life has become a refuge for neurosurgeons who are unable to remove tumor completely. So I must still say that your effort to remove completely must continue. And only that should be the last uh, refuge. So the temptation of radio surgery is like the uh, uh, perennial um, um, apple, Adam's apple, Eve's apple, rather partial removal radio surgery is better and safer than total or near total removal. That's what they say today. Should not be the refuge of inexperienced neurosurgeons. I'll quote you a Velour study conducted in South India where uh, my son trained, Mazda. And uh, they reviewed, well, they had a very meticulous record keeping. And therefore, I'm tempted to show this, share this. They had 85 to 95% near and near total and total removal, with resection, subtotal resection, and near total resection of giant tumors over a 10 year period. <clears throat> Objectives were proportion of patients undergoing SRS, functional outcome in compliance with follow-up. Problem was in their situation also with follow-up. In, as in India, in many places, patients come from small towns. They don't come for regular follow-up. They did this retrospective study of 10 years for giant tumors and uh, large tumors, primary vestibular schwannomata and underwent near total or subtotal resection, operated by various surgeons by retrosigmoid approach. Facial nerve grading was done. Volume calculation was done by MRI and CT. So this is the way they calculated the tumors volume. So these 294 tumors, uh, 239 were extruded because they were total excision. The planned incomplete resection in 18.7%, of which subtotal removal was 19 and near total removal was two thirds. So two thirds and one third. There were clinical follow-up of 52 patients, 94.5%. Radio, radiological follow-up in 85.5% and mean follow-up duration was 37 months. So this was the facial nerve function. It's not moving the, the cursor. Oh, so we have this pre-op facial function, one, two, and three on the left side and follow-up facial functions upon depending upon the grade. And you can see the gradation of facial nerve function. The grade one facial nerve remained grade nerve in about 18 patients. And grade two went through a different post-operative facial nerve function, about 32 patients. And uh, totally, they were in grade three, 
whatever was grade three, functional number function was only there, grade two and grade three functional function in a variable number. So this was the gradation, 44% after grade one tumor, after grade two tumor, 17 patients, 30, 53%, and grade three, 40%. Good facial nerve outcome in almost 82%. So mean preoperative facial function was 1.8, mean follow-up facial function was 2.4, and post-operative facial function had a good significant relationship with operative tumor volume. No facial function worsening after SRS. Please note that. So they've got some illustrative cases. This was a preoperative, and this is post-operative, one-year post-operative following uh, with gadolinium enhanced scan, which is a primary requirement. And, and this is nine-year follow-up after, you know, on an MRI, after subtotal resection and, um, and uh, SRS. Second case, preoperative, seven months postoperative, pre-SRS pre MRI, and five years follow-up after SRS. Excellent results. So the conclusion was planned incomplete microsurgical excision provides good facial function outcomes in majority of patients. Adjuvant SRS for all significant residues. Uh, main hurdle was regular follow-up. Wait and watch for minimal residue. I'll show you a case uh, of mine. She was a young uh, a lady, a pretty lady, wife of a young Saudi diplomat in Mumbai. Sudden deafness and tinnitus for two years, occipital headache for two years, still transient visual observ observations indicating bilateral papilledema. She had sensory impairment of trigeminal nerve, 50%. Masseter was flattened on MRI and clinically, and right hearing loss completely. She went around. She was capable of uh, taking several opinions, both in Germany and in USA. And after all these uh, tours, she came back to me for surgical removal of this giant vestibular schwannoma. And this was a real challenge because she had a normal facial function, she had papillary edema, and she had hearing loss. So this was the monitoring and we operate on her, we removed the tumor. A tiny sliver of tumor was left behind, but you saw, you saw the patient and this is My one year post-operative. From Saudi Arabia, Here's a volume. I can really. feel this side, all this side, because big tumor. Now I do an operation with Dr. Victorin. Uh, Somehow we are not getting there. So anyway, what she is, you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Management of large vestibular schwannomas, planned subtotal resection followed by gamma knife, radiologic and clinical aspect. Given the good growth control and facial nerve function preservation, the possibility of preserving serviceable hearing and the low number of complications, a subtotal resection followed by GKS can be the treatment option of choice in these large tumors. Hearing preservation is possible, but the number of patients with serviceable hearing is too small to draw any conclusion. Again, this was presented by one of our own colleagues, Roy, who is in Switzerland, Indian gentleman working in Switzerland, preserving normal facial function and improving hearing outcome in large vestibular schwannomas with a combined approach. So his philosophy is the same, subtotal dissection, gamma knife radio surgery. Sorry. So that's the plan, gamma knife surgery, and very good control. Another patient, outcomes in patients with similar schwannoma after STR and adjuvant uh, radio surgery after subtotal resection. So I would conclude by saying that surgery for vascular schwannoma is delicate and complex, hence must be done by someone who is an experienced neurosurgeon and preferably an experienced vascular schwannoma surgeon. Some of us are lucky to have a series of these cases, uh, but those people who are only operating occasionally uh, may not have the same experience. Microsurgical total excision is still a gold standard treatment for all vestibular schwannomas, particularly the large and giant ones. Radio surgery, though increasingly used by for small tumors, less than 2.5, may be used for subtotally removed giant tumors if the residual tumor shows increase in growth. Contrast MRI is a choice of investigation to detect residual tumor. My trade secret, as a VR, when we presented this paper, when we published this paper with Sami in 1984, when I was still with him, 
my uh, code, my my language is preservation of cranial nerves. Tumor removal is merely a byproduct. So I must say thank you to you. But before I wide up, yeah. So that's the last slide. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention and for uh, allowing me to complete my paper. Thank you. <laughs> now, I must just say that we are having these complications meetings. Uh, where is my last complication meeting? So uh, our next complication meeting will be in January next year in 2023. And uh, I must say that we have had a successful first three meetings. Two of them were physical and the third one was uh, was a uh, was a was a was a uh, was on was a, was a webinar, and we had three day meeting, twelve hours each day, attended by twelve thousand seven hundred and eighty neurosurgeons. The third webinar, which was online, so I think that this idea of having complications meeting has been very popular. And Giovanni, you have been my great supporter right from the first meeting, thank and thank you very much for thank supporting you. us. All the way. And I thank all my colleagues, especially those in the INA group who have been extremely supportive and who keep coming for these complications meeting. I feel so vindicated that we have started this campaign and, uh, and we are encouraged to continue with this so that we learn from each other. Not success stories, failure stories. Stories where we have made mistakes, but we have learned from each other. And that is how we minimize our complications. We learn both how to anticipate and prevent, and then if we land with complications, how to manage them. So this is the whole concept of these complications, webinars and seminars and, and live meetings. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Wonderful presentation. Again, this philosophy that we have to learn each other uh, let's say difficulties, not say mistake or complication, but there is a, any uh, comments, uh, uh, questions? Yes. Um, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. It was very nice presentation as always. I just have a comment on the on the pre-operative, you know, localization of the facial nerve in giant tumor. I mean, I mean yeah. of course. Where is you you? I'm not seeing your video. Oh, no, no, I'm just uh, talking. Okay. I, okay, 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 yeah. yeah, all right. Yes, thank you. I just yeah, wanted to comment on the preoperative uh, imaging localization of the facial nerve in this giant tumor. Yes, yes, I, yes. I think that, uh, I think its value is limited because as we all know, the facial nerve position changes, you know, during surgery significantly. I mean, you, you never see, well, well, before surgery, when you do a, DTI or other way of localizing it, you see it very clearly as a stretched up uh, you know, structure. At the end of surgery or when you are working on the facial nerve, the facial nerve position has completely changed. So I think that uh, its use in this uh, large tumor, giant tumor, I think it's, um, in my opinion, it's, uh, it's limited because the position changes as you debulk yeah. the tumor. Changing so means, significantly. So it means actually it can be misleading. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it may be misleading. And I don't think it's, um, yeah, I just don't think it's that useful because we know that the facial, I mean, unless, you know, when you have the facial nerve that is located posterior to the tumor, of course, you should be able to, you know, in those very rare cases, it m might be helpful. But if you are not able to see that the facial nerve is located posterior to the tumor, then probably you should not be doing this surgery. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I, you know what I'm saying. But I think I, in I, general, I, you know, I, the change, facial nerve changes during surgery. So that was yes, my I, comment. Yes, I, I agree because very often they give us these the TI images which look quite, uh, quite elegant. But when you come to operate, you sometimes don't even see the facial nerve as a nerve. It is so straight <laughs> out. So straight <laughs> out. It just looks like arachnoid, and wherever you stimulate, you get the you get the uh, physiological response. Yes. So uh, there is no facial nerve as a nerve. It is just a thin, flattened sheet of almost like a sheet of arachnoid. And yes. then you are struggling uh, because you are wondering whether uh, you should because you are still seeing the tumor there attached to it. 
And this is the dilemma where you, you find that any more attempt at removal might uh, endanger the facial now outcome. Yeah, absolutely. But yes. I mean, as you, as you said, I think when you are removing tumor from the facial nerve, the removal, if you want to take it from the facial nerve, the removal should be done, you know, high magnification and should be yes. sharp removal, sharp, sharp. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna, for this uh, useful, useful uh, and useful debate. Uh, debate. Uh, there is any other? Uh, I am just uh, um, only. Uh, Jano. Yes, as Jano. Uh, I uh, thanks uh, Professor Turel for this uh, wonderful uh, educational uh, lecture. I agree this kind of uh, uh, mentality, especially in old people. Now is not so not not so rare. rare to, I mean, to say it's people over the over the age of sixty five or seventy, which last. My, my uh, uh, I think your uh, opinion is the same. Um, when I, I find uh, 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 a young lady or a young woman with a four, or four centimeter uh, acoustic neuroma uh, and compared to an uh, old man, I mean, over than 70, 75, my, um, I mean, my behavior is totally different. In the first case, I tried to remove as much as possible, possibly total removal, of course, sparring in the cranial nervous system. In the, other, in the other situation, I start with, uh, in my mind, I would like to do a generous debugging, as generous as I can, but not completely removal. In this case, I don't know which is your experience. I prefer to wait and see if this kind of uh, or residual of tumor will grow probably better to radio surgery. In case not, I continue to observe. What is your opinion in this case? No, I, I think if you, if you are comfortable with the plane that you are developing between the cranial nerves and the tumor. Uh, I understand uh, uh, elderly age, but physiologically, if he is fine, and if you are capable of handling that uh, complete removal, I would not stop myself. I don't uh, look at age as a consideration, depending, of course, if he has got a poor heart function, if his LVEF is low, uh, uh, then you have to be guided by your anesthetist. But generally, I would not use age as a factor, but physiological condition as a factor. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Luciano. Yes. Can you take over the sure. chairmanship, please? Sure. Uh, we continue with our presentation. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Casper. The lecture is Anatomy for Surgical Management of Posterior Fossa Ventricular Subependymomas. Please, Professor Casper. Thank it's you so connected. much for giving me the platform. Give me one second to. Sure. Um, share the screen. All right, I hope you can all see my screen. Yes. Wonderful. So first of all, I want to say a few words to Keke because uh, it's a great honor for me to contribute to uh, honoring you and uh, <laughs> One of the most wonderful things I have learned in the last decade that I've uh, made this journey with you is that I think uh, you're not just an inspiration to the field, but you're really an inspiration to younger people because you've maintained a curiosity that is really ageless. And it's combined with an incredible diligence to get to the ground of things and find out what is behind all this. And I think you combine it like nobody else with an openness to uh, engage in a conversation a conversation about new concepts, a willingness to share your own knowledge, but also to share the knowledge about things that didn't go so well. And I think you have really created a culture change that is monumental in this field, because we realize only if we talk about the things that didn't go well, we can help in the end the patient with best possible functional outcome. So I really wanna applaud you for your uh, kindness, for your humbleness, and uh, I'm proud to be your friend and be part of this journey. Thank you. So today I want to talk about um, surgery for subependymal lesions of the ventricle. And I know this is a rare topic, but uh, nevertheless, I think we can apply some basic principles to it. I have nothing to disclose other than that I'm part of this uh, fabulous group. And I'm privileged to work in a number of uh, eminent institutions over the last few years. 
I want to take you through uh, pathology, a little bit of epidemiology, and then focus on anatomy and really bring this all together at one particular case uh, that sticks to my mind as my uh, big learning case. So uh, based on pathology, epidumas are glial neoplasms. They really make a small 6% uh, of all gliomas, and hence they are not frequent in our practice. They only make about 1% to 2% of brain tumors in adults and a few more in children. And we don't see a lot of these, and hence not many of us are really writing about them. Morphologically, they recapitulate the cells lining the ventricle, and their key feature is uh, that they show rosettes and perivascular pseudo rosettes, uh, which is always a test on the boards. Amongst ependymomas, subependymoma is only one version. It's a WHO grade one tumor that is considered to be entirely benign. And this one makes up less than 10% of all ependymomas. And hence, you know, it's only 0.1% of all brain tumors that you will ever see. And uh, experience is sort of lacking just by sheer lack of frequency. Age distribution for subependymomas uh, is interesting because it's uh, across all ages, significantly more in adults than in pediatric patients, more in Caucasians than in Afro-Americans and Asians. Mean age of presentation is in the second half of life. Mean age in large studies in SIA was uh, 46 years with a slight male preponderance. The typical presentation here is actually that there isn't one. And I think that is something we need to keep in mind. Uh, most patients remain asymptomatic throughout their entire life. You do find subependymomas in up to 0.5% at autopsy, and they usually come in two groups. There's one group that is P-fossa sitting in the fourth ventricle, and there's a second group that sits in the lateral ventricle. So if these patients present, they come with associated symptoms. Half of the patients present with some form of a headache, which may be related to um, hydrocephalus, and only 20% of patients really show p fossa symptoms. At the time of surgery, two thirds of patients have some form of hydrocephalus. Now, what does it help? What helps us to diagnose these two radiographic features are actually not so easy and not so good. 60% of these tumors, I said, are supratentorial and 40% infratentorial. When you go through the literature, the majority of uh, lesions is either hypo-intense on T1 or iso-intense, but almost all of them are hyper-intense on T2. They're usually quite sharply demarcated from the surrounding tissue, as you can see. They often have small cystic components. Many of them are calcified. The surprising change in the literature in the last few years was that more and more subependymomas have been identified as contrast-enhancing which makes it hard for us to really figure these out before we do the surgeries. Um, contrast enhancement can be rather variable and can be either avid or can be moderate. And some of them show calcifications, as I said. MRS is not helpful in this disease since uh, the peaks are either normal or uh, equivocal. That makes the differential diagnosis of ventricular lesions uh, very broad. And I've talked about this before in this forum. Um, there are lots of choroid plexus lesions that come to mind that can really not be distinguished by imaging either. So pathology is finally what tells you what you are dealing with, usually after the fact. Key is you realize epinomomas are glial neoplasms but behave differently. Subepinomomas are GFAP positive, S100 and EMA VIM positive, and have a low chi -I of less than 3%. And I just quoted some uh, texts here for the uh, fellows to follow up on. Now, I just want to summarize outcome up front to make you realize why this is such a deal. Um, if you summarize the management in the literature and outcomes, one needs to realize the vast majority of these tumors is never symptomatic, and hence these are incidental findings and should be managed expectantly. We do not want to fix the image that we see in someone who was scanned, let's say, after they fell down a set of stairs and we see these tumors. We should really only work on symptomatic patients and not prophylactically. Once symptomatic, many subependymomas can be cured by gross total resection alone. Recurrence is due to subtotal resections but may not occur during their lifetime. Outcome is considered to be excellent, but if you dig into the literature, mortality 30 days in-house is 3%, which is probably location-related. And morbidity is as high as 24% from associated complications, which I'll get to later. 
malignant transformation has never been described, and novel targets may be available for checkpoint inhibitor treatment soon. What I want to emphasize on is that the reported overall survival is greater than 90% at five years, and that makes these patients a walking business card in your district. So you really want to make sure that you are not overdoing your approach and not try to be perfect and fix the image at the expense of morbidity, because these patients are walking business card and will tell your story in the community for years to come. Now, this is a typical case that I want to show you that haunts me. Uh, it's a patient of mine who initially came in 2012. At that time, he was 51, Hispanic patient who only had very mild headaches. And uh, the PCP picked up some gait issues for which he obtained an outside scan. This was the outside scan, which uh, perplexed me because I wasn't sure, is this a typical case? And you see this avidly contrast enhancing lesion in the P fossa at the level of the tonsil. It's uh, affecting one side more than the other. It seems to be infiltrative to the brainstem posteriorly, and there wasn't a good plane around it on T2 images. There were no calcifications, and there were no clear T2 clefts. T2 is my surgical sequence that I work with. So I wasn't quite sure what this would be, but I felt the patient is symptomatic. He is at risk for um, some form of tumor infiltration, worsening. It could be malignant or not. I was guessing it could be differential diagnosis, ependymoma versus scleroma, um, or lymphoma. I needed a tissue diagnosis. I took him to the OR. So what is my classic surgical approach? And I've talked about this in this forum before. It's the midline telovela approach to the fourth ventricle, which allows you to get to this lesion. For fellows and residents, this is the one paper all of you should read. Um, the cerebellum Mary Fisher approach really allows you best access to the fourth ventricle and lateral recess by going through natural planes without cutting any white fiber tracts. It's a beautiful approach. It gives you access to three target areas, the lateral recess, the aqueduct, the mid portion, and the body of the fourth ventricle, as well as the lateral wall. And how do you set up the surgery? Well, surgery is done in the prone position. So it's key that you actually position the patient in flexion at the neck joint. And this is a key for you for opening up your viewing angle. You can uh, position the patient similar to a Chiari, and you can operate uh, top down or from the side of the patient. I'm a right handed surgeon, so I usually stand to the left side of the prone patient, but I operate this just like a Chiari. And recently I've switched occasionally to a three quarters prone position, which helps you uh, for unilateral approaches. Now, this is how this looks. Don't be shy in using uh, preoperative imaging, both for delineation of where the sinus runs, as well as getting your viewing angles right, because good surgery starts at the onset. This is why if you keep that patient in the neutral position, the patient will look uh, straight, but you can only look down at the cervical medullary junction, whereas if the patient is hyperflexed, it opens up your viewing angle nicely into the fourth ventricle up to the aqueduct, and this is the approach of choice. You should always use intraoperative monitoring, and I monitor both cranial nerves as well as uh, sensory evoked potentials and motor evoked potentials, and that uh, makes that surgery very safe. The surgical problem really is how do you get from a midline posterior approach inside the ventricle? And there was recently a nice paper published by Torsten Mehling from uh, Karl Schaller's group in Switzerland in ACTA that just takes you through the anatomical landmarks that you need to recognize in terms of fourth ventricular anatomy. Now, I just want to review key aspects. This starts with the opening. Definitely make a good dural window. You do not want to be restricted here in your access corridor. So <clears throat> midline opening, just like in Akiari, will do just fine. And the key is no damage, minimal damage, uh, because you want to have optimum exposure. Then you want to define the cerebellum official boundaries. And in the end, what you want to accomplish is, I can't see my pointer right now. Um, let me just see where the pointer went. Here it is. You want to accomplish, oops, that you can look into the uh, uvulotonsillar space, so lateral to the vermis. And you want to be able to look into the space between the tonsil and the brain stem. So these two spaces create the cleft for you that you want to open up on both sides. Remember, you're working from posteriorly. So what's in front of you is the roof of the fourth ventricle and the inferior vellum. 
And from there, you want to go laterally to identify the tailor and take it out so that you can unroof the fourth ventricle and just look into it. The only thing you need to remember what's in that area, it's pica and its branches, as well as the veins of the cerebellar medullary fissure. This is a beautiful schematic diagram in Tomasello's uh, paper on the topic, 2015 in World Neurosurgery. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but I'm sure he will agree. The key is to have a good concept prior to surgery. You start in the middle and you work your way up and out at 45 degrees. I put this nicely together a few years ago in a paper that takes you through four key steps of identifying the fissure. First, then you elevate the tonsil. Step three, you open medially from the foramen margin D and you go 45 degrees up and out and you end up at the tibovelar junction. This is how this looks in a cadaveric um, overview from Fessler's book. So find the obex on the foramen, step one, find the tailor, step two, cut the tailor, step three, and open the lateral recess. Then you need to make a decision. How far do you want to open the telovilla junction? And you can do it on both sides for an extensive tumor. But if the tumor is just sitting in the lateral portion, you can actually limit yourself to one side only. Again, there's a beautiful clip in Tomasello's paper that takes you through one superior ependymoma in the fourth ventricle. Uh, I couldn't present a recording, but this is one worthwhile watching. I show you what we did. This is the patient I presented at the beginning of the talk. Um, we were able to do a midline telovilla opening and resect all contrast enhancing material in this case. And we closed it just in a standard fashion with an autographed uh, duroplasty and put a cranioplasty on top. I was convinced this was going to be a good case because intraoperatively, there were no um, mitoses. It was identified as some form of ependymoma. And I was happy. The patient was happy. Clinically, there were no neurological deficits postoperatively until recently. What was unusual to me is we followed this patient, uh, as we all recommend, with annual surveillance MRI scans. And in 2020, my neuro-oncologist picked up there was suddenly a contrast-enhancing spot in the peduncle. We were a little bit surprised because after a lag period of eight years, how would this happen? And we hadn't heard about malignant transformation. So we said, we just need to close and image the patient more frequently. And I'm glad that I did because within a year, we suddenly developed this massive contrast enhancing mass that was now filling the cerebellar peduncle on the ipsilateral side. And I was wondering, you know, is this still the same pathology or did we maybe miss it at the beginning? And it was a mixed glioma rather than a subependymoma. So what approach would we take at this point? Well, luckily enough in 2020, we can get a lot more fancy imaging. So in addition to pre-surgical CTAs, which you can see on the left side, uh, showing calcifications as well as significant pica supply to the contrast enhancing portion of the lesion, we could get DTIs. And the DTIs in the middle showed us that all the important tracts in blue here is the motor tract were nicely displaced medially and to the contralateral side and even the intrapontine lesions were not affected. The modern imaging allows you to flip it in a tumble mode so you can put the patient into the surgical position on the screen and see how would I get there best. And on the right lower panel, you can see this allows you to just come in from one side and take the tumor out just posterior to the motor fibers. So I decided I take this patient back now for a unilateral telovelar approach as nicely described by Walter Jean in 2003, which allows you to just lift up one tonsil. And why did I pick this approach? Because I wanted to avoid that I'm running into all the adhesions and I possibly cause retractor related injury just by opening this previous craniotomy. And I think that was a good decision. We were able to achieve a near total resection again in a highly complicated tumor, but I wasn't able to take it all out. There's a portion that is stuck to the mid portion of the brainstem. On the right upper panel, you can see there's a small portion that is highly vascular and supplied by some vessels that I just could not peel off this uh, cerebellar peduncle. So in the spirit of avoiding complications, I thought if this still is benign disease, and intraoperatively, my pathologist said this remains a completely benign tumor. I would not go after the final bit of the tumor and try to fix the image. I decided I want to fix the patient because he, he got 10 years out of the last operation. Now, 
the saga continued. And this is the slide that I just put in there for Kiki because this patient had perfect surgery with only hiccups after a second highly complicated surgery, but he got every single complication you can otherwise uh, not ask for afterwards. So he came in during COVID. We did the surgery, he left the hospital with a hiccup only, and then he contracted COVID and came back. He came back and almost died because he developed significant side effects with DVTs and PEs needed to be anticoagulated, then developed a pneumonia. Pneumonia turned into sepsis. We tried to treat him for the sepsis. He developed acute kidney injury from the antibiotics we had picked without knowing that he wouldn't tolerate it. He then developed four weeks later a wound infection that I think came from the sepsis because he was perfect before. And uh, um, surprisingly, we nursed him for two and a half months intubated through COVID with acute kidney failure on all the necessary medications, but then he didn't wake up. And we were really surprised, why didn't he wake up after a perfect operation until we decided to rescan him? And we were surprised to find significant hydrocephalus that had developed possibly from proteinaceous exudate or from post-inflammatory changes of the surgical bed. We were able to place a shunt. He still didn't wake up because the shunt wasn't the right one we had picked. We had picked a programmable shunt but we had a siphoning device in there and that was just too high a resistance to drain him. So I ordered a special valve without an outflow resistance. We took the siphoning device out. And at this point, he has been shunted, has woken up and is back to normal. And I wanna tell you that this is a really important story for me because it is worth pursuing active care to the maximum of what medicine allows us in a patient who has no reason to pass away from a operation that otherwise worked out quite well. So conclusions, interventricular surgery is very doable even in complex setting. It's actually also fun. Think inside the box, but you do need to know your anatomy in high real estate areas and be safe with your approaches. Don't try to fix the images, try to fix the patient only as much as needed in benign disease. Think outside the box and be versatile with your approach. So here, I didn't do the same thing I did in the first operation because I just felt good about it. I actually decided to modify my approach and do less. And yes, I think it was rewarding and the patient did well. We have written this up in a number of different papers. And this is one where we revisited the table wheeler approach for those who are interested in. And I thank you for your attention. Many thanks. Luciano, Luciano, yeah. may, uh, Luciano may I interrupt you? Sure. Uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Pablo Gonzalez. He has to leave soon. So let him have his presentation. And we defer the question and discussion at the end of the session. Okay? Sure, of course. So yeah. we'll get Pablo. Yeah. Yeah. So next presentation by Professor Gonzalez Lopez is around complications, lack of preoperative planning, and anatomical study. Please, Professor Gonzalez. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry, Ek, I, I thank you all for allowing me to do this because I have a patient waiting for um, the compression. And uh, well, let, let me start saying that this is uh, uh, something that I, I feel very happy of. And we have been together for 25 months right now uh, since we started these uh, webinars. And this is the 17th we have been running together. And uh, But probably this is the most special one for me. Uh, because we are honoring someone who I consider my, my big brother. Uh, Professor Keki Turel has been an exceptional and is an exceptional source of inspiration since I really met him. So indeed, this, this uh, talk I have prepared, I, I started working on it uh, four years ago because he asked me to, to do so. So I, I feel very privileged to be here uh, today. Uh, let me start uh, saying you how we... Uh, uh, take care of our complications and how we collect them. Uh, we have a, an uh, online uh, database, which is completely uh, private, and we, we record absolutely every single complication following the Clavian Dindo classification. And uh, this is how we do it. Uh, whenever we have a complication, we just go to the, to the database and record it. And uh, we record the date, we record the clinical history, the patient's name, the images, 
the result, uh, the doctor responsible for this patient, the kind of complication, and if it's a surgical or non-surgical complication, if the patient needed a uh, resurgery on the grid of the, the score of the clavian tindo, and then we have some comments about the patient. So this is how our uh, residents are uh, summarizing and recording all our complications. And these are our, our numbers, which are quite impressive indeed. And since January 2012, which is 10 years now, we have almost 3,000 complications. And uh, this is probably the most important uh, way in which uh, we learn from our mistakes. And uh, this is a summary of our monthly uh, morbid mortality committee uh, uh, summary in which we try to record absolutely all the complications and we discuss the complications we had the previous month uh, for almost two hours every every month. For example, this is one of the com uh, morbid mortality committees we had a few weeks ago regarding the month of May. So as you can see, we record all this data and we discuss every single case to try to improve in the, in the next ones. But uh, I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit on complications due to uh, an inadequate application of anatomy uh, and uh, how it can uh, affect uh, the surgical result, uh, a bad surgical planning. So we can have brain edema, scissors, hemorrhages, cerebral ischemia, infections, CSF leak, and other kind of complications because of a bad surgical planning. All of them are potentially responsible for a postoperative neurological deficit and a worsening in the quality of life of, of our patients. So this is uh, something that I consider really important regarding uh, surgical planning, and we have to take care of all these uh, specific uh, points once we are choosing the most appropriate uh, surgical approach. And all of them, all of these points, I consider them very, very important. Let me start with this case. And that, uh, sorry. We had uh, in June 20. Uh, 15. Uh, I, I just arrived to Alicante a couple of years before and I, I met this patient, but obviously she decided to go to, to a big city in Spain to, uh, to get an operation. And uh, a couple of years uh, later, she came back uh, to, the, uh, to, to my hospital and she referred that the surgery was really difficult. And the, the page, the, the, the sergeant told her that it was a very bleeding uh, tumor and that uh, it was growing very fast. So she, so she needed a reoperation. But it was a, a curious case because it, this is clearly a vestibular schwannoma that was uh, not completely resected. And I, I, I could see from the MRI that uh, the patient had a, a transabrintine approach. So studying the case carefully we can uh, understand uh, what could have happened because I, I didn't have access to the records. But if you have a look at this uh, augmented image, we can see that this patient had a high jugular bulb, which is something that we have to really study before uh, deciding uh, the kind of the approach we, we want to, to go through. So this is relatively uh, quite common uh, anatomical variation that we should consider before choosing a translabyrinthine approach or even before drilling the lateral wall of the internal acoustic meatus. And finally, we went uh, to a retrosigmoid, uh, common retrosigmoid craniotomy uh, in this case, which was uh, quite, quite comfortable to, to, to be performed. And uh, this is the first message I, I got from my dad. Uh, it's important to be honest uh, with your patients and then you will become honest with yourself. But another important thing uh, uh, before choosing uh, our surgical approach is important not only to consider where the tumor is located, where the fitting is coming from, but as you have discussed in the first part of this uh, session, to understand the bridging veins and uh, to optimize the size of the craniotomy. So this was the result of this case. Uh, we operated on uh, in our hospital and uh, we had this terrible uh, venous infarct and this brain edema because of the coagulation of uh, two draining bridging veins in the superior sagittal sign. So important to decide that we need an, an extensive uh, craniotomy in order to decide which window we should go through. And in this case, the mistake was choosing the wrong side uh, to perform the craniotomy and also to coagulate uh, a bridging vein which was draining to, to a superior uh, sagittal sinus. So how we should uh, uh, optimize our interim spheric approach, first of all, we have to understand that some of these bridging veins are entering the dura before they reach the midline. So in these cases, we create some windows and we respect these veins. We leave a, a layer of 
of, of Dura covering them. And then we have two windows to work in or when we can approach them uh, to the interim aesthetic fissure, we can we should try to uh, remove and uh, cut the arachnoid so as to create as much space as necessary in order not to damage these breaching veins. Another important case, I, I learned a lot from uh, uh, this acoustic shanoma, vestibular shanoma. And uh, this is the message I, I, I took, travel some uh, bleeders often hide into the corners. And uh, at the beginning of surgery, I was drilling the internal acoustic meatus and I made a big mistake of leaving a cotonoid inside. So this is what happened. And I drilled, I took some of this uh, cotonoid and uh, we had this disaster. A uh, distal branch of the ICA uh, was ruptured. So we were trying to uh, coagulate it. I, this, this was at the beginning of surgery. So you can imagine how mad I, I became, but it was my terrible mistake. This was uh, the last time uh, I was using cottonoids, but finally we could manage and uh, we could do a, a nice resection. Luckily, the patient was doing quite nice despite this huge infarct she had in the cerebellum, but a few months later she was feeling uh, very well. But this is something I, I really learned. And as Professor Tudel told me, I got this fantastic message uh, from him. We have to create as much exposure as, as necessary. This is another case. It was a, a slit uh, ventricle in which we tried to rescue the patient and we tried to do a uh, ventriculostomy, endoscopic third ventriculostomy. So we were crossing the foramen of Monroe. We could see the floor of the third ventricle, but this is what happened with our endoscope. Uh, we completely damaged the fornix. And this was a mistake due to the bad understanding, not only of the anatomy, but especially of the instruments we are using. So this is the uh, ventriculoscope we are using. We don't have a mirror. So we went ahead without understanding what was happening behind us. So the blue segment is representing what we can see, but we still have a couple of millimeters more through which we have our working channel that are out of our control. So very important to be aware of this, of this point. This is another case in which uh, we have an intraoperative uh, complication. This is a, a huge uh, operculo insular uh, glioma affecting to the temporal lobe, to the frontal orbitary gyri, gyrus rectus, and the whole insula. So we decided to do a temporal lobectomy, a transopercular approach, and then finally a subpial resection of the insular component. So this is the terrenal approach. Right side terrenal approach, we start draining CSF to relax the brain, and then we start our temporal lobectomy. So this is the posterior part of the insula, which is nicely exposed there. That's the temporal horn. So after the lobectomy, you can see the tentorian cestura with P1, P2, and the midbrain. And then we move to the opercular component. So that's the insula. We leave it for the, for the end of the surgery. It was covered by two layers of arachnoid, obviously. So now we start our transopercular approach and we wanted to reach the midline because the gyrus rectus was also invaded so this is the a2 both a2s arteries running upwards through the genu of the corpus callosum and now we were moving posteriorly and at this point we were experiencing some uh, problems with the motor evoc potential so the patient was losing uh, strength in the contralateral hemibody and this is what happened we can have many different causes but in order to understand what was going on, I decided to use the ICG to see if we had some problem, uh, some vascular problem, because the deficit was quite progressive in a few minutes. So what we saw is that we had a, a stop in one of the uh, M1, M2 branches. So this is what happened. We had a vasospasm in that important artery, which was uh, uh, feeding the motor area of the cortex. So with nimodipine, intraoperative nimodipine with topic massage, uh, we released the vasospasm and luckily in 10 minutes, the motor revoke res uh, response uh, started to, to, to improve and we kept uh, going with, with surgery. So this is how we do it now in insular gliomas whenever we do transylvian or even a transopercular approach. So I wanted to, to show that case because it is said that with the transopercular approaches, the passus passem is something uncommon, but I have experience in my, in my short experience. And uh, even in transylvian or transopercular, we are using right now nimodipine almost during uh, every step of surgery whenever we are dealing with, with the vessels. So in this case, this was a transylvian approach. So we started 
resecting and debulking the, the core of the tumor. But as you can understand, we were uncovering these M2 and M3 branches. So we were irrigating with nimodipine. And whenever we have one of these arteries completely free, you can see the long perforators, we cover them with spongostan or whatever, and we irrigate it with nimodipine. So this is how we are trying to, uh, to beat uh, these, these problems. Another case, uh, which was a, a nightmare for myself, this is a, a 47 years old male who was a, a bus school uh, driver, and he had this tumor who I operated on four times. And the only thing uh, he wanted to, uh, to, to, kept, to keep doing was working. So he had no seizures, he had a perfect visual uh, field, but after the fourth surgery, he had this uh, tremendous hemianopia and he was really, really, really sad. So uh, we did this under awake uh, conditions uh, for language mapping, but I, I was not uh, controlling uh, the optic radiations. So since that case, we tried to develop an interoperative uh, campimetry uh, system which was implemented uh, six years ago. And what we are doing once we are reaching the deep areas, we are using this interoperative campimetry in which we can check where the patient is looking at. So we are discarding uh, uh, those responses in which the patient is not looking at the center of the image. And once we are stimulating the optic radiations, he is experiencing this escodromas. So we know that we don't want to go through. With this interoperative complementary, we can uh, implement a new tool in order to preserve function of our patients. This is another case I, I will never forget. Uh, we were discussing this case with the oncologist. It was it was a metastasis in the in the temporal lobe, in the left temporal lobe. But uh, the day before surgery, I always do a preoperative MRI, and we saw this new spot right here in the. Uh, frontal lobe. So I decided without asking the oncologist to go for uh, both uh, lesions in one shot. So I started with a big, uh, with a big one, the parhypocampal gyrus, just as you can see, medial to the collateral sulcus. So septemporal exposure, uh, the metastasis uh, came out nicely. We were checking that there was no remnant there. And then we moved to a small frontal craniotomy but obviously brain shift affected the neural navigation. So we were using the echo to localize in between these two veins, this is small metastasis. The patient was uh, anti-aggravated. Obviously we stopped anti-aggravation, antiplatelets uh, drugs uh, five days before, but this was the result. Uh, we had a tremendous subdural hematoma that night and we went uh, directly to the OR but this was a result with a terrible uh, uh, result because the patient finally died uh, the next day. So this is something that I learned. Uh, it's it's much better to try to to follow your your uh, principles and uh, whenever uh, this is what uh, Ramesh Kirolos uh, uh, told me sometimes the lesser the indication, the greater will be the complication. And I experienced that in this in this case. So this is another interesting case. Uh, it was a trigeminal neuralgia. As you can see, there is a uh, compression of the trigeminal nerve. As you can see in this T2 volumetric image. So we decided to drill the supramiatal tubercle because it was obscuring uh, uh, the, 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 the distal part of the trigeminal nerve. So with the 30 degrees endoscope, we can see nicely how this vein is compressing the trigeminal nerve. So we needed uh, to create some space. So that's why we drilled the supramiatal tubercle, and we were able to perform the surgery directly with the microscope. So we introduced the teflon, and we always try to, to check it again with the endoscope. So we saw that, uh, that the compression was good enough, and indeed the patient uh, went quite quite well. She, she had no pain after surgery, but you can start seeing what I'm going to show you next day, I went to her room, and this is what I found. Uh, this is obviously a joke, but uh, uh, we saw uh, some rhinorrhea, and the patient was experiencing some hypoacusia. So I did a CT scan, and we saw that the supramatal tubercle was highly uh, pneumatized, and we had a CSF flick. So we went to the OR directly, same day, and we sealed these small holes I created in the supramatal tubercle. First of all, with bone wax, then we use uh, muscle, autologous muscle, and uh, a layer, thin layer of spongostan. 
and uh, I was pretty sure that the problem was fixed. But again, next day, three days later, indeed, the patient started again with rhinorrhea. And uh, I, I checked uh, a new CT scanning, which I saw that the flow was even uh, bigger uh, through the supramedial tubercle, and even the mastoid air cells were full of CSF. So finally, I decided to place a, a LP uh, shunt, and the patient was discharged with no problems. But three important complications in one same patient because I did not perform a preoperative CT scan before surgery and I did not study properly the anatomy of the of the petrous bone in this, this case. This is another one in which I removed nicely this trigeminal uh, schonoma, but we were not careful enough with the GSPN, so we were probably uh, pushing the uh, geniculoid ganglion and the fascial nerve and we damaged the, the, the patient uh, with, this, with this subtemporal exposure. So it's important again, to try to perform an intradural dissection when we are doing uh, the pre and subtemporal dissection in order to try to preserve this GSPN and to leave the GSPN attached to the floor of the middle fossa. So in these cases, nowadays, uh, what I learned is that it's much better and much safer. I identify, first of all, the middle meningeal artery. I cut it, coagulate it, seal it, and then I start my intradural dissection at that point because I know that the GSPN is going to be medial to it so we can perform a safer surgery in, this, in these cases. The patient nowadays, she was doing quite nice, but 24 hours later, she had this uh, small problem due to the uh, uh, soster virus. And this is another case, uh, 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 pituitary adenoma, in which uh, six hours after surgery, she was not doing well. And we checked with a CT scan that she had a tremendous bleeding, and it was because of the placement, bad placement of a nasogastric tube, which was crossing completely, literally, uh, the brain of this patient. And this is something that uh, it's not, luckily, it's not something common because this is one of the most terrible complications we can have after uh, this kind of surgeries. And uh, obviously, we knew that uh, it's forbidden, but uh, in the ICU, the nurse at that night was not familiar with this. And uh, she did a, a terrible mistake that uh, uh, we were very, very unhappy about. And this is the last case. And uh, we did not commit a direct uh, complication uh, to, the, to this patient. Uh, she's a, actually, she's, she's a doctor in my hospital. She came with headache, GS, GCS 14 at 1 p.m. And uh, in the meeting, uh, we decided to observe her to perform an MRI. But uh, I was on call that night and I got a call at 2 a.m. that the patient was in a very, very uh, uh, bad neurological status. She was intubated, came to the ICU, and we had this meningioma, petrous bone meningioma, with this tremendous bleeding. So we went uh, at 2 a.m. Uh, to the OR and we uh, tried to optimize as much as possible the intracranial pressure medication to release uh, pressure. But as you can see, it was bulging the cerebellum. I could not create a space even to go to the cisterns. So after trying and trying to, to reach the cisterna magna, I was not able. So I tried to, to attack the tumor, to vascularize it, and to, to, to compress it. But it was really impossible. So this is the problem I, I created. It was bulging the cerebellum. So something I, I had to do at that time was to use the QSAT to remove partially the hemisphere, which was uh, severely being herniated, and after removing partially this lateral and petrous part of the cerebellum, I, I could attack directly this meningioma and devascularize it. It was quite, quite hard, but with the QSA, we could finally manage and with scissors and the knife. And finally, we, we could take it out. She had a six cranial nerve palsy. She had a difficult postoperative status. But nowadays, I'm very happy when I'm walking through the through the beach and I, I see her with her husband walking there and uh, she's doing a quite, quite normal life. She's not working anymore, but she's doing nice. So that was all, I guess. And just to summarize, complications are an intrinsic feature of our job. Uh, therefore, we must think about, give our best to avoid, and, but finally accept them and most importantly, learn from them. So thank you so much. Uh, I have seen Keki uh, in this situation for the last uh, 25 months, but I really prefer to see him in person. So hopefully we will meet soon in the near future. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Gonzalez. This is a very interesting topic. So as far as I understand, 
seems to be that complications are errors of surgeons. What do you mean? What do you think? Well, it, they can be, obviously, they can be. And uh, but most of them, indeed, I, I believe that we as doctors try to give our best always. And uh, this is nature of, uh, of our soul. So many of them are not errors of the surgeon, but problems that could happen, uh, even giving our best to, to avoid them. But obviously, we can always improve and, and learn from them. Totally agree. Totally agree. Other questions? Other I, Luciano, Luciano, I think we have to relieve him to go to his case. Uh, the compressive cranotomy cannot wait. Yeah. So he should go and we ask the question for uh, Professor Eckhart because uh, we did not discuss his paper. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, Pablo. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. We have to discuss the, the lecture of Professor Casper. This was another nice lecture on anatomy of the. Uh, of the approach in the posterior fossa following the, the pica artery. So the telovelar approach is uh, essential to know the anatomy. Some questions around this topic. So someone has to ask something to Professor Casper. So it seems to be very clear. Hmm. No doubt. So in this case, I can go on. I, I don't know if you agree, Imat. I yeah. can go on with the... Yeah, go ahead. And uh, just to let you know, Dr. Subeh finished his surgery. He's with us on the podium. Oh. So you, you decide about the sequence as a chair. I can sure. uh, either himself or Henry to start, and then he can follow Henry. Yeah. So we go on with the next uh, lecture. Professor Schroeder, the complication of microvascular decompression in the treatment of hemifacial spasm. Uh, Henry, please. Yeah, hello, everybody. Again, thanks for this kind invitation and the initiative of, of Imad and to honor Kiki. And of course, when I was thinking about the topic, when we have Kiki in our panel, it must be about complications, no question. And that's why I thought I talk about our complications and microvascular decompression for hemifacial spasm. moving yeah okay yes yeah okay so of course prevention is better than treatment that is what we have heard today accurate planning of the approach is very important but sometimes <clears throat> we overlook something or sometimes the disease itself has its own problems even if you are very careful you will not deal with it because it's unexpected for example so when we do microvascular decompression, of course, we need a good imaging so, what, so to see what we can expect. You see here is a loop of a pica compressing the facial nerve at the brainstem. We always make additionally a tough sequence to differentiate between veins and arteries. And with this setting, you have a good idea about what you uh, expect. Then we always do a retrosigmoid approach. It's a small inferior retrosigmoid approach guiding you to the lower cranial nerve group. So the opening is uh, just a small craniotomy. And then what I want to stress is to use the endoscope because the endoscope gives you much more <clears throat> visualization of the anatomy. You can better see hidden areas, especially if the compression is down in the medullary pontine sulcus. And then of course we have monitoring for the facial nerve and acoustic work potentials. And you see, we don't turn the head very much to avoid venous congestion. Instead, we have the, uh, the um, uh, support of the chest and the pelvis, and then we turn the whole table, sometimes up to 30 degrees, and that gives you a good view into that area. Lateral spreads are monitored to see whether our decompression is successful. You see, this is a typical lateral spread. It's the beginning of the surgery, and what we see after it, the spread should be gone completely if possible. So what are complications? There was a night review of Mark Sindhu published some years ago, and they looked at all the uh, publications and calculated all the complications together. And then they reviewed altogether 82 papers, over 10,000 patients, and they found 
a certain rate of permanent complication like facial palsy, recurrence, hearing loss, lower cranial nerve problems, his athletic stroke, and mortality. But if you look at the numbers, uh, MVD is a quite safe procedure. <clears throat> also, Sami reported his experience in 2002. There were 143 patients, and they found <clears throat> a recurrence rate of 7%, mortality of 0.7, hearing loss in 8%, and, and vertical in 3%. So there are some complications we have to expect. <clears throat> this is our series evaluated some months ago. There were 458 surgical procedures and 431 patients. <clears throat> Eight patients had first surgery at another hospital, but we also had our own uh, recurrences. There were uh, 260 females, 170 males, mean age was 55 years. And what is obvious, neurologists sent patients too late. So the mean duration of the symptoms was eight years. <clears throat> and interesting also, most of the, of the compressions were on the left side, not on the right side. So the offending vessels were a variety of combinations of arteries, sometimes with veins. Most frequent vessel was pica and ica. And then a combination of both. And what was interesting, we had also patients, they had just arachnoid bands. So it's not always a vascular compression which causes uh, hemifacial um, hemi spasm. Also sometimes tumors, epidermoid tumors can do the same symptoms. <clears throat> it's not always a vessel. So when we look at our results, immediately after surgery, we have a complete resolution of spasm in 56 patients. 90% improvement means it's, it's very rare that they have um, <clears throat> spasms maybe once a day or very slight that you don't even can see it. So this is considered to be a very good result. And then you see after one year, we have about 90% of patients which have a very good result and a little bit more increase later on. So sometimes the resolution of symptoms lasts more than one year. The one patient we had in our series, he took more than two years to get a complete a resolution of the spasms. So the recommendation to make early surgery, which was published by a Chinese colleague, we cannot support with our data because sometimes there is really no compression of the vessel because we make a, a sling technique. And nevertheless, it takes sometimes many months until the nerve recovers. So recurrence is one problem. You see, this is one example. You see here, uh, the ICA loop compressing the facial nerve. What we do, we put Teflon in between, so it's a good decompression, patient was doing fine. And then after some time, she starts again with, uh, with problems, did not improve. So we make a second surgery, we looked at it, and you see it's a, it's good decompression. There's no contact between the artery and the, and the nerve. But what is the problem? It must be the Teflon itself. So that's why we removed all Teflon down to the pontometary sulcus. The vessel itself is now uh, attached to the dura because of scar formation. So it will not fall back. And immediately after the surgery, the patient is completely free of spasms. So sometimes the Teflon itself causes irritation to the nerve. It's not, it's not frequent, but sometimes it happens. And when you make a revision, we did it in 25 cases altogether. We have very good result in 18%, but in some patients, no improvement. And that is because the nerve is already damaged. It's severely damaged as a really a grooving in the nerve and then it might not resolve. So what is the best position of the Teflon? If you see this here, this is the facial nerve. You see the grooving here, vertebral and pica. What we do, we try to place the Teflon in front and behind the nerve to leave the nerve completely alone. So that is the best if the compression site is not touched by anything. <clears throat> Sometimes not possible because of anatomy. Another problem what we uh, found is yes, a fistula. Pablo has already told about it. Sometimes it starts late, but most of the time it's early. So before the patient is discharged, you see the leakage. And then in six cases, we make a revision. In six cases, we make a lumbar drain. What was the reason for the CSF fistula? It was not that the surgeon did not get a closure. It was frequently obese people. And old people, you know, sometimes the dura is very thin. It's like, like a very thin paper. And then it's hard to make a watertight closure. And then the patient are sneezing, pressing, and then this might occur. Facial palsy is another problem. 
we had 10 immediate pauses because of the dissection. Some were minor, but some were really severe. And most of the cases, it was a very, very large artery. You see the megadolical vertebralis. If you want to dissect this from the facial nerve, of course, there is a lot of manipulation of the facial nerve. You see, this is a facial nerve. This is a vestibular cochlear nerve. And you see this big vessel. And of course, you can imagine when you start to dissect, there's a lot of manipulation to get this vessel mobilized. What is more frequent, or what is a good thing, most of them recovered well. We have just one patient with a house Bragman grade three facial palsy. The other ones, I think, are acceptable. But what is more frequent is the late facial palsy, typically occurring 10 days after surgery. And, and you see, sometimes it's minor, but many of them have total palsy. Nobody knows exactly what is the reason. Many people suspect that it's a herpes simplex virus infection but we collected in some of the patients, CSF, sent for investigation, and they don't find anything. So then people say, this virus is just in the nerve, it's not in the CSF. So nobody knows exactly what is it, but maybe it's a virus infection. The good thing is, <clears throat> after a while, the uh, facial palsy is completely reversible. Even if you don't do anything, some patients received uh, antiviral treatment, but most of them do nothing and it is resolving. Lower cranial nerve deficits may occur because of intense manipulation. This was a guy, he had almost a permanent spasm. When I saw him initially, I thought this is not a hemifacial spasm, but this is a kind of facial dystonia because he has this continuous tonic contraction of the facial nerve. And then after a while, he starts to get some short period of clonic spasms. So this is then very likely, yeah, you see it, that is also a hemifacial spasm, but very, very severe symptoms. I mean, he's, he's driving the car, the eyes closing, he was really uh, causing a lot of problems. And if you look here, you see the vertebral and you see here, the pica, and you see the pica loop goes up far into the pontine area. So this is a severe compression, very located very far medially. So to expose this, we have to open the arachnoid over the lower cranial nerves. And then I tried to dissect the vessel, but it's, with a microscope, you couldn't see it. So you see, I, I look over the lower cranial nerves and you see the plexus here, but I couldn't see. With a 45 degree endoscope, you see it's far medially in the pontometary sulcus coming from below, going into the pontine area here exactly at the sulcus. So it was very difficult to visualize because it's so far medially. So, and then I dissected below the lower cranial nerves and you see this is a branches, the cranial branches of the accessory nerve containing the fibers for the larynx and have to manipulate a lot. This is the origin of the pica. And then I looked, nothing happened. The vessel is still there. So I went back to this area and then I mobilized the vessel but there was a lot of dissection of the lower cranial nerves, which is causing the problem. And then I could take the loop of the, of the piker when I go over the lower cranial nerves. Now I could get it with a dissector and I could mobilize the vessel out from the brainstem and put some Teflon. And then after the surgery, he had hoarseness. Hemifacial spasm improved 30% at discharge, 50% improvement, and the hoarseness resolved only after six months. So it is a problem, but finally he was happy because he was completely free of the spasm, but it took some time. So I had another patient with the same compression you see here. It also goes far to the brain stem. So that time I used the endoscope, I fixed it with a 45 degree endoscope. Looking down to the sulcus, you see with a microscope, I tried to visualize it, but I could not see. I had so much retraction that the acoustic work potentials decreased. So I stopped and I took the endoscope. And now you see the vertebral artery here. And you see this is a pica origin, exactly the same finding what we had in the other patient. This is hypoglossal nerve running over the origin of pica. And then under endoscopic visualization with a curved dissector, I was able to dissect the vessel out of the brainstem. And that, of course, is much less invasive. It's not so much manipulation, 
of the nerves and was obviously the right um, decision. So my major complication is a perforator infarction. This usually should not happen. Why did it happen? See, the vertebral artery and the pica compressing the left nerve. When we look in with an endoscope, you see again, hypoglossal nerve, pica origin, vertebral artery, and here's the facial nerve. This is again a view with a 45 degree endoscope. And I mobilized the pica, and, but there was too much pressure. So I thought it's better to make a sling to move the vertebral away. And there is a lot of space between skull base and the vertebral, so it seems to be a reasonable option. So I put this Gore-Tex sling. Sometimes I use a Teflon sling. Teflon sling is better because it has no sharp edges. edges. But here I took it, I fixed it with the aneurysm clip to the skull base, and you see it looks very good. It's far away, and then it was easy to decompress the pica. And then after, after the surgery, she had swallowing problems. And we make immediately an MRI. And you see in the diffusion weighted imaging, this is the result of a perforator injury, infarction in the medulla. Fortunately, after six months, she recovered. She has a little bit dizziness, but she can walk. She is ambulant. She can swallow. She has no trachostoma, no gastric tube. No, she, everything is quite good. Spasm is gone, but this should not happen. But why did it happen? You see, this is the perforator before the sling. And this is the sling. And you see, it's squeezing the origin, occluding the perforator. But I did not. I did not look at it. I, there was no bleeding. Nothing. I thought the sling is be be um, uh, above the origin of the perforator. Nothing will happen. But because this is a very uh, thick material with a firm edge, this causes the uh, occlusion of the perforator. So this should not happen. What can we do when we have it again? So when we now put a sling, I always look is the perfusion of the perforators which are close to it okay or not? And we use the ICG angiography uh, for this. So this is a case, again, you see the tubal artery here. Another Ica pica is a complex, this is a vein running here. So we dissect it, the arachnoid, and you see this is a, the tubal artery. So we put some Teflon to keep it away and have a good transposition. Then again, we take Gore-Tex sling, bring it up. And I always look now to the perforators that they are not close. If they are very close, I don't place a sling anymore. But then the risk is very high. But if they are far away, Think it's still a good option because you get really a very good decompression. So I make a cut in the dura over the petrous bone in between internal arterial canal and jugular foramen. And then I place a clip. And then I look here, there's one perforator. And then I make the angiography and you see there is a delayed filling. It's not coming very easily. So I release a little bit the sling to give more space. And then again, perforator looks better now. And it makes the angiography. And you see now it comes very early. Same like here. So I think this might help to avoid this complication. So we had 46 uh, MVDs by sling technique. And in one, we have this complication. So complication rate of 2%. But it's too much, should not happen. It was my, my fault. That is another patient has a hemorrhage because of myocardial infarction day after surgery 73 year old yet over the previous mvds had still problems so we make a surgery everything went well she was good and then he developed on the icu myocardial infarction and the cardiologist said we have to make dual antiplatelet therapy there's no choice because they put a stent so we gave it and then he bled get the hydrocephalus one or icu took a long time i did i thought he will not survive and he developed hydrocephalus. We put the shunt in uh, one and a half year after surgery. 
And then he came to my office two years later and he was doing fine. He brought an MRI and he was very happy that the spasm was gone. So this was a lucky cause. And the final complication, what I showed you was the most severe was a herpes encephalitis. That is very unusual. That was a 74 year old female, had a typical hemifacial spasm, complex compression. We did the decompression with um, uh, Teflon and she was really fine, went home. And our and, um, one week after the surgery, the daughter called me, said she is not doing well. I said she should go to the local uh, neurosurgical service. She was uh, from the south of Germany, and it's probably a meningitis. And then he was investigated, said, no, no need for a lumbar puncture, no meningitis. And they sent her back. And then three days later, she deteriorated, <clears throat> and she was sent again. And then they put a, 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 a ventricular drain, and they looked for the uh, problem and it was a herpes simplex but it was 10 days it was too late they made treatment but you see the severe encephalitis on both sides and finally she died after the surgery so this was very very sad but it's very rare the colleagues there make the literature research it's very rare that after craniotomy you get a herpes encephalitis but it must be related to the surgery similar to the late facial palsy which might also be related by um, uh, the viruses. So this is our post-op complications. What we had, we had 3% meningitis, CSF fistula, hearing loss was frequent. Mainly it was a conductive hearing loss because of CSF, facial palsy 8%, vertigo, hoarseness. And when you look to the permanent mobility, it was one case, 0.2%, hyperacusis. Anacusis in 3% of the patients, usually patients with mega dolicho vertebral artery and um, hearing loss in elderly patients. They come with presbyacusis before vertigo and hoarseness. So it's, it is some complications occur, but if you take the whole number of patients, I think it's a safe technique. Supine position is important, careful sharp dissection, infrafollicular uh, approach to avoid stretching of the vestibular cochlear nerve and no retractors. Because of this positioning, we don't need any retractors. Monitoring is essential. And of course, special attention should be given when you use the sling technique. Thank you for attention, Kiki, and I congratulate for your achievements to bring the complications more in the focus of neurosurgeons. Many thanks, dear Henry. I don't know if someone has questions for Professor Schroeder. Uh, I have one. Do you use the ABR? during this kind of surgery, the MBD, ABL. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. acoustic award potentials we'd always uh, use. You use? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you see then sometimes if you retract too much, you see immediately there is a decrease of the amplitude or increase of the latency. Yes, we always do. Yeah, thanks. Other questions? Everybody tired, it's late. <laughs> Imad, let's go on with the uh, next lecture or you prefer to anticipate i mean to 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 have the lecture of professors bay it's up to you i cannot hear you uh, you are Imad? muted yeah you are mute sorry i think dr brahim we will privilege him he was the whole day in surgery he has to give his presentation and I'll leave if you, Dr. Moody uh, does not mind. Of course, please go ahead. Uh, bye. So, uh, do you want to present him, uh, uh, Imad, or? Well, uh, Ibrahim, he is the one <laughs> of our, uh, he's a very close friend. He is in a start uh, neurosurgeon known to everybody uh, worldwide. He was a uh, first uh, vice president of the World Federation. He has been the pan Arab President of uh, Arab Society, Jordanian Society, he took many posts and he's a great educator. He ran his own webinar. And now we have another uh, Subayh family with us. Uh, his daughter became a neurosurgeon trained uh, by Professor Sami. And uh, he's talking now on uh, phycotentorial, but next time she will join the vestibular schwannoma with the Sami's group. Okay. I think that's the presentation, Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for uh, your kind invitation. Hello, my friends. I'm sorry I could not join you earlier on. Uh, I was in theater. Uh, my talk is about Falcon internal in German, but before uh, giving this presentation, I'd like to speak about Kiki, whom I knew for the last more than 25 years. Everywhere you go to any place in the world, you will find him there. Uh, he had in, at the end of one of the meetings and, uh, at the gala dinner, he went to sleep. Um, we went everywhere together. He's a close friend. He's a, a great man. Uh, he visited Jordan many, many times. And uh, as I said, uh, he's really a friend, a colleague, a brother. And most of all, he's a, he's, he's a family. Here in Jordan, he was watching the gladiators in, in Amman. And uh, he and other uh, delegates from the World Federation came and visited uh, the kingdom and uh, invitation by His Majesty King Abdullah. And here's Kiki taking hand with His Majesty. And you can see that always Kiki is carrying his uh, camera with him. He takes a lot of photographs. He promises you to give back the photograph. I've never received anything from him. Okay. <laughs> however, however uh, this is at home, as I said, he is a family. Uh, he's here with members of my family and uh, our wives together, his lovely wife, Khurshid, and uh, I admire their love relation. They are really uh, close together. So I'll go just go for the Farco Tintor and Meningiomas. Very rare, of one three to 1% of all Ukrainian and Meningiomas. Uh, they are just okay at the junction of the, uh, of the forks and the tent, either above or below. The anatomy related to this lesion is, is very tremendous. It can affect any of these structures that we will discuss. Relationship to the forest content, of course, and you have to be aware of the blood supply and venous drainage of the forks and the tent. And uh, people forget about the falci and sinus. Persistent falci and sinus is there and can replace the whole of the vein of gallon system. Also, uh, people would forget about the tentorial uh, sinuses and their importance. Uh, the arteries, all the arteries involved uh, in this kind of uh, pathology, the middle meningeal, the accessory middle meningeal, the ascending pharyngeal, all coming from the external carotid. Uh, and from the internal carotid, we have the meningeal have vaseal trunk and the uh, inferior lateral trunk. Here is the uh, meningeal have vaseal and the inferior lateral trunk and the uh, angiogram, which shows uh, that the uh, falcot internal meningiomas are mainly supplied by these arteries. Also, uh, another artery which can be implicated and important to notice is the artery of Davidov and Shishtor coming from the posterior cerebral artery, again demonstrated by the angiogram. Uh, meningeal branch from the severe cerebral artery the posterior meningeal branches of the vertebral as seen in this case. Uh, so the angiogram is needed here. Uh, this is the, the anatomy teaching us that you need the angiogram, MRA, DSA, DSA, CTA. But the best for me is conventional to get a very uh, clear uh, view of the arteries. When the system is very important, the beautiful view in Yazid's view book and the uh, all the veins draining to the vein of gallon, the pineal gland and all the uh, arachnoid envelopes there. So venogram is a must. Again, I prefer the conventional. Uh, you also notice the tentorial uh, angle because this, the, the steeper the angle, the difficult uh, the section. So people calculated the tentorial angle and found that the higher tentorial angle, the difficult the section, the difficult Simpson grade resection. Uh, so the venogram will show you uh, that the vein of gallon is closed. You can see the collateral drainage. You can see the uh, pushing and inferior displacement of internal cerebral veins. You can also, uh, uh, if you don't are not careful, then you'll get complications. And there is the venous infarct if one is not careful about those veins. The thalamus is in your way. The pulvinar is there all the time. Uh, Medial surface of the hemisphere, the cuneus and precuneus, the calcarine sulcus, the occipital sulcus, 
the visual area 17, 18, 19, because your retractor will uh, fall on that area if you go uh, supratentorially like this. So a visual assessment before and after uh, surgery is a must, including visual acuity, fundoscopy, optical CT, and visual fields. And the type of uh, the visual um, the disturbance is either congruent or non-congruent kind of hemianopia. And this is a lesson that one should learn. You should tell the patient, the family about the risk of the visual uh, symptoms, visual manifestations, because as I said, you may get uh, these kind of, of uh, complications due to the uh, retractor falling on the visual area. So the bellum and brainstem also in your way, the spiriculoculus and the renoid, which can be a manifestation or a sequelae of surgery. Uh, so they are rare, these tumors are rare. 0.3 to 1% of all intracranial meningiomas. And the number of cases you find in the literature is just something around 100 cases. From the very beginning till now, only 100 cases have been reported. And every case uh, reports ranging from one case to 14 cases only. So this paper from the University of Rome, over 20 years, they uh, uh, published about 13 cases. And this is a summary of the presentations in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, the 90s, uh, 2000 to 2010, and the most recent publications in 2022. This was in February, these two were in May. So these are really rare tumors. And the best classification, many classification there, uh, Yazar Gil and others, but the best classification, which is practical, is the Basiwani classification. He published this uh, uh, about 13 cases, and he classified them into four times. Type one is the one which is supra uh, superior at the junction of the vein of Gallen and the uh, straight sinus. Type two is the same but inferior junction, inferior to that junction. Type three is uh, in the midline running across the uh, uh, straight sinus. And type four is running uh, the whole length of the transverse sites. So this is very practical classification. And the treatment, as you all know, is variable. It could be microscopic surgery, endoscopic surgery recently, radiosurgery and radiotherapy. But microsurgery remains the mainstay. And uh, uh, gross total resection is in something like 50 to 70% of cases. Positions could be variable, semi-sitting, will any kind of uh, other positions that you like and you are accustomed to. Uh, the approach is either supra or infratentorial with variations, either, either supratentorial like this one, and you go trans uh, for sign or trans tentorial. And you can combine, like in this case that uh, was shown in the uh, Michael McDermott paper. My personal experience in these, uh, this pathology over the last uh, 30 years, uh, eight cases, mostly females, as you would expect. These are the eight cases. And the last case, this is the eighth case, was part of meningiomatosis. Uh, we differentiate between a pioneer locus meningioma and falcotentorial meningioma. There's a great difference between these and many publications uh, alluding to this. Uh, the principles of uh, surgery in, in, in my, my hands. Uh, Preoperative, we do full neurological, ophthalmological, and Karnofsky performance scale. Uh, rarely we use embolization. And uh, the surgical approaches in my, in my cases, eight cases, five were subarous rebellar infratentorial, and three were occipital interhemispheric. I use the semi-sitting position in all my cases under neural navigation. And of course, cranial nerves monitoring. I never use a shunt unless it is necessary. A good shunt for me is no shunt. I use an external drain at the beginning of surgery. And if the venous sinus is infiltrated by patent, I leave the residual tumor. I use the Doppler to define the edge between a, a patent and the occluded segment of the sinus. I'll take you through the steps of surgery for the supracerebellar infratentorial. Uh, this is the exhibited surface going supracerebellar 
finding the uh, you know the adhesions, and then finding the tumor using the ultrasonic aspirator, exposing the severe cerebellar artery branches, and then exposing the vein of gallon. And then you can see the back of the uh, midbrain. And if you go into the lateral ventricle, you can see uh, vein of gallon there, cavity of the third ventricle, roof of the third ventricle, and the mass intermediate. Uh, this is the roof of the third ventricle from that uh, advantage point of view. And if you go downward, you can see the fourth uh, the nerve uh, taking its course laterally around the brainstem. Steps of surgery for the supratentorial occipital transtentorial, like in this case. Uh, in this particular case, I use the embolization. And as this is, as I said, this is the folks, this is the tent and this is the tumor. And these are the embolic material inside the tumor. Again, folks is here, tent is here. Then you go and remove the tumor. You will go into the posterior and sensorial space. Continue the dissection and the accession of the tumor. And then at one point you will open the folks. You will find the tumor of the other side. Open the tentorium and you can get the tumor completely out until you reach to the vein of gallon here and dissect the tumor from there. So pathology in those eight cases, uh, as you can see, three fibrous meningothelial three, transitional one, atypical and one. Uh, the results in my hands were Simpson grade one to two in six cases. I had no mortality. Uh, for those cases where you have residual, we use the gamma knife. And as you know, we got the gamma knife in, in, in Jordan back in 1996. It was the first gamma knife in the, in the region of the Middle East. Uh, complications, I had motor weakness in one, hydrocephalus in one, ambulance in one, and fourth, new fourth nerve deficit in one, CSF leak in one. A visual outcome, six patients improved, one did not change and one got worse. Some illustrative cases quickly, and I'll finish quickly. Uh, this 47-year-old uh, female patient with this large tumor, and I was lucky to get it out completely with no deficits. Uh, this man with this giant uh, tumor, and we had to leave a residual for which we gave gamma knife later on. And this case is a story in its own. This patient had this tumor somewhere outside Jordan, and uh, uh, this was the uh, images before his surgery. As I said, that centers were somewhere else. Uh, he had uh, this surgery, but he was left with hemiplegia. Uh, his uh, MRI when he arrived to Jordan showed that the tumor was still there. So we went in and uh, did the surgery, uh, almost complete uh, accession, and the patient hemiplegia improved. So in conclusion, complete resection of this falcotentorial meningioma is the first line of treatment. And if you have a patent sinus, don't, don't touch it. Uh, and you must tell the patient and his relatives about the significant potential risk of visual complications. Uh, view from Jordan, this is uh, Dead Sea of Jordan, the lowest point of north, 420 meters below sea level. As you can see, this is the Dead Sea, this is River Jordan. River Jordan flows into the Dead Sea. At the junction here is a very famous site. It is the baptism site. It is the official baptism site recognized by the Vatican. Uh, so this is River Jordan going into the uh, Dead Sea, and this is the uh, site of baptism. Uh, Pope visited us many times, and here he's uh, visiting the area, a very famous baptism site on the River Jordan. Uh, this is the Black Iris Temple of Jordan, and I finish with this picture for Kiki. Dear Kiki, it was a wonderful journey. We had 25 years of friendship and brothership, and I have to tell you this, everybody in the world respect you and love you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sveh, for this nice presentation. Uh, of course, Falco Tempere is a tough 
region, we all have uh, limited experience with a few cases because this is not very common. Uh, but you showed marvelous cases, and um, I might leave only one questions or comment because time is <laughs> is too late, and we still have two presentations. Any uh, urgent questions or comment? Uh, it's just me, uh, uh, Imad Maya. I just yes. uh, thanks, uh, Ibrahim. That's a uh, beautiful talk, and in you know, a difficult cases, all this. I think before you joined, uh, the one of the cases I showed. Um, in my talk was one of the phacotendural meningiomas. My question is, when you, when you decide on infratendural versus supratendural, the, the strategy is to look at the vein displacement uh, and then decide on which to go for, or is the extent of tumor? Both of them, both of them. I look at the, at the straight sinus angle, I see how acute is that, and I see how much of the tumor is supra or infratendural, and I look, of course, as the, the displacement of the veins. So I take all these into consideration before deciding whether supra or infratendural. Thank you. All right, we we'll move to the next speaker, uh, Professor Modi Qureshi. Uh, he is the president of the Continental African Neurosurgical Societies. Uh, he's from Kenya and is a close friend uh, for us and to Keki. I have been a partner of the Hakuna Matata group for almost uh, eight or nine years. And he's going to talk about uh, Mount uh, Kalimanjaro. <laughs> yes, I would love to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we'll do that in November. <laughs> this yes, time I'll talk know. about the one. Um, well, we keep it Fuji. <laughs> let's keep it Fuji. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir and Imad, for giving me uh, the honor of uh, talking amongst this illustrious group. I mean, we've heard some, am we've see heard some amazing lectures, seen some amazing images. Uh, and uh, my focus is going to be perhaps less amazing. It's going to be the more common stuff that we see. And I believe that there are many residents and uh, uh, trainees, young neurosurgeons who perhaps see and deal with the kind of stuff that I am going to talk about. Uh, so excuse me for it being a rather mundane, uh, but it is late in the evening. So uh, it'll give us a time to wind down. You do see my slides, I believe. Yes. Yeah, we can see. Yes, so can. thank you very much, uh, Keki. Uh, you and I have known each other uh, for more than uh, 25, nearly 30 years now, when you first came to Kenya, when I had just returned. And it's been a pleasure uh, being with you, uh, sharing your wonderful sense of humor. And of course, uh, you coming and uh, gracing my offices sometimes to see some of the post-operative patients that have gone away from Kenya to have surgery under your care. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure to follow them up because they're always singing praises about you. And it's always a pleasure meeting you wherever you are. Uh, and you, as everyone will acknowledge, are the master educator and certainly uh, the Sub-Saharan African programs have benefited from your generosity of um, sharing your knowledge. Uh, and uh, we all feel very, very honored whenever we uh, say that we are colleagues, friends, and uh, really uh, very close to Keki Turel. Our <coughs> patients know me as the friend of Keki Turel. So go to Dr. Qureshi and if he can't do it, he will send you to Keki Turel and Keki Turel will do it. So thank you very much for being there for our patients. I will just very quickly just go through a clinical case that demonstrates the dilemmas of uh, some of the straightforward cases that we manage. This is a 78 year old gentleman who was referred to us from a neighboring country. He's had a seizure, uh, history of seizures and had been on clopidogrel following coronary stenting two years ago. He struck his head and this was, uh, it was air evacuated by the flying doctors, which is common, I think, in our region. And the flying doctors brought him, uh, at the time of his arrival, he was lethargic, obeying simple commands, disoriented in time, um, place and person, 
recognize his son who actually had flown down from uh, the United Kingdom, who is a cardiologist uh, working somewhere in the UK. Uh, this is the CT scan that he had at the time. Uh, because of his floppy dog grill and because of the scan findings and because of uh, the fact that he was able to obey commands, uh, we opted to manage him conservatively. I do tend to rely on dexamethasone. I know it's beginning to get out of favor in chronic sub in subdurals, but I find that it has bailed me out several times and bailed some of my patients. He was changed from his uh, uh, anticonvulsant. He was loaded with uh, Keppra, Levotiracetam, and monitored. Uh, he was managed in the high dependency unit, remained stable. Uh, by the following day, he was a bit, he was more awake, began to be oriented in and obeying simple commands. An assessment scale, scan really did not show any change, no increase in the acute subdural component, uh, and uh, the contusion was unchanged, maintained on uh, conservative treatment. But around day 11, he started complaining of increasing headache, became more lethargic, disoriented, and the scan showed that he, the right-sided uh, subdural was causing uh, compression, and we felt that this was now an appropriate time and uh, indication for us to do a straightforward burr hole drainage, which we did. About six hours post-operatively, uh, he became very drowsy, uh, disoriented in time, place, and person, and an, ass an assessment scan at that time revealed a tension uh, pneumocranium with the radiological features typical of what is referred to as the Mount Fuji sign. And he underwent emergent release of the tension pneumocranium. At reoperation, burr hole incisions were reopened. A decrease of air from the open dural site uh, was noted, indicating that they were indeed in, under pressure. The cavities, cavity was irrigated with uh, normal saline. Uh, and the head raised to allow for any subdural air to rise towards the burr hole sites. The irrigation allowed to fill the subdural space and the incision closed uh, with no subdural drain left in situ. And that's your uh, Mount, Fu Mount Fuji. Uh, it basic, and post-operatively, he was maintained in a, uh, the Fowler's position, 30 degrees head up uh, with nasal prong oxygen, avoiding strain. Uh, of course, adequate analgesia, dexamethasone, and his Keppra was continued. The management of pneumocephalus is similar to the treatment of a pneumothorax. The intracranial layer reabsorbs with the use of supplemental oxygen, and has, as has been reported by Dexter and Resina, due to the increase in the diffusion gradient for nitrogen between the air collection and the surrounding cerebral tissue, uh, increased oxygen delivery by nasal cannula or just a simple face mask uh, with concentration of 40% decreased the time of pneumocephalus absorption uh, by 80% and further increases in FiO2 uh, seems to help uh, decrease the time in which absorption occurs. So this was what was found a day six after the evacuation. He was neurologically alert, oriented, coherent, asymptomatic really, reduction in the amount of pneumocephalus, the sulci were now becoming patent. It was maintained on bed rest and oxygen. And day eight post uh, drainage, uh, he was allowed to sit out of bed, supervised ambulation for washroom needs with a minimal amount of aerosol. Day 10, neurologically stable, ambulant. And then one can argue, should we go back and drain that? Of course not because now the sulci were patent uh, in a 78-year-old gentleman. This was just uh, hygromas due to cerebral atrophy, and he was discharged. So the Mount Fuji sign is, uh, Mount Fuji is the tallest mountain in Japan uh, and is known for its conical form, is the sacred symbol, and temples and shrines have been located around it. The anatomical basis of the Mount Fuji sign is that there is the significant volume of intracranial air, which then separates the frontal lobes 
and we see the typical Mount Fuji sign creating the so-called Mount Fuji sign. This indicates that the pressure of air uh, is greater than the surface tension of CSF between the frontal lobes. And thus the sign refers to the presence of this pneumocephalus between the tips of the frontal lobes. It suggests the pressure, as I said, uh, is greater than that of the uh, CSF between those lobes. And the appearance of this sign in may warrant, and it is not always necessary, it may warrant an immediate surgery to prevent uh, uh, raising into cranial pressure and further deterioration. The name is derived, as we said, from the resemblance of the Mount Fuji, uh, a volcano. Uh, the sign was first discovered by a team of Japanese neurosurgeons, not surprisingly. It can become a neurosurgical emergency and occurs when subdural air causes the mass effect over the underlying brain often from a ball valve mechanism causing one-way entry of air, particularly if the Mount Fuji sign has followed uh, skull base surgeries uh, or ENT procedures. Clinical presentation, of course, the usual uh, increased uh, ICP and uh, can deteriorate to become comatose. CT scans uh, of the patients with attention uh, pneumocephalus typically show the air that compresses the frontal lobes, resulting in the tented appearance, as we mentioned. In typical cases, there is a symmetrical depression near the midline, such as the crater of the volcano of the Mount Fuji. And uh, the actual enhanced CT image uh, demonstrates the bilateral uh, subdural uh, hyperattenuation with compression and the separated frontal lobes. Widening of these interhemispheric spaces uh, is noted. And in this particular instant, which is not my uh, image, uh, a drainage catheter which had put in was blamed for uh, the, uh, the blockage on that catheter was blamed for this uh, occurrence. The message of uh, this brief, brief uh, uh, presentation that it is important to evaluate the patient's neurological status as radiological signs are not all indicative of raised intracranial pressure. In fact, just over the weekend, I had a similar case, but uh, the patient was up and about and the, um, the, the cones of the frontal uh, lobes were not that separated. Uh, so we managed him conservatively and uh, the three days later, much better allowed home. So the Mount Fuji sign, while important to recognize, is not always a specific sign of tension, may require emergency drainage and surgery is guided by the patient's neurological status. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much, Keki, because we're all very proud of you. You are our neurosurgical guru, a thorough gentleman whenever we've met you, always there for everyone, everywhere, very humble, superb sense of humor, always honest, never uneasy about mentioning your complications, convincing all, and you've done that so effectively because we now all are very comfortable talking about complications and you've always convinced us that it's never, uh, never to be shy uh, on mentioning our complications as this contributes to continued learning. So with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moody, for this uh, excellent, uh, pristine, clear uh, presentation on Mount Fuji. And uh, I think we will just move for the next uh, speaker. Last but not least, uh, Professor Lucas uh, Vasuli uh, from Belgrade and uh, Serbia. Uh, sorry for keeping you that uh, late, um, but I know you have the stamina to, to tolerate us. I think next time webinar, we have to change the sequence to keep the peripheral nerve at the beginning, not at the end, because you always seconded this one with brain tumor and vascular. I'm sorry, but we will consider this one for future. Professor Lucas. Can you allow you. one comment? Please? Yeah, but I think that uh, there are a few, uh, few hands, uh, raised hands for a comments. And who who has the comment? Yeah. Who still has the yeah, Professor Kasadi. A quick one, yeah. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. Very nice presentation. 
excellent. Um, I, I'm, I'm just making a comment just for young neurosurgeons that uh, all cavities in the, when you, somebody does the operation, all cavities have to be filled with saline. The reason is that when the air gets in, it gets, it gets in with a low, very low temperature in any way, which is probably 25 degrees. But when it gets in on a body, which is at 36 degrees, it warms up and then it expands. That's what gives, you know, the pressure. And uh, it's called hot balloon uh, phenomenon. Okay. So um, I think people have to be aware about that. So when, <clears throat> when people are putting saline, it's good actually to mobilize the head and to put into such a, a way that uh, you fill the cavity with saline as a, as a general rule. Thank you very much. No, very good comment. Uh... Very good comment, Kasadi. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think all of us agree with this uh, technique you mentioned. Very important point. Any other comment? All right, Professor Lucas. Uh, can share your presentation. Yes. Good evening, everybody. Greetings from Belgrade. Uh, uh, congratulations even for this excellent organization and to all of uh, participants uh, uh, who gave outstanding lectures. Uh, my uh, special greetings goes to Keki. Keki is uh, one and only, and uh, he's uh, dealing with uh, complication in terms of education and not only complication in surgery, but in general is of outstanding importance and uh, presents a significant landmark uh, for um, uh, future generations in terms of understanding uh, the necessity to be honest with the complication and to deal, to prevent the complication and to deal with the complication when you have the complications. Uh, you, if, I don't know, uh, you said everything about Keki. There are so many things to say, but I will uh, say just one uh, more word uh, in terms of uh, respecting Keki for his outstanding work. Uh, my title of my talks is Minor Surgeries with Major Complications, Myth or Reality. It might look that uh, this uh, surgery can, uh, let's say, uh, appear to somebody that it's uh, uh, some kind of mi minor surgery. But uh, it can have a major complications, as you can see. And uh, this is uh, related to the peripheral neurosurgery, especially brachial plexus surgery. And uh, going from the head through spine until the end, until the peripheral nerve system, uh, we are now talking about interoperative morphological versus electrophysiological findings in a neurosurgery and how to avoid complications. Uh, this is what I want to mention about Keki. So Keki now finalizing his uh, great work about the complication is, uh, as far as I know, uh, approximately in one month or maybe two months uh, after a few year, years of, of very hard work, uh, there will be a, a book uh, about complications in every surgery editing ed with editors Keki Turel, uh, Mikhail Chernov and uh, uh, and uh, there is one, one chapter in this book uh, uh, related to the managing complications related to the peripheral neurosurgery with selected illustrative cases. Thank you for taking for giving this uh, as uh, the legacy of your activity in the uh, previous period. So peripheral neurosurgery mostly includes selective procedures and its complications are of the great medical, social, social medical and legal importance. Complications are related to peripheral nerve surgery in general, divided into three major groups. One is general preoperative, perioperative complications, not specifically related to the peripheral nerve surgery. For example, you have a patient with, a, uh, let's say, a cubital tunnel syndrome, and you operate the patient, and the patient uh, uh, have a major complication, such as a heart attack or something like that, and uh, passed away, and you have this patient uh, as a for example, uh, failure of your surgery. And then intraoperative complications during peripheral nerve surgery. 
A third one group is a nerve related complications occurring as a result of iatrogenic injury during surgeries where peripheral nerves are not the targeted pathology. So general, general perioperative complications can be minor, intermediate and major. As I said, major myocardial infection, cerebral vascular event, pulmonary embolism, limb loss, or adjustment important structure injury. These are uh, real problems with peripheral neurosurgery. There are, of course, intermediate uh, perioperative complications such as uh, extensive uh, and problem with the wound, infections, hematoma, uh, or deep vein thrombosis, and minor, which are not uh, interested for this uh, uh, talk. Since general perioperative complications are not specifically related to the peripheral nerve surgery, the focus of this study and this presentation will be on intraoperative and iatrogenic complication, highlighting the interaction between the two of those groups. Intraoperative complications during peripheral nerve surgery are uh, during the, the course of the peripheral nerve surgery are very rare because uh, somebody who is doing peripheral nerve surgery as an experienced surgeon uh, usually avoid this kind of complication. Direct intraoperative complications are extremely rare. Never occur in the experience of specialist peripheral nerve treatment. They are always surgery-related complications uh, more than, uh, these surgery-related complications are more rather surgeon-related complications, and they are overlapping with iatrogenic peripheral nerve injuries. There are some few studies uh, which uh, express all of this. Specific group of complications concerning peripheral nerve tumor, nerve tumor surgery is that you have uh, some cases following the first no harm principle, surgeons are way to complete tumor re removal, tumor of the nerve, which allows the tumor's reoccurrence. In some cases, the outcome is determined by the independent factors of tumor biology, such as malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors. And this is also a very tricky situation for solving. Iatrogenic injuries are uh, the most significant uh, group of complications in peripheral nerve surgery. They amount to about 17% of all peripheral nerve injuries. And there are four major groups according to the cause of injury, injection or needle injuries, radiation injuries, pressure and traction injuries related to the uh, anesthesia positioning and direct interoperative injuries. So direct interoperative injuries mostly occur when the nerves are not visualized due to the relatively small, small size of the incision of when the nerve is mistaken for vessels. And the common mechanisms of the types of nerves in, include a partial or complete transection of the nerve, stretching, contusion, compression, coagulation with bipolar forceps or excision together with the targeted pathology. The procedures carrying the highest risk of iatrogenic intraoperative injuries to the peripheral nerves are osteosynthesis, lymph node biopsy, varicose vein surgery, and inguinal hernia repair. All procedures are performed by specialists other than neurosurgeons. The highest risk concerns those regions in which the peripheral nerve lies superficial or exposed during the surgery. These are the nerves uh, at risk of injury according to the region and mechanism of injury. As you can see, uh, nerve at risk, spinal accessory nerve. All nerves practically are in some kind of risk in the different part of the region and different, different part of the body in the region when they are uh, most uh, approachable for these uh, mechanisms of injury that you can see here. And uh, these are uh, issue of solving in our uh, everyday practice. So this is just a few words uh, in general about this, but this is the case which uh, leads us to the uh, main question, uh, minor surgery with major complications. So patient is a male, 20 years old, injured in September, 2020 with a knife stab, uh, knife stab in the uh, neck, left upper brachial plexus palsy was present. Again, left upper brachial plexus palsy was present. Arm blood vessels, CT, angio, and uh, uh, ultrasound were unremarkable. And uh, we have a surgical treatment plan for this uh, because uh, this is a patient who came, it was in September 2018. He came to us in my department May 15. So it's uh, practically uh, nine months after injury. And uh, in order to avoid uh, any kind of uh, possibility for, uh, let's say, uh, less favorable results, 
in terms of uh, approaching with, with the grafting procedure. Uh, I decided to go to the to approach this patient to with a triple transfer procedure, spinal luxury nerve to the suprascapular nerve via anterior approach, and then overlimb procedure, and then some of procedure for the deltoid muscle. So I pre perform supraclavicular exploration of the left brachial plexus, and uh, I uh, perform external neurolysis of the left spinal luxury and suprascapular nerve, and external neurolysis of the of the left axillary nerve. And then interoperative uh, uh, direct stimulation was performed that I found the lesion in continuity of the C5 and C6 root in direct stimulation. In, a, uh, in a interoperative monitoring, but direct stimulation show us that um, uh, within this lesion of continuity, all these elements are functioning. So patient has a patient has left upper brachial plexus pulse. Interoperative monitoring and DMG shows the, the, the very severe lesion of uh, of these elements. But in the within the surgery, this is direct stimulation of these uh, exposed elements, and uh, all of them appear to be working. So neuroma in continuity was confirmed, external analysis of the superior trunk and in its alternate and posterior divisions were performed and external analysis of the C5 and C6 roots were performed. And this is how it looks. It looks very bad morphologically. This uh, C5 and C6 uh, roots and the trunk uh, here, but it, Despite that patient has a clinical appearance of the left upper brachial plexus palsy and uh, EMG findings that uh, this is a severe lesion. And uh, intraoperative monitoring, we could not receive uh, quite well uh, uh, results. But direct stimulation of these elements shows that they are working. So, nine months after a surgery. So I didn't cut this. I didn't put a nerve transfer as I planned. I, I finished the surgery at that level. And nine months after surgery, nine months follow up, almost complete recovery. M4 according to the MRC and slightly decreased range of movement, but this is uh, his left hand. This is excellent recovery of the patient on that level. And this is a complete uh, recovery one year post-operative. What, what, what could happen at that moment is that I could cut these injured elements or perform transfer, cut the, the recipients and uh, put the transfer like a spinal, spinal luxury to the suprascapular and then go to the musculocutaneous we are opening procedure and then turn the patient and via posterior approach go to the songs of procedure to reinnervate the deltoid muscle. But fortunately, I didn't do it. And uh, that's, that's how I have a, let's say, uh, I was a little bit lucky in this situation. So, brachial plexus morphological features related to the illustrative case are caused like this. There are, uh, this is the root of the spinal, this is the length of the spinal roots, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, T which are uh, creating brachial plexus. So root is like it is, but this is not a small, let's say, length of the nerve elements. And then you have another situation, there is a, uh, brachial plexus spinal root, uh, nerve root formation angles, which is individual to each patient. But this is an uh, average angle in which form you can uh, expect uh, connection with the C5 to C6 and C7 uh, elements and the C1 T8. And these are the nerve roots formation angles in the vertical plane. So this is minimal angle and maximal angle. So patient receives stab wound. And obviously, the elements were injured. Uh, the numbers of the nerve fibers 
within the whole brachial plexus varies among individuals and the average number is 1,000, 100, uh, 130,000 fibers. And this is the average rate, 100, uh, one to 166,000 uh, fibers and 30 or 40% of this are, is distributed to the proximal branches in innervating the shoulder journey. This is the catch. 30 or 40% of fibers is distributed to the proximal branches innervating the shoulder, shoulder girdle. So this was the lesion in continuity, but partial lesion. Then you have a distributive distribution of the connective and neural tissues in a proximal segments of the brachial plexus. And these are the structures C5 up to the upper and middle trunk. So you have enough uh, perifascular and interfascular connective tissue. And this is the amount of uh, neural tissue. So possibility for the, these elements uh, to be completely uh, injured is, uh, let's say, variable. And this is the segmental distribution of the uh, origin of the fibers according to the mono. So regular C5, C6 are uh, musculocutaneous nerve is regularly receiving fibers from C5, C6. Then axillary nerve also regularly receive uh, fibers from C5, C6. But here you can see variation that uh, musculocutaneous nerve can receive also fibers from C7, then from C5 to C8, then from even from all roots from C5 to C1. And from the axillary nerve, uh, axillary nerve can receive fibers only from C5, usually from C5 and C6, but can only from C5 or C5, C6, and C7. So this is the intraneural systematization of the fibers in the brachial plexus. And uh, uh, the number of fascicles is higher than in the proximal segments while their diameter is lower. Therefore, terminal branches contain more connective tissues in a comparison with the proximal segments. And this here you see how much fibers uh, there is um, in uh, each individual terminal branch. So approximate numbers, average number in the musculocutaneous uh, nerve is 6,000 fibers and in axillary nerve, approximately the same, 6,700 fibers. And this is the distribution of the connective and neural tissues in the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. So you also, also see that this is a uh, enough uh, connective tissue within the neural tissue in the this uh, uh, terminal branches, and that's why we uh, put this in a situation. Keep it simple, surgeon. This is in in situation that I choose that to, to go to the triple transfer as I was originally planned to do this, who knows what will happen. Maybe patient will uh, achieve a nice recovery with uh, excellent re-innervation, with excellent re re regeneration from the donor nerves. But this is the original, uh, this is the essential origin of the fibers, which are Originally here in the C5 and C6, some of them were injured, some of them are not. But this is difficult to, to this was difficult to make a decision. Should I proceed, proceed with the previously planned surgery, which is originally determined to this kind of lesions, or should I stop an operation at that moment? And I decide to stop an operation, and unfortunately, a uh, patient recover excellently with uh, enough fibers in his original. A reserve. So you should cover simply and uh, keep indications for surgery simple, then make the surgery simple to avoid complications. Uh, of course, you can, die, you can, die, you can do it, uh, nerve surgery with a simple basic instruments. And uh, if I realize that I, uh, let's say, made a mistake and cut this, I would not have enough time to reoperate the patient, you understand me? Because if I leave it, I will leave it for nine or 10 or 12 months, uh, just to waiting for some kind of recovery after a triple transfer. And they, in case there will, if there will not be any kind of recovery at that moment, it will be too late for any kind of another attempt for a nerve repair, because it will be two years after the, after the injuries. So this is something what we are planning to introduce in a, with low and middle income countries in terms of education of the patient 
all the doctors uh, in terms of treat, uh, treating all the patients with uh, uh, peripheral nerve surgery. So keep calm and raise awareness of blood brachial plexus surgery. I'm glad uh, and I'm very happy that the uh, International Academy of uh, Neuroanatomy uh, uh, showing their initiative to be a part of European Congress of Neurosurgery in Belgrade. Uh, the program is already confirmed and uh, it will be on Sunday, uh, October 16. You will receive uh, final information very soon. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, all distinguished uh, people, members of the International Academy of uh, Neuroanatomy will be in Belgrade presenting uh, their experience and sharing their knowledge with uh, within the one of the maybe major event of this year in the European continent. Uh, we have a uh, two months later Serbian annual meeting of uh, an meeting of Serbian Neurosurgical Society joint venture with Southeast European Neurosurgery. Uh, this is a event which was created in 2020 uh, for 2020. And the, the title and everything is the same, but uh, since the COVID, we postponed this, and now we have a actual situation with this event. So thank you very much for your attention, and I am looking forward to see all of you in Belgrade and uh, uh, to continue our excellent journey in sharing our our uh, friendship and experience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lucas for this uh, very uh, precise presentation and uh, uh, first I'd like to thank you to welcome the Yana to the meeting in Belgrade and uh, you are a STEM member of this uh, academy. We are looking forward for this uh, collaboration with the European and with the uh, Serbian Society of Neurosurgical Society. Um, any question to Professor Lucas? I think everybody is tired for the end of the day. Maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, yes, just a, a simple you. question, but yeah, uh, okay. I think uh, it, uh, this question has been repeated many, many times. Uh, who should do the nerve surgery? Neurosurgeons, plastic surgery, or orthopedic surgery? You ask me, or I think you well, ask for, doctor, ask for Dr. Rasulik. For yes, Dr. Rasulik. Okay. Well, uh, Professor Perez, thank you for this question. This is, um, uh, I would rephrase your question uh, if you agree. Uh, why neurosurgeons are not doing neurosurgery? You mean peripheral nerve surgery, yeah. Yes, peripheral nerve yes. surgery. Well, yes. So this is your, your question is who should do it? I, and I'm asking you why neurosurgeons are not doing peripheral nerve surgery? Yes, uh, I have heard uh, this question several times. Uh, I know, for example, I know uh, uh, the response. I, I think uh, uh, this kind of surgery it has to be made by the people who know how to do it. Yeah, in my, yeah. you, you know, you know, in my country, uh, it's a question. Uh, I think that are uh, some silos, silos uh, to do that kind of that kind of surgery. My teacher used to say that this kind of surgery, and I agree, of course, should be made by the surgeon that know how to do it. That's it. Yes, yeah. that's true. If I may say, uh, explanation uh, for this situation, uh, I repeated many times on, on our meetings and uh, webinars and uh, in person on anyhow, so that is true that you, you, what you said now is completely true. Like every surgery, it, it's always better that uh, each surgery is, is uh, performed by the uh, experienced surgeon who, are, who know what to do 
in this uh, field of surgery. And particularly in peripheral nerve surgery, I will uh, remind you that um, in all uh, neurosurgical textbooks, well, which are using for the basic education for the residents, you have a uh, huge chapters re related to the peripheral nerve surgery. And uh, within the, let's say, uh, European Association, now new curriculum for education is, uh, uh, let's say, changing in terms of um, introducing more peripheral neurosurgery for the neurosurgeon to be educated in terms that they can know what to do in, the, in this uh, situation. For example, if you have a, a patient in a, your uh, night shift uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, incision of the skin incision in the elbow and then he's bleeding and he's coming with, without function of his uh, fourth and fifth finger uh, who, will, who will operate? You will wait for somebody to come for, to operate tomorrow or you will operate him during the night shift, just explore the wound and uh, find the ulnar nerve and put the end-to-end -end anastomosis and finish and make 100% of the of the, of the the recovery of the patient. So that's that's the that's the point uh, uh, in, in these circumstances, uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, there is a lot of other specialties who are doing peripheral nerve surgery, such as uh, plastic surgeons, uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons, even in some situations general surgeons. But because of all of this, there is a, a trend that uh, in future. Somebody who will really deal with the peripheral nerve surgery should have some kind of self-specialization, which will be named nerve surgeon. So no hand surgeon, no microsurgeon, no neurosurgeon, no plastic surgeon, no orthopedic surgeon, but, but the nerve surgeon. Finishing his residency in neurosurgery, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, whatsoever. But he's doing in uh, the field of nerve surgery, and now he's become a nerve surgeon, like a spine surgeon. Or brain surgery, and and that's that that's uh, that's how how there is a idea and a model for a for 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 um, let's say overwhelming this uh, situation that uh, everybody is asking why neurosurgeons are not doing peripheral neurosurgery, or neurosurgeons are not interested in peripheral neurosurgery because it's not too attractive, you don't have results immediately you have a lot of uh, chances for failure in terms of uh, biological chances, despite that you perform surgery in a best possible manner. And, uh, but you have a many situations that when you operate a patient who, who was completely, uh, let's say, handicapped with a arm which is flailed and uh, not functioning at all, but you have achieved with uh, your surgery excellent recovery and patient is coming in a regular life with a 100% uh, reintegration in the uh, everyday activity. This is a, a, let's say, quite a wording. Let's say, maybe, uh, I would not, not like to compare, but um, uh, this is reconstructive surgery within the nervous surgery. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Unfortunately, the neurosurgical community and society does not or we have a defect from on our own account. We have not encouraged young people to go into this branch. And I think there are not too many fellowship uh, and enticement for the people. And they still believe financially is not rewarding. Some of them look for the financial part, unfortunately. Some look for the challenge. And the enticement, how many fellowship for peripheral nerves are around in the world to be offered? Uh, take a skull base, there are a hundred of fellowship. Yes. Why this part was not giving its uh, real uh, direction and enticement for the young generation? This is based on, uh, uh, let's say, uh, so far, uh, let's say, uh, approach to the these uh, different fields. But I would like to remind you that all uh, major surgeons, uh, significant surgeons, neurosurgeons who are doing skull base now or doing uh, uh, a lot That's like Majid Sami, Vinko Dolets, etc. They have a uh, first 10 years of their life uh, doing uh, nerve surgery, then uh, transfer to the to the skull base or uh, any other field. 
and uh, this uh, fellowship uh, is not, uh, let's say, who is who is giving fellowship? For example, American Society for Peripheral Nerve Surgery is giving fellowship for peripheral nerve surgery, and then other so, uh, national societies or international societies are not very much active in these circumstances. But let's say from the, the departments of neurosurgery or orthopedic surgery, they are. There are some possibility for fellowship, like for example, in my department or in other departments all over the world, people can come in a, let's say, individual approach, not by organized, not by organized yeah. uh, approach. Like uh, uh, they say, I am offering a fellowship, but uh, I'm not giving them a money. I'm not giving them a free accommodation. I'm giving them a very nice and very cheap accommodation. And I'm giving them a extremely well three months, six months, uh, one year organized fellowship in my department doing everything, going everything from outpatient clinic through the electrophysiology, neuroradiology, uh, surgery, cadaver lab, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something, and I have around 30 people now internationally from all over the world, but in my department spending three to six to uh, even one month. One colleague from Mexico, where neurosurgeon was with me one year in my department, and uh, this is deep upon the up, upon the, the individual interest. But we have we don't have systematical approach to this problem. Yeah. Any other comment? Anybody wants to add something? So and just to say, for that case, what I presented, if I did it, what I said, go for the surgery. What I did, what I did, this is a. It was be a, it would be a it would be a huge mistake in these circumstances, and then uh, who who knows what will happen? And that's uh, that was the just I choose this case to present because this a very tricky situation in the, in this uh, uh, field of reconstructive surgery, and uh, there are a lot of challenges in this surgery and a lot of rewards. So it depend how people are looking on that. All right. All right, before we conclude that uh, nice uh, active sessions, two sessions actually, a full day sessions. Igor, will you be able to have, to have the group pictures? Of course. And uh, we'd like to have the group picture. I don't see Kiki, he left the most, are we? And uh, Matthias left as well. All right, so big smile and give us uh, Victor Visano hi. Thanks for all the speakers and the members and the invitees for their presenting. We are looking forward to have you again. And the message to the young neurosurgeons, please learn from these mentors. They are the experts in their field and uh, fill your form of evaluation of that course. We are guided by, so we can adjust some of the lecture accordingly. Have a good night, everybody, and take care. Thanks for Thank coming. You. Yes, thanks thank you for, for uh, the webinar. See you soon. See you, See you in the next, if not before. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.